This is Section Zero, Introduction of the Complete Works of George Saville, First Marquis of Halifax. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Greenman. The Complete Works of George Saville, First Marquis of Halifax. Introduction by Walter Raleigh. It would have given no displeasure to Sir George Saville, first Marquis of Halifax, to think that by later generations of his countrymen he should be almost forgotten. Statesmen are easily forgotten. A prosperous lie made Titus Oates immortal. But the man who was the practical genius of the English Revolution, and the acutest critical genius among English politicians, is now little more than a name. What is most commonly remembered about him is that he was called the Trimmer. The nickname was put upon him angrily by his contemporaries, and was worn proudly by himself. The imputation it conveyed was, no doubt, that he trimmed his sails to the varying breezes of opinion. But in his famous pamphlet, the noise of which still echoes distantly in the public ear, he changed the metaphor a boat he said goes ill and is in danger of capsizing if the people in it weigh it down all on one side or all on the other but there is a kind of men who conceive that it would do as well if the boat went even without endangering the passengers and it is hard to imagine he adds how it should come to be a fault or a heresy to attempt to trim the boat. He calls it a boat. He never uses magnificent or extravagant language. But what he means is the ship of state, that ship on whose seaworthiness the lives even of the mutineers depend. Halifax was a pilot for the greater part of his responsible life, and his chief care was always the state his reputation has none of that glamour which shines upon heroic folly the leader of a forlorn hope excites a ready enthusiasm the martyr for an idea the rebel who will have his own way or nothing the stickler for principle who cares little to stay in a world where his darling creed is not to prevail all these are easily made into heroes and worshipped for their courage but the pilot, to whom danger and difficulty are not heroic crises, but the very material of his craft, or the engine-driver, who has had the care of a thousand lives in his sole charge, goes home unnoticed, and takes his modest wage. On his constancy and judgment the safety of humanity depends. His faith and skill have made it possible for the thoughtless passengers to dream in peace and to warm their imagination with the admirable deeds of fiction life would be a poorer thing than it is if work of this kind were rewarded by monuments and testimonials and public fame the old roman way is better expect the best from your political servants and try them for treason if they give you less not many men have written books on the practical business of their lives. Statesmen have commonly been content to make laws or treaties, leaving it to philosophers to expound the principles of politics. It is the fascination of the writings of Halifax that they were suggested by his experience of life, and are crammed with the lessons drawn directly from that experience. Here are no flights of the imagination no ingenious ornaments of style, no beautiful vanities of authorship. He quotes none of those fallacious historical precedents which are dear to the mind of the academic scholar. His writings are bare of classical illusion. What he has to tell is what he has found out for himself in the course of his traffic with the world. But he tells it with so much wit and irony with such acuteness of observation and pungency of phrasing, that he runs some risk of losing the esteem of those who think that wise men must needs be dull. Moreover, books have failed from time immemorial to convey the lessons of experience, 
and the wisdom of life can be bought only by the expenditure of life itself old men would be very glad to tell what they know but they cannot hope to be understood if they are wise they say little if they are foolish they babble pleasantly enough but have nothing to tell halifax has much to tell but a beginner is not likely to learn it on the other hand a man who has served on a jury or has stood an election or has been responsible for the management of any business will feel a thrill of pleasure when his own experience is brought home to him again in that brilliant epigrammatic dress english literature is very rich only a very rich literature could have afforded to neglect so distinguished a writer but it is not rich in practical wisdom and the neglect of halifax is a thing to be regretted and amended his writings are strangely modern and withal are wholly english the politics of this country have altered very little one would say since the days of the exclusion bill indeed it is one of the chief attractions of seventeenth-century history that there is hardly a live question to-day which was unknown to the men of that time it is something to feel that we are not more fantastic or absurd than our ancestors any one who reads the pamphlets which contain halifax's reflections on the controversies of his own time will find himself almost against his will applying these reflections to the matter of to-day no violence is required to make the application page after page of the pamphlets might have been written yesterday for all the evidence that they show of bygone modes it is a fashion nowadays to decry the party system in politics once upon a time so the argument runs party names stood for something real they marked fundamental and irreconcilable differences of opinion on essential questions but now they have become empty of meaning the pretexts of competitors for power and reward such an account of the party system is not good history swift who lived when the succession to the crown was a party question made light of whig and tory and here at the very birth of the system is halifax its most destructive critic the names of whig and tory do not occur in his works he disliked devotion in a conventicle and loyalty in a drunken club he was troubled to see men of all sides sick of a calenture he knew that men though they forget much never forget themselves and that the world is nothing but vanity cut out into several shapes his remarks of parties in his political thoughts and reflections are the severest things ever said about party it turneth all thought into talking instead of doing men get a habit of being unuseful to the public by turning in a circle of wrangling and railing which they cannot get out of ignorance maketh most men go into a party and shame keepeth them from getting out of it the fact is that the rigors of party which are easily maintained with all their consequences by logicians journalists and theorists will not suffer the practical test men exalt themselves on their principles and glory in the partition which separates the sheep from the goats who prove after all to be only the other sheep but the english have a genius for government and when government is the business in hand this separatist method has no value men who differ rabidly on principles will find that the lessons they learn from experience have a tendency to be the same then if they change their course or modify the policy which has been so bravely announced they are accused of being false the charge is true they have been false but it was their thinking and talking that was false not their corrected action the melodrama of their boastful creed would not bear translation into the life of this world they have been the dupes of literature 
all that is heroic in literature is simple and straightforward but then the hero is prepared to die society is not prepared to die for a creed and politics is a vast complex network of means to an end the end being the continued life and comfort of mankind it is the irony of the statesman's position that while his work is very like the work of a good housekeeper the literary deceits and fictions incident to the process of persuasion invite us to regard him as a hero of romance a lone figure on a mountain peak silhouetted against the moon i think it's the novels said the old lady quoted by mr badgett that make my girls so heady the old political families of england who have borne a hand for generations in the government of the country are often exempt from these errors they are not easily intoxicated by public duties which have been their matter-of-fact business for centuries you may call them whig or tory it makes little difference some third name more fundamental in its implications is needed to describe them they look at things instinctively from the point of view of the administration the fervors of the pulpit and the platform do not much delight them it was the great advantage of george savile that he was born into such a family and was connected by kinship or by the accidents of life with many of the most influential persons of that age sir henry savile wit and scholar warden of merton college oxford and provost of eton perhaps the most learned greek scholar of elizabethan england was his distant kinsman the lord keeper coventry was his grandfather the great earl of strafford was his father's uncle anthony ashley cooper first earl of shaftesbury who vies with one other claimant for the credit of being the first whig was his uncle by marriage his colleague and in the end his rival lady dorothy sidney waller's saccharissa was his wife's mother more notable still the famous earl of chesterfield was his grandson in short he was intimately connected with most of those whose names fill the pages of english history during the latter part of the seventeenth century and was a witness of the events of that history from a position of extraordinary vantage his family moreover though staunchly royalist managed to keep possession of its estates and in sixteen forty three when his father sir william savile after loyal service rendered to the king died at the age of thirty-one the young george savile had the ball at his feet concerning his youth and education we know next to nothing he was born in sixteen thirty three and was brought up under the control of his widowed mother who was a woman of strong character when she died in sixteen sixty two her son was already married settled on his estate of rufford in nottingshire and prominent in public life note one all who concern themselves with halifax must acknowledge their great debt to the careful and exhaustive work of miss foxcroft the life and letters of sir george savile bart first marquis of salifax etc with a new edition of his works now for the first time collected and revised by h c foxcroft two volumes longmans eighteen ninety eight end of note one he was described later by evelyn the diarist as a very rich man very witty and in his younger days somewhat positive his wit and his riches he kept throughout life his opinions became less positive his wit was perhaps his chief fault he could not keep it under or refuse himself a pointed jest one great argument says a contemporary account of the prodigious depth and quickness of his sense is that many of his observations and wise sayings were on the sudden when talking to a friend or going from him the spontaneity and freedom of his talk was ill taken by clarendon and other cautious and explanatory persons and savile was reputed to be void of all sense of religion which he certainly was not later among his moral thoughts and reflections he says 
there is so much danger in talking that a man strictly wise can hardly be called a sociable creature this was a lesson that he learned but slowly if indeed he ever learned it his conduct of business was discreet almost to a fault his letters are so prudent and reserved that they are amazingly dull to read but he indemnified himself for these restraints by the freedom of his intimate conversation the writings in which he has allowed himself most of this freedom were either non-political like his advice to a daughter or were posthumously published like his character of king charles the second and political moral and miscellaneous thoughts and reflections these are the best of his works that prudence and discretion which keeps a man safe and sequestered in life conceals him also from the notice of later generations the same caution which delivers him from malicious gossip puts him beyond the reach of posthumous sympathy halifax the author appeals to our interest because he says many things which politicians know and do not say to avoid even paltry enmities may be the clear duty of a statesman it is a misfortune halifax remarks for a man not to have a friend in the world but for that reason he shall have no enemy the events of his public life as parliamentary leader as minister under charles the second as president of the council under james the second and as lord privy seal under william the third are written broad on the history of england and cannot be recorded here he bore a hand in all the chief events of the time from the restoration onwards to his death in sixteen ninety five his importance may be well measured by this that it never depended on the office that he held he was respected consulted and feared in opposition no less than when he was chief minister of the crown the greatest of his achievements it will probably be agreed was the rejection of the exclusion act in sixteen eighty by the house of lords no record remains of the speeches made but the severity and brilliance of his duel with shaftesbury is attested by many contemporaries he stood up to shaftesbury and answered him every time he spoke he carried the house in the end triumphantly with him it was a triumph not so much of argument as of intelligence and insight he understood the temper of the people of england as shaftesbury never did and he knew that the ebullitions of popular enthusiasm are no safe index to that temper monmouth was adored by the people the duke of york was neither liked nor loved shaftesbury thought to earn the nation's gratitude by offering them monmouth in place of york he miscalculated cruelly the people did not fear a new king but they did fear a king-maker the whole edifice of constitutional monarchy was designed not for the protection of bad kings but for the humiliation of arrogant ministers this halifax understood so he became the guardian of the constitution and later when james the second had set himself to break the constitution the guiding spirit of the revolution his politics are our politics his political creed remains in the twentieth century what it was in the seventeenth century the creed of john bull but the rare delight is to find john bull a wit wit is commonly employed in extremes where it works most easily to satirize novelty and ridicule all that is unfamiliar or reversing the process to ridicule all that is familiar to deny the truth of proverbs and to flout the sayings that embody general opinion these devices furnish wit with a simple and effective mechanism but halifax employs the subtlest resources of wit in defence of the practical expedient the middle course the reasonable compromise dryden pays tribute in absalom and Achitophel, not only to the wit of halifax but to his courage and eloquence jotham of piercing wit and pregnant thought endued by nature and by learning taught to move assemblies who but only tried the worse awhile then chose the better side 
nor chose alone but turned the balance too so much the weight of one brave man can do indeed for all that he is called the trimmer halifax has been very generally recognized for an upright and honorable man he was promoted by steady gradation to high honors and high offices yet no one has been found foolish enough to pretend that he was a self-seeker macaulay who expresses some distrust of him in the essays and introduces him in the history as one who was not sufficiently indifferent to titles of honor makes amends in a later passage by a full and generous eulogy what distinguishes him from all other english statesmen is this that through a long public life and through frequent and violent revolutions of public feeling he almost invariably took that view of the great question of his time which history has finally adopted he was called inconstant because the relative position in which he stood to the contending factions was perpetually varying as well might the pole star be called inconstant because it is sometimes to the east and sometimes to the west of the pointers to have defended the ancient and legal constitution of the realm against a seditious populace at one conjunction and against a tyrannical government at another to have been the foremost champion of order in the turbulent parliament of sixteen eighty and the foremost champion of liberty in the servile parliament of sixteen eighty five to have been just and merciful to roman catholics in the days of the popish plot and to the exclusionists in the days of the rye house plot to have done all in his power to save both the head of stafford and the head of russell this was a course which contemporaries heated by passion might not unnaturally call fickle but which deserves a very different name from the later justice of posterity one stain and one only macaulay finds on his memory that in the reign of william the third he stooped to hold communication with the exiled court of st germain the fact is not disputed but a wise judgment on the fact asks for a more active and careful imagination than is usually brought to it the black-and-white school of moralists are not valuable critics of the politics of the seventeenth century they would be better employed in writing laudatory biographies of the authors of histriomastics and greek title royal icon for many years it was not certain who was king of england it was not certain whether england was to be a monarchy or a commonwealth many patriotic englishmen had been driven abroad and hardly a man of note had not relatives in france in these civil conflicts which divide families the law of treason must needs be humanely interpreted and the offence proved against halifax amounts only to misprision of treason that is to say he did not cut off all confidential relations with his friends and acquaintance on the other side this at any rate is certain he never for one moment sought any other end than the security and greatness of england he very early recognized that one portentous question was beginning to obscure the whole political horizon the greatness of france wrote the english envoy at lisbon as i have heard your lordship observe hath made all old politics useless so in sixteen sixty eight he welcomed the triple alliance between england holland and sweden to hold louis the fourteenth in check so far his politics were the politics of william of orange but william of orange was a european statesman and general halifax was purely an englishman he was glad to have the help of alliances but he did not like to have to trust to them real friendships between nations are things of very slow and difficult growth while friendships between governments are subject to the dangers and disadvantages of friendships between two bodies of trustees representing different interests if such friendships are immutable they are dishonest halifax was not deceived by them in a letter to sir william temple written shortly before the triple alliance was concluded 
he discusses the possibility of a french invasion and concludes we must rely upon the oak and courage of england to do our business there being small appearance of anything to help us from abroad many fine things have been said of england by englishmen none of them more sincere and moving than the things said by halifax he is a quiet writer critical and sceptical keenly aware of the absurdity of enthusiasm he keeps his feelings so well in hand that he has the reputation of a cynic but this is how he writes of england our trimmer is far from idolatry in other things in one thing only he cometh near it his country is in some degree his idol he doth not worship the sun because tis not peculiar to us it rambles about the world and is less kind to us than others but for the earth of england though perhaps inferior to that of many places abroad to him there is divinity in it and he would rather die than see a spire of english grass trampled down by a foreign trespasser he thinketh there are a great many of his mind for all plants are apt to taste of the soil in which they grow and we that grow here have a root that produceth in us a stalk of english juice which is not to be changed by grafting or foreign infusion and i do not know whether any thing less will prevail than the modern experiment by which the blood of one creature is transmitted into another according to which before the french blood can be let into our bodies every drop of our own must be drawn out of them when these words were written england stood in greater danger of invasion than she has known at any later time unless it were in the time of napoleon halifax had seen the navy driven off the sea by the dutch and the shipping in the thames burnt yet the people were slow to awake to their danger in the pamphlet entitled a rough draft of a new model at sea which was published in sixteen ninety four but was probably written earlier he tries to awaken them he knew the difficulty of the attempt a nation is a great while he observes before they can see and generally they must feel first before their sight is quite cleared this maketh it so long before they can see their interest that for the most part it is too late for them to pursue it if men must be supposed always to follow their true interest it must be meant of a new manufactory of mankind by god almighty there must be some new clay the old stuff never yet made any such infallible creature yet the means to safety was clear and he puts it in the forefront of his argument i will make no other introduction to the following discourse than that as the importance of our being strong at sea was ever very great so in our present circumstances it is grown to be much greater because as formerly our force of shipping contributed greatly to our trade and safety so now it is become indispensably necessary to our very being it may be said now to england martha martha thou art busy about many things but one thing is necessary to the question what shall we do to be saved in this world there is no other answer but this look to your moat the first article of an englishman's political creed must be that he believeth in the sea etc without that there needeth no general counsel to pronounce him incapable of salvation here this is all very modern and so also are his recommendations in the matter of commissions in the navy it is perhaps no bad vindication of his opinions that they are in complete agreement with the best practice of the navy from that time to this there were those who held that all naval officers should be gentlemen born as there were others who held that they should all be tarpaulins that is men who had been bred from boyhood to the rough work of practical seamen 
he discusses the merits and faults of both sorts of officer and rejects both proposals as evil extremes there must be a mixture he holds of the two classes in a proportion to be determined by experiment and circumstance and the dangers that may attend the mixture are to be avoided by one main precaution the gentlemen shall not be capable of bearing office at sea except they be tarpaulins too that is to say except they are so trained up by a continued habit of living at sea that they may have a right to be admitted free denizens of wapping there must be an end of sending idle young noblemen to sea in positions of authority when a gentleman is preferred at sea the tarpaulin is very apt to impute it to friend or favor but if that gentleman hath before his preferment passed through all the steps which lead to it so that he smelleth as much of pitch and tar as those that were swaddled in sailcloth his having an escutcheon will be so far from doing him harm that it will set him upon the advantage ground it will draw a real respect to his quality when so supported and give him an influence and authority infinitely superior to that which the mere seaman can ever pretend to a sailor can never be fit to command till he has learned to obey nor can he be trusted to inflict punishment to which he has never been liable when the undistinguished disciple of a ship hath tamed the young mastership which is apt to arise from a gentleman's birth and education he then groweth proud in the right place and valueth himself first upon knowing his duty and then upon doing it the experience of the two wars with holland had plentifully illustrated the evils of which halifax speaks it was his own knowledge of human nature which directed him so clearly to the remedy the works of halifax all belong to the last ten years or so of his life the earliest of them the character of a trimmer is a complete handbook to the politics of the closing years of charles the second's reign the letter to a dissenter and the anatomy of an equivalent which followed it within a few months are directed against james the second's famous attempt to buy off the hostility of the dissenters by including them in his project of toleration none of these tracts when first printed bore the author's name the naval tract mentioned above and the tract entitled some cautions offered to the consideration of those who are to choose members to serve for the ensuing parliament are also anonymous and are his latest writings when the ensuing parliament came to be elected he had been six months dead all his worldly wisdom shines in this last tract which again applies almost without change to the circumstances of the day the last satirical injunction has a strangely familiar ring in the meantime after having told my opinion who ought not to be chosen if i should be asked who ought to be my answer must be choose englishmen and when i have said that to deal honestly i will not undertake that they are easy to be found in some ways his advice to a daughter which alone among the writings published during his lifetime seems to have been carefully prepared by his own hand for the press is the most attractive of his works it was written for his daughter elizabeth who became the wife of the third earl of chesterfield and the mother of a famous son the habit of giving advice to the younger generation would appear to have been hereditary in the family but halifax's social maxims are more profound than chesterfield's as his political maxims are more profound than bolingbroke's the book was immensely popular it ran through some twenty-five editions and held the field for almost a century to be superseded at last by dr gregory's father's legacy and mrs chapone's letters on the improvement of the mind the advice is somewhat melancholy in tone the author sets before his daughter no ideas of self-advancement and indulges her with scant hopes of happiness 
there is too little room in his scheme for the holiday virtues and the free play of impulse whilst you are playing full of innocence the spiteful world will bite except you are guarded by your caution his words are prophylactic against the inevitable ills of life his section on a husband is devoted mainly to considerations which may palliate a husband's faults and vices his commandments are commandments without promise there is to be no relaxation life is one long fencing bout you are to have as strict a guard upon yourself amongst your children as if you were amongst your enemies this is a wide remark but it does not make home seem a place of warmth and ease the same cold good sense and discernment govern his thinking on such topics as religion and friendship he is judicious sane and balanced but he does not think of the world as a cheerful place yet with all this there is something very moving in his solicitude his high principles of conduct and his deep affection for his daughter peep out unwittingly here and there it is small wonder that the book was cherished by her and lay always upon her table the calm of the perfectly well-bred style forbids all direct expression of the emotions but the impression it makes is all the greater when my fears prevail i shrink as if i was struck at the prospect of danger to which a young woman must be exposed his concluding advice on the article of marriage has a pathos of its own that you would as much as nature will give you leave endeavor to forget the great indulgence you have found at home after such a gentle discipline as you have been under everything you dislike will seem the harsher to you the tenderness we have had for you my dear is of another nature peculiar to kind parents and differing from that which you will meet with first in any family into which you shall be transplanted and yet they may be very kind too and afford no justifiable reason to you to complain you must not be frightened with the first appearances of a differing scene for when you are used to it you may like the house you go to better than that you left and your husband's kindness will have so much advantage of ours that we shall yield up all competition and as well as we love you be very well contented to surrender to such a rival something of the same fragrance makes itself felt in the worldly wisdom of his advice concerning censure the triumph of wit is to make your good nature subdue your censure to be quick in seeing faults and slow in exposing them you are to consider that the invisible thing called a good name is made up of the breath of numbers that speak well of you so that if by a disobliging word you silence the meanest the gale will be less strong which is to bear up your esteem and though nothing is so vain as the eager pursuit of empty applause yet to be well thought of and to be kindly used by the world is like a glory about a woman's head tis a perfume she carrieth about with her and leaveth wherever she goeth tis a charm against ill-will malice may empty her quiver but cannot wound the dirt will not stick the jests will not take without the consent of the world a scandal doth not go deep it is only a slight stroke upon the injured party and returneth with the greater force upon those that gave it the character of king charles the second is a masterpiece perhaps no such intimate portrait of an english king drawn by a contemporary is to be found in the whole course of our history it makes us regret that halifax has left us so few descriptions of the persons whom he knew the tendency to aphorism and epigram is strong and the character is full of brilliant sentences men given to dissembling are like rooks at play they will cheat for shillings they are so used to it 
mistresses are in all respects craving creatures but the dispassionate analysis of the king's character and motives the accounts given of the effect of his early misfortune on his disposition and the incidental pictures for those who read between the lines of the daily life of the court all these are as convincing as a scientific demonstration the king's ruling passion the love of ease was never so vividly drawn nothing to him was worth purchasing at the price of a difficulty we see him surrounded by a crowd of importunate beggars of both sexes he would walk fast to avoid being engaged by them he would slide from an asking face and could guess very well when he was brought to bay he would buy off his tormentors by large concessions for the sake of present ease in this way the king was made the instrument to defraud the crown which is somewhat extraordinary it is plain to see for all the delicacy with which the royal foibles are described that lord halifax was not perfectly happy in the familiar company that the king kept about him his mistresses were such as did not care that wit of the best kind should have the precedence in their apartments the king delighted in broad illusions and made fun of those who would not join in he had a good memory but told stories too often and at too great length he appreciated wit but and here is a cry from the soul of all men that ever liked those who had wit he could the best endure those who had none yet the natural amiability and sweetness of charles's temper shines through all the description there is a certain attractiveness in his impatience of the formalities of his position his tendency to relapse into charles stuart and so regain the freedom of a private estate the closing eulogy on this unfortunate and gentle prince is a sincere and true testimony from a competent witness a prince neither sharpened by his misfortunes whilst abroad nor by his power when restored is such a shining character that it is a reproach not to be so dazzled with it as not to be able to see a fault in its full light he is under the protection of common frailty that must engage men for their own sakes not to be too severe where they themselves have so much to answer the political moral and miscellaneous thoughts and reflections is the most notable english collection of maxims the nearest parallel and rival to the work of la rochefoucauld and la bruyere popular proverbs it has often been remarked are not very generous in their treatment of humanity and a writer of aphorisms which are proverbs coined in a private mint is open to the same charge an aphorism is an act of judgment and so can pretend to no higher merit than justice which is not the greatest of human virtues the beauties of human character are vague and living things the deformities lend themselves more readily to be outlined by a decisive pencil yet the aphorisms of halifax never sacrifice sense to wit and always provoke thought his political reflections especially could only have been written by a statesman of experience he is often severe but he is no cynic men must be saved in this world he says by their want of faith but he was not so foolish as to deny the existence of unselfishness it is a mistake to say a friend can be bought in his character of king charles the second commenting on the insatiability of the king's followers he falls into the same vein of argument i am of an opinion in which i am every day more confirmed by observation that gratitude is one of those things that cannot be bought it must be born with men or else all the obligations in the world will not create it an outward show may be made to satisfy decency and to prevent reproach 
but a real sense of a kind thing is a gift of nature and never was nor can be acquired yet even sincere friendship has its weaknesses those friends who are above interest are seldom above jealousy the aphorisms of halifax are a better guide to the world as it is than all the brilliances of his epigrammatic french contemporaries his satire bears no trace of disappointed ambition or poisoned egotism some of his sayings are condensed treatises in their weight of thought why is it that popularity is so often suspect he puts his finger at once on the answer popularity is a crime from the moment it is sought it is only a virtue when men have it whether they will or no who has ever defined a fool better than in these words a fool hath no dialogue within himself the first thought carrieth him without the reply of a second how could the verdict of mankind on plaintive persons be more truly expressed than in the sentences on complaint complaining is a contempt upon one's self it is an ill sign both of a man's head and of his heart a man throweth himself down whilst he complaineth and when a man throweth himself down no body careth to take him up again there is very little mention made of halifax in the writings of his contemporaries though he held a conspicuous station he seems to have passed through life observing rather than observed a fascinating sketch of him is given in burnett's history of his own time as he appeared to that prelate of unbounded energy and coarse perceptions virtue may win over vice but intelligence cannot make a convert of stupidity burnett whose power in the state came late in halifax's career is a good example of the bluff hot-headed partisan to whom it is impossible to doubt that right is all on one side halifax we are told by a contemporary was never better pleased than when he was turning bishop burnett and his politics into ridicule burnett's verdict on halifax will not mislead those who have heard the trimmer speak for himself he was a man of a great and ready wit full of life and very pleasant much turned to satire he let his wit run much on matters of religion so that he passed for a bold and determined atheist though he often protested to me he was not one and said he believed there was not one in the world he was a christian in submission he believed as much as he could and he hoped that god would not lay it to his charge if he could not digest iron as an ostrich did nor take into his belief things that must burst him if he had any scruples they were not sought for nor cherished by him for he never read an atheistical book in a fit of sickness i knew him very much touched with a sense of religion i was then often with him he seemed full of good purposes but they went off with his sickness he was always talking of morality and friendship he was punctual in all payments and just in all his private dealings but with relation to the public he went backwards and forwards and changed sides so often that in conclusion no side trusted him he seemed full of commonwealth notions yet he went into the worst part of king charles reign he is the last of the long line of statesmen who found it possible to govern england without paying allegiance to a party their day is past and the party system is stronger now than it was in the time of the jacobites and hanoverians no better method has ever been devised for the peaceful settlement of differences of opinion on domestic questions the nation is not prepared to revive the custom of impeaching unpopular ministers Englishmen sometimes rail at party, as they rail at cricket and football, but they know that there is no escape from it. It deceives vainglorious partisans, no doubt, and it offends righteous philosophers, but it suits the national temper. Yet there is no need to be duped by it, and any one who tries to think clearly on politics must be a very wise man, 
or a very foolish one, if he gets no help from the writings of the Marquis of Halifax. It remains to say a few words on the text of Halifax. The present edition is based on the two volumes which together contain the works of Halifax, namely the volume of Miscellanies, first published in 1700, and the volume entitled A Character of King Charles the Second, and Political, Moral, and Miscellaneous Thoughts and Reflections, published in 1750. For these last two pieces, the 1750 volume is the sole authority. It was printed for material supplied by Lady Burlington, Halifax's granddaughter, and seems to be virtually free from mistakes. The advice to a daughter, which is included in the miscellanies, is likewise a good and careful text. Some few variations occur among the many editions of this piece, but they are of very little importance. Of the political tracts there are, of course, many separate editions earlier than the miscellanies. These tracts were most of them first circulated in manuscript, and I cannot convince myself that any one of them, when it came to be printed, was overseen by the author. It may be, as Miss Foxcroft suggests, that he corrected the proofs of the anatomy of an equivalent, but against this it must be said that men of quality rarely corrected proofs, and that the character of a trimmer, a much more important and personal document, appeared in print again and again during his lifetime, full of nonsensical mistakes, which varied from edition to edition, but did not diminish in number. There is no authoritative edition of any of the controversial writings, but the variations in the earlier editions of the shorter tracts are unimportant, and the obvious blunders are comparatively few. The only serious textual difficulties are presented by the character of a trimmer. This piece seems, from the first, to have been the plaything of copyists and printers. Miss Foxcroft, in her admirable edition, has collated the various printed texts, and has compared them in detail with four manuscript copies. But the manuscripts are not more trustworthy or less corrupt than the printed editions, so that the result is disappointing. Some of the best emendations in her text are suggested by herself. Some are borrowed from manuscripts. I desire to express my obligations for the readings which I owe to her edition, notably discountenance for distinct name, infra, page 58, L21, and, best of all, spire of English grass for piece of English glass, page 97, L18. This last emendation has restored its highest touch of imagination to the finest passage in the tract. I have resisted the temptation to suggest important emendations. Once only I have yielded to it, and have read Landlord for Language on page 84, L20. The reading Language would leave to the sentence a possible meaning, but would make nonsense of the argument. It is a significant fact that this reading, which I take to be an obvious blunder, is found in all the editions, and in all the manuscripts. Miss Foxcroft has taken a hint from the manuscripts, and has restored the inflection eth, or th, in the third person singular of the present tense. In this I have followed her example. There is no doubt that the termination in s, or s, was substituted by the printers for the old-fashioned usage, which was preferred by Halifax in his authoritative works, and which is necessary for the cadence of his sentences. I have followed my printed originals in the matter of capitals and italics. I have also preserved the old punctuation, correcting it only in those few instances where it seemed to be wrong judged by its own principles. The modern usage in all these matters sacrifices everything to naked logic, and substitutes bare outline for the delicate emotional shading of the older fashion. Walter Raleigh, Oxford, 1912 End of Introduction to the Complete Works of George Saville, First Marquess of Halifax Read by John Greenman
This is Chapter One of the Complete Works of George Saville, First Marquis of Halifax. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Greenman. The Complete Works of George Saville, First Marquis of Halifax. Chapter One The Lady's New Year's Gift, or Advice to a Daughter. Part One: Introduction and Religion Dear daughter, I find that even our most pleasing thoughts will be unquiet. They will be in motion, and the mind can have no rest whilst it is possessed by a darling passion. You are at present the chief object of my care, as well as of my kindness which sometimes throweth me into visions of your being happy in the world, that are better suited for my partial wishes than to my reasonable hopes for you. At other times, when my fears prevail, I shrink as if I was struck at the prospect of danger to which a young woman must be exposed. But how much the more lively, so much the more liable you are to be hurt as the finest plants are the soonest nipped by the frost whilst you are playing full of innocence the spiteful world will bite except you are guarded by your caution want of care therefore my dear child is never to be excused since as to this world it hath the same effect as want of virtue such an early sprouting wit requireth so much the more to be sheltered by some rules, like something strewed on tender flowers, to preserve them from being blasted. You must take it well to be pruned by so kind a hand as that of a father. There may be some bitterness in mere obedience. The natural love of liberty may help to make the commands of a parent harder to go down. Some inward resistance there will be where power and not choice maketh us move but when a father layeth aside his authority and persuadeth only by his kindness he will never answer it to good nature if it hath not weight with you a great part of what is said in the following discourse may be above the present growth of your understanding but that becoming every day taller will in a little time reach up to it, so as to make it easy to you. I am willing to begin with you before your mind is quite formed, that being the time in which it is most capable of receiving a color that will last when it is mixed with it. Few things are well learnt, but by early precepts those well infused make them natural, and we are never sure of retaining what is valuable till by a continued habit we have made it a piece of us. Whether my skill can draw the picture of a fine woman may be a question, but it can be none, that I have drawn that of a kind father. If you will take an exact copy, I will so far presume upon my workmanship as to undertake you shall not make an ill figure. Give me so much credit as to try and I am sure that neither your wishes nor mine shall be disappointed by it. RELIGION The first thing to be considered is religion. It must be the chief object of your thoughts, since it would be a vain thing to direct your behavior in the world and forget that which you are to have towards him who made it. In a strict sense, it is the only thing necessary. You must take it into your mind, and from thence throw it into your heart, where you are to embrace it so close as never to lose the possession of it. But then it is necessary to distinguish between the reality and the pretense. Religion doth not consist in believing the legend of the nursery, where children with their milk are fed with the tales of witches, hobgoblings, prophecies, and miracles. We suck in so greedily these early mistakes, 
that our riper understanding hath much ado to cleanse our minds from this kind of trash the stories are so entertaining that we do not only believe them but relate them which makes the discovery of the truth somewhat grievous when it makes us lose such a field of impertinence where we might have diverted ourselves besides the throwing some shame upon us for having ever received them this is making the world a jest and imputing to god almighty that the province he assigneth to the devil is to play at blind man's buff and show tricks with mankind and is so far from being religion that it is not sense and hath right only to be called that kind of devotion of which ignorance is the undoubted mother without competition or dispute these mistakes are therefore to be left off with your hanging sleeves and you ought to be as much out of countenance to be found with them about you as to be seen playing with babies at an age when other things are expected from you the next thing to be observed to you is that religion doth as little consist in loud answers and devout convulsions at church or praying in an extraordinary manner some ladies are so extreme stirring at church that one would swear the worm in their conscience made them so unquiet others will have such a divided face between a devout goggle and an inviting glance that the unnatural mixture maketh even the best looks to be at that time ridiculous these affected appearances are ever suspected like very strong perfumes which are generally thought no very good symptoms in those that make use of them let your earnestness therefore be reserved for your closet where you may have god almighty to yourself in public be still and calm neither undecently careless nor affected in the other extreme it is not true devotion to put on an angry zeal against those who may be of a differing persuasion partiality to ourselves makes us often mistake it for a duty to fall hard upon others in that case and being pushed on by self-conceit we strike without mercy believing that the wounds we give are meritorious and that we are fighting god almighty's quarrel when the truth is we are only setting out ourselves our devotion too often breaketh out into that shape which most agreeth with our particular temper the choleric grow into a hardened severity against all who dissent from them snatch at all the texts of scripture that suit with their complexion and because god's wrath was some time kindled they conclude that anger is a divine virtue and are so far from imagining their ill-natured zeal requireth an apology that they value themselves upon it and triumph in it others whose nature is more credulous than ordinary admit no bounds or measure to it they grow as proud of extending their faith as princes are of enlarging their dominions not considering that our faith like our stomach is capable of being overcharged and that as the last is destroyed by taking in more than it can digest so our reason may be extinguished by oppressing it with the weight of too many strange things especially if we are forbidden to chew what we are commanded to swallow the melancholy and the sullen are apt to place a great part of their religion in dejected or ill-humoured looks putting on an unsociable face and declaiming against the innocent entertainments of life with as much sharpness as they could bestow upon the greatest crimes this generally is only a vizard there is seldom anything real in it no other thing is the better for being sour and it would be hard that religion should be so which is the best of things in the meantime it may be said with truth that this surly kind of devotion hath perhaps done little less hurt in the world by frighting 
than the most scandalous examples have done by infecting it having told you in these few instances to which many more might be added what is not true religion it is time to describe to you what is so the ordinary definitions of it are no more like it than the common signposts are like the princes they would represent the unskilful daubers in all ages have generally laid on such ill colors and drawn such harsh lines that the beauty of it is not easily to be discerned they have put in all the forbidding features that can be thought of and in the first place have made it an irreconcilable enemy to nature when in reality they are not only friends but twins born together at the same time and it is doing violence to them both to go about to have them separated nothing is so kind and so inviting as true and unsophisticated religion instead of imposing unnecessary burdens upon our nature it easeth us of the greater weight of our passions and mistakes instead of subduing us with rigor it redeemeth us from the slavery we are in to ourselves who are the most severe masters whilst we are under the usurpation of our appetites let loose and not restrained religion is a cheerful thing so far from being always at cuffs with good humor that it is inseparably united to it nothing unpleasant belongs to it though the spiritual cooks have done their unskilful part to give an ill relish to it a wise epicure would be religious for the sake of pleasure good sense is the foundation of both and he is a bungler who aimeth at true luxury but where they are joined religion is exalted reason refined and sifted from the grosser parts of it it dwelleth in the upper region of the mind where there are fewest clouds or mists to darken or offend it it is both the foundation and the crown of all virtues it is morality improved and raised to its height by being carried nearer heaven the only place where perfection resideth it cleanseth the understanding and brusheth off the earth that hangeth about our souls it doth not want the hopes and the terrors which are made use of to support it neither ought it to descend to the borrowing any argument out of itself since there we may find everything that should invite us if we were to be hired to religion it is able to outbid the corrupted world with all it can offer to us being so much the richer of the two in everything where reason is admitted to be a judge of the value since this is so it is worth your pains to make religion your choice and not make use of it only as a refuge there are ladies who finding by the too visible decay of their good looks that they can shine no more by that light put on the varnish of an affected devotion to keep up some kind of figure in the world they take sanctuary in the church when they are pursued by growing contempt which will not be stopped but followeth them to the altar such late penitence is only a disguise for the tormenting grief of being no more handsome that is the killing thought which draweth the sighs and tears that appear outwardly to be applied to a better end there are many who have an aguish devotion hot and cold fits long intermissions and violent raptures this unevenness is by all means to be avoided let your method be a steady course of good life that may run like a smooth stream and be a perpetual spring to furnish to the continued exercise of virtue your devotion may be earnest but it must be unconstrained and like other duties you must make it your pleasure too or else it will have very little efficacy by this rule you may best judge of your own heart whilst those duties are joys it is an evidence of their being sincere but when they are a penance it is a sign that your nature maketh some resistance 
and whilst that lasteth you can never be entirely secure of yourself if you are often unquiet and too nearly touched by the cross accidents of life your devotion is not of the right standard there is too much allay in it that which is right and unmixed taketh away the sting of everything that would trouble you it is like a healing balm that extinguisheth the sharpness of the blood so this softeneth and dissolveth the anguish of the mind a devout mind hath the privilege of being free from passions as some climates are from all venomous kind of creatures it will raise you above the little vexations to which others for want of it will be exposed and bring you to a temper not of stupid indifference but of such a wise resignation that you may live in the world so as it may hang about you like a loose garment and not be tied too close to you take heed of running into that common error of applying god's judgments upon particular occasions our weights and measures are not competent to make the distribution either of his mercy or his justice he hath thrown a veil over these things which make it not only an impertinence but a kind of sacrilege for us to give sentence in them without his commission as to your particular faith keep to the religion that is grown up with you both as it is the best in itself and that the reason of staying in it upon that ground is somewhat stronger for your sex than it will perhaps be allowed to be for ours in respect that the voluminous inquiries into the truth by reading are less expected from you the best of books will be direction enough to you not to change and whilst you are fixed and sufficiently confirmed in your own mind you will do best to keep vain doubts and scruples at such a distance that they may give you no disquiet let me recommend to you a method of being rightly informed which can never fail it is in short this get understanding and practice virtue and if you are so blessed as to have those for your share it is not sure that there is a god than it is that by him all necessary truths will be revealed to you end of section one of advice to a daughter religion this is section o two of the complete works of george savile advice to a daughter husband this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. The Complete Works of George Savile, First Marquis of Halifax. Read by John Greenman. Section 2. Advice to a Daughter. Husband. That which challengeth the next place in your thoughts is how to live with a husband and though that is so large a word that few rules can be fixed to it which are unchangeable the methods being as various as the several tempers of men to which they must be suited yet i cannot omit some general observations which with the help of your own may the better direct you in the part of your life upon which your happiness most dependeth it is one of the disadvantages belonging to your sex that young women are seldom permitted to make their own choice their friends care and experience are thought safer guides to them than their own fancies and their modesty often forbiddeth them to refuse when their parents recommend though their inward consent may not entirely go along with it in this case there remaineth nothing for them to do but to endeavor to make that easy which falleth to their lot and by a wise use of every thing they may dislike in a husband turn that by degrees to be very supportable which if neglected might in time beget an aversion you must first lay it down for a foundation in general that there is inequality in the sexes and that for the better o economy of the world the men who were to be the law-givers had the larger share of reason bestowed upon them 
by which means your sex is the better prepared for the compliance that is necessary for the better performance of those duties which seem to be most properly assigned to it this looks a little uncourtly at the first appearance but upon examination it will be found that nature is so far from being unjust to you that she is partial on your side she hath made you such large amends by other advantages for the seeming injustice of the first distribution that the right of complaining is come over to our sex you have it in your power not only to free yourselves but to subdue your masters and without violence throw both their natural and legal authority at your feet we are made of differing tempers that our defects may the better be mutually supplied your sex wanteth our reason for your conduct and our strength for your protection ours wanteth your gentleness to soften and to entertain us the first part of our life is a good deal subjected to you in the nursery where you reign without competition and by that means have the advantage of giving the first impressions afterwards you have stronger influences which well managed have more force in your behalf than all our privileges and jurisdictions can pretend to have against you you have more strength in your looks than we have in our laws and more power by your tears than we have by our arguments it is true that the laws of marriage run in a harsher style towards your sex obey is an ungenteel word and less easy to be digested by making such an unkind distinction in the words of the contract and so very unsuitable to the excess of good manners which generally goes before it besides the universality of the rule seemeth to be a grievance and it appeareth reasonable that there might be an exemption for extraordinary women from ordinary rules to take away the just exception that lieth against the false measure of general equality it may be alleged by the counsel retained by your sex that as there is in all other laws an appeal from the letter to the equity in cases that require it it is as reasonable that some court of a larger jurisdiction might be erected where some wives might resort and plead specially and in such instances where nature is so kind as to raise them above the level of their own sex they might have relief and obtain a mitigation in their own particular of a sentence which was given generally against womankind the causes of separation are now so very coarse that few are confident enough to buy their liberty at the price of having their modesty so exposed and for disparity of minds which above all other things requireth a remedy the laws have made no provision so little refined are numbers of men by whom they are compiled this and a great deal more might be said to give a color to the complaint but the answer to it in short is that the institution of marriage is too sacred to admit a liberty of objecting to it that the supposition of yours being the weaker sex having without all doubt a good foundation maketh it reasonable to subject it to the masculine dominion that no rule can be so perfect as not to admit some exceptions but the law presumeth there would be so few found in this case who would have a sufficient right to such a privilege that it is safer some injustice should be connived at in a very few instances than to break into an establishment upon which the order of humane society does so much depend you are therefore to make your best of what is settled by law and custom and not vainly imagine that it will be changed for your sake but that you may not be discouraged as if you lay under the weight of an incurable grievance you are to know that by a wise and dexterous conduct it will be in your power to relieve yourself from anything that looketh like a disadvantage in it for your better direction 
i will give a hint of the most ordinary causes of dissatisfaction between man and wife that you may be able by such a warning to live so upon your guard that when you shall be married you may know how to cure your husband's mistakes and to prevent your own first then you are to consider you live in a time which hath rendered some kind of frailties so habitual that they lay claim to large grains of allowance the world in this is somewhat unequal and our sex seemeth to play the tyrant in distinguishing partially for ourselves by making that in the utmost degree criminal in the woman which in a man passeth under a much gentler censure the root and the excuse of this injustice is the preservation of families from any mixture which may bring a blemish to them and whilst the point of honor continues to be so placed it seems unavoidable to give your sex the greater share of the penalty but if in this it lieth under any disadvantage you are more than recompensed by having the honor of families in your keeping the consideration so great a trust must give you maketh full amends and this power the world hath lodged in you can hardly fail to restrain the severity of an ill husband and to improve the kindness and esteem of a good one this being so remember that next to the danger of committing the fault yourself the greatest is that of seeing it in your husband do not seem to look or hear that way if he is a man of sense he will reclaim himself the folly of it is of itself sufficient to cure him if he is not so he will be provoked but not reformed to expostulate in these cases looketh like declaring war and preparing reprisals which to a thinking husband would be a dangerous reflection besides it is so coarse a reason which will be assigned for a lady's too great warmth upon such an occasion that modesty no less than prudence ought to restrain her since such an undecent complaint makes a wife much more ridiculous than the injury that provoketh her to it but it is yet worse and more unskilful to blaze it in the world expecting it should rise up in arms to take her part whereas she will find it can have no other effect than that she will be served up in all companies as the reigning jest at that time and will continue to be the common entertainment till she is rescued by some newer folly that cometh upon the stage and driveth her away from it the impertinence of such methods is so plain that it doth not deserve the pains of being laid open be assured that in these cases your discretion and silence will be the most prevailing reproof an affected ignorance which is seldom a virtue is a great one here and when your husband seeth how unwilling you are to be uneasy there is no stronger argument to persuade him not to be unjust to you besides it will naturally make him more yielding in other things and whether it be to cover or redeem his offence you may have the good effects of it whilst it lasteth and all that while have the most reasonable ground that can be of presuming such a behaviour will at last entirely convert him there is nothing so glorious to a wife as a victory so gained a man so reclaimed is for ever after subjected to her virtue and her bearing for a time is more than rewarded by a triumph that will continue as long as her life the next thing i will suppose is that your husband may love wine more than is convenient it will be granted that though there are vices of a deeper dye there are none that have greater deformity than this when it is not restrained but with all this the same custom which is the more to be lamented for its being so general should make it less uneasy to every one in particular who is to suffer by the effects of it so that in the first place it will be no new thing if you should have a drunkard for your husband and there is by too frequent examples evidence enough that such a thing may happen and yet a wife may live too without being miserable 
self-love dictateth aggravating words to every thing we feel ruin and misery are the terms we apply to whatever we do not like forgetting the mixture allotted to us by the condition of human life by which it is not intended we should be quite exempt from trouble it is fair if we can escape such a degree of it as would oppress us and enjoy so much of the pleasant part as may lessen the ill taste of such things as are unwelcome to us every thing hath two sides and for our own ease we ought to direct our thoughts to that which may be least liable to exception to fall upon the worst side of a drunkard giveth so unpleasant a prospect that it is not possible to dwell upon it let us pass then to the more favorable part as far as a wife is concerned in it i am tempted to say if the irregularity of the expression could in strictness be justified that a wife is to thank god her husband hath faults mark the seeming paradox my dear for your own instruction it being intended no further a husband without faults is a dangerous observer he hath an eye so piercing and seeth everything so plain that it is exposed to his full censure and though i will not doubt but that your virtue will disappoint the sharpest inquiries yet few women can bear the having all they say or do represented in the clear glass of an understanding without faults nothing softeneth the arrogance of our nature like a mixture of some frailties it is by them we are best told that we must not strike too hard upon others because we ourselves do so often deserve blows they pull our rage by the sleeve and whisper gentleness to us in our censures even when they are rightly applied the faults and passions of husbands bring them down to you and make them content to live upon less unequal terms than faultless men would be willing to stoop to so haughty is mankind till humbled by common weaknesses and defects which in our corrupted state contribute more towards the reconciling us to one another than all the precepts of the philosophers and divines so that where the errors of our nature make amends for the disadvantages of yours it is more your part to make use of the benefit than to quarrel at the fault thus in case a drunken husband should fall to your share if you will be wise and patient his wine shall be of your side it will throw a veil over your mistakes and will set out and improve everything you do that he is pleased with others will like him less and by that means he may perhaps like you the more when after having dined too well he is received at home without a storm or so much as a reproaching look the wine will naturally work out all in kindness which a wife must encourage let it be wrapped up in never so much impertinence on the other side it would boil up into rage if the mistaken wife should treat him roughly like a certain thing called a kind of shrew than which the world with all its plenty cannot show a more senseless ill-bred forbidding creature consider that where the man will give such frequent intermissions of the use of his reason the wife insensibly getteth a right of governing in the vacancy and that raiseth her character and credit in the family to a higher pitch than perhaps could be done under a sober husband who never putteth himself into an incapacity of holding the reins if these are not entire consolations at least they are remedies to some degree they cannot make drunkenness a virtue nor a husband given to it a felicity but you will do yourself no ill office in the endeavoring by these means to make the best of such a lot in case it should happen to be yours and by the help of a wise observation to make that very supportable which would otherwise be a load that would oppress you the next case i will put is that your husband may be choleric or ill-humoured to this it may be said 
that passionate men generally make amends at the foot of the account such a man if he is angry one day without any sense will the next day be as kind without any reason so that by marking how the wheels of such a man's head are used to move you may easily bring over all his passion to your party instead of being struck down by his thunder you shall direct it where and upon whom you shall think it best applied thus are the strongest poisons turned to the best remedies but then there must be art in it and a skilful hand else the least bungling maketh it mortal there is a great deal of nice care requisite to deal with a man of this complexion choler proceedeth from pride and maketh a man so partial to himself that he swelleth against contradiction and thinketh he is lessened if he is opposed you must in this case take heed of increasing the storm by an unwary word or kindling the fire whilst the wind is in a corner which may blow it in your face you are dexterously to yield everything till he beginneth to cool and then by slow degrees you may rise and gain upon him your gentleness well timed will like a charm dispel his anger ill-placed a kind smile will reclaim when a shrill pettish answer would provoke him rather than fail upon such occasions when other remedies are too weak a little flattery may be admitted which by being necessary will cease to be criminal if ill-humor and sullenness and not open and sudden heat is his disease there is a way of treating that too so as to make it a grievance to be endured in order to it you are first to know that naturally good sense hath a mixture of surly in it and there being so much folly in the world and for the most part so triumphant it giveth frequent temptations to raise the spleen of men who think right therefore that which may generally be called ill-humour is not always a fault it becometh one when either it is wrong applied or that it is continued too long when it is not so for this reason you must not too hastily fix an ill name upon that which may perhaps not deserve it and though the case should be that your husband might too sourly resent anything he disliketh it may so happen that more blame shall belong to your mistake than to his ill-humour if a husband behaveth himself sometimes with an indifference that a wife may think offensive she is in the wrong to put the worst sense upon it if by any means it will admit a better some wives will call it ill-humour if their husbands change their style from that which they used whilst they make their first addresses to them others will allow no intermission or abatement in the expressions of kindness to them not enough distinguishing times and forgetting that it is impossible for men to keep themselves up all their lives to the height of some extravagant moments a man may at some times be less careful in little things without any cold or disobliging reason for it as a wife may be too expecting in smaller matters without drawing upon herself the inference of being unkind and if your husband should be really sullen and have such frequent fits as might take away the excuse of it it concerneth you to have an eye prepared to discern the first appearances of the cloudy weather and to watch when the fit goeth off which seldom lasteth long if it is let alone but whilst the mind is sore everything galleth it and that maketh it necessary to let the black humour begin to spend itself before you come in and venture to undertake it if in the lottery of the world you should draw a covetous husband i confess it will not make you proud of your good luck yet even such a one may be endured too though there are few passions more untractable than that of avarice you must first take care that your definition of avarice may not be a mistake you are to examine every circumstance of your husband's fortune 
and weigh the reason of every thing you expect from him before you have a right to pronounce that sentence the complaint is now so general against all husbands that it giveth great suspicion of its being often ill-grounded it is impossible they should all deserve that censure and therefore it is certain that it is many times misapplied he that spareth in everything is an inexcusable niggard he that spareth in nothing is as inexcusable a madman the mean is to spare in what is least necessary to lay out more liberally in what is most required in our several circumstances yet this will not always satisfy there are wives who are impatient of the rules of o economy and are apt to call their husband's kindness in question if any other measure is put to their expense than that of their own fancy be sure to avoid this dangerous error such a partiality to yourself which is so offensive to an understanding man that he will very ill bear a wife's giving herself such an injurious preference to all the family and whatever belongeth to it but to admit the worst and that your husband is really a close-handed wretch you must in this as in other cases endeavor to make it less afflicting to you and first you must observe reasonable hours of speaking when you offer anything in opposition to this reigning humor a third hand and a wise friend may often prevail more than you will be allowed to do in your own cause sometimes you are dexterously to go along with him in things where you see that the niggardly part of his mind is most predominant by which you will have the better opportunity of persuading him in things where he may be more indifferent our passions are very unequal and are apt to be raised or lessened according as they work upon different objects they are not to be stopped or restrained in those things where our mind is more particularly engaged in other matters they are more tractable and will sometimes give reason a hearing and admit a fair dispute more than that there are few men even in this instance of avarice so entirely abandoned to it that at some hours and upon some occasions will not forget their natures and for that time turn prodigal the same man who will grudge himself what is necessary let his pride be raised and he shall be profuse at another time his anger shall have the same effect a fit of vanity ambition and sometimes of kindness shall open and enlarge his narrow mind a dose of wine will work upon this tough humor and for the time dissolve it your business must be in if this case happeneth to watch these critical moments and not let one of them slip without making your advantage of it and a wife may be said to want skill if by these means she is not able to secure herself in a good measure against the inconveniences this scurvy quality in a husband might bring upon her except he should be such an incurable monster as i hope will never fall to your share the last supposition i will make is that your husband should be weak and incompetent to make use of the privileges that belong to him it will be yielded that such a one leaveth room for a great many objections but god almighty seldom sendeth a grievance without a remedy or at least such a mitigation as taketh away a great part of the sting and the smart of it to make such a misfortune less heavy you are first to bring to your observation that a wife very often maketh a better figure for her husband's making no great one and there seemeth to be little reason why the same lady that chooseth a waiting woman with worse looks may not be content with a husband with less wit the argument being equal from the advantage of the comparison if you will be more ashamed in some cases of such a husband you will be less afraid than you would perhaps be of a wise one his unseasonable weakness may no doubt sometimes grieve you but then set against this that it giveth you the dominion if you will make the right use of it 
it is next to his being dead in which case the wife hath right to administer therefore be sure if you have such an idiot that none except yourself may have the benefit of the forfeiture such a fool is a dangerous beast if others have the keeping of him and you must be very undexterous if when your husband shall resolve to be an ass you do not take care he may be your ass but you must go skilfully about it and above all things take heed of distinguishing in public what kind of husband he is your inward thoughts must not hinder the outward payment of the consideration that is due to him your slighting him in company besides that it would to a discerning bystander give too great encouragement for the making nearer applications to you is in itself such an undecent way of assuming that it may provoke the tame creature to break loose and to show his dominion for his credit which he was content to forget for his ease in short the surest and the most approved method will be to do like a wise minister to an easy prince first give him the orders you afterwards receive from him with all this that which you are to pray for is a wise husband one that by knowing how to be a master for that very reason will not let you feel the weight of it one whose authority is so softened by his kindness that it giveth you ease without abridging your liberty one that will return so much tenderness to your just esteem of him that you will never want power though you will seldom care to use it such a husband is as much above all the other kinds of them as a rational subjection to a prince great in himself is to be preferred before the disquiet and uneasiness of unlimited liberty before i leave this head i must add a little concerning your behavior to your husband's friends which requireth the most refined part of your understanding to acquit yourself well of it you are to study how to live with them with more care than you are to apply to any other part of your life especially at first that you may not stumble at the first setting out the family into which you are grafted will generally be apt to expect that like a stranger in a foreign country you should conform to their methods and not bring in a new model by your own authority the friends in such case are tempted to rise up in arms as against an unlawful invasion so that you are with the utmost caution to avoid the least appearances of anything of this kind and that you may with less difficulty afterwards give your directions be sure at first to receive them from your husband's friends gain them to you by early applying to them and they will be so satisfied that as nothing is more thankful than pride when it is complied with they will strive which of them shall most recommend you and when they have helped you to take root in your husband's good opinion you will have less dependence upon theirs though you must not neglect any reasonable means of preserving it you are to consider that a man governed by his friends is very easily inflamed by them and that one who is not so will yet for his own sake expect to have them considered it is easily improved to a point of honor in a husband not to have his relations neglected and nothing is more dangerous than to raise an objection which is grounded upon pride it is the most stubborn and lasting passion we are subject to and where it is the first cause of the war it is very hard to make a secure peace your caution in this is of the last importance to you and that you may the better succeed in it carry a strict eye upon the impertinence of your servants take heed that their ill-humor may not engage you to take exceptions or their too much assuming in small matters raise consequences which may bring you under great disadvantage remember that in the case of a royal bride those about her are generally so far suspected to bring in a foreign interest that in most countries they are insensibly reduced to a very small number and those of so low a figure that it doth not admit the being jealous of them in little and in the proportion this may be the case of every new married woman 
and therefore it may be more advisable for you to gain the servants you find in a family than to tie yourself too fast to those you carry into it you are not to overlook these small reflections because they may appear low and inconsiderable for it must be said that as the greatest streams are made up of the small drops at the head of the springs from whence they are derived so the greater circumstances of your life will be in some degree directed by these seeming trifles which having the advantage of being the first acts of it have a greater effect than singly in their own nature they could pretend to i will conclude this article with my advice that you would as much as nature will give you leave endeavor to forget the great indulgence you have found at home after such a gentle discipline as you have been under everything you dislike will seem the harsher to you the tenderness we have had for you my dear is of another nature peculiar to kind parents and differing from that which you will meet with first in any family into which you shall be transplanted and yet they may be very kind too and afford no justifiable reason to you to complain you must not be frighted with the first appearance of a differing scene for when you are used to it you may like the house you go to better than that you left and your husband's kindness will have so much advantage of yours that we shall yield up all competition and as well as we love you be very well contented to surrender to such a rival end of section o two advice to a daughter husband This is section three of the complete works of George Saville, first Marquis of Halifax. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. The complete works of George Saville, first Marquis of Halifax. Advice to a daughter. House, family, and children. You must lay before you, my dear, there are degrees of care to recommend yourself to the world in the several parts of your life. In many things, though the doing them well may raise your credit and esteem, yet the omission of them would draw no immediate reproach upon you. In others, where your duty is more particularly applied, the neglect of them is amongst those faults which are not forgiven and will bring you under a censure which will be a much heavier thing than the trouble you would avoid of this kind is the government of your house family and children which since it is the province allotted to your sex and that the discharging it well will for that reason be expected from you if you either desert it out of laziness or manage it ill for want of skill instead of a help you will be an encumbrance to the family where you are placed i must tell you that no respect is lasting but that which is produced by our being in some degree useful to those that pay it where that faileth the homage and the reverence go along with it and fly to others where something may be expected in exchange for them and upon this principle the respects even of the children and the servants will not stay with one that doth not think them worth their care and the old housekeeper shall make a better figure in the family than the lady with all her fine clothes if she wilfully relinquishes her title to the government therefore take heed of carrying your good breeding to such a height as to be good for nothing and to be proud of it some think it hath a great air to be above troubling their thoughts with such ordinary things as their house and family others dare not admit cares for fear they should hasten wrinkles mistaken pride maketh some think they must keep themselves up and not descend to these duties which do not seem enough refined for great ladies to be employed in forgetting all this while that it is more than the greatest princes can do at once to preserve the respect and to neglect their business no age ever erected altars to insignificant gods 
they had all some quality applied to them to draw worship from mankind this maketh it the more unreasonable for a lady to expect to be considered and at the same time resolve not to deserve it good looks alone will not do they are not much a lasting tenure as to be relied upon and if they should stay longer than they usually do it will by no means be safe to depend upon them for when time hath abated the violence of the first liking and that the nap is a little worn off though still a good degree of kindness may remain men recover their sight which before might be dazzled and allow themselves to object as well as to admire in such a case when a husband seeth an empty airy thing sail up and down the house to no kind of purpose and look as if she came thither only to make a visit when he findeth that after her emptiness hath been extreme busy about some very senseless thing she eats her breakfast half an hour before dinner to be at greater liberty to afflict the company with her discourse then calleth for her coach that she may trouble her acquaintance who are already cloyed with her and having some proper dialogues ready to display her foolish eloquence at the top of the stairs she setteth out like a ship out of the harbour laden with trifles and cometh back with them at her return she repeateth to her faithful waiting woman the triumphs of that day's impertinence then wrapped up in flattery and clean linen goeth to bed so satisfied that it throweth her into pleasant dreams of her own felicity such a one is seldom serious but with her tailor her children and family may now and then have a random thought but she never taketh aim but at something very impertinent i say when a husband whose province is without doors and to whom the economy of the house would be in some degree indecent findeth no order nor quiet in his family meeteth with complaints of all kinds springing from this root the mistaken lady who thinketh to make amends for all this by having a well-chosen petticoat will at last be convinced of her error and by grief be forced to undergo the penalties that belong to those who are wilfully insignificant when this scurvy hour cometh upon her she first groweth angry then when the time of it is past would perhaps grow wiser not remembering that we can no more have wisdom than grace whenever we think fit to call for it there are times and periods fixed for both and when they are too long neglected the punishment is that they are irrecoverable and nothing remaineth but an useless grief for the folly of having thrown them out of our power you are to think what a mean figure a woman maketh when she is so degraded by her own fault whereas there is nothing in those duties which are expected from you that can be a lessening to you except your want of conduct makes it so you may love your children without living in the nursery and you may have a competent and discreet care of them without letting it break out upon the company or exposing yourself by turning your discourse that way which is a kind of laying children to the parish and it can hardly be done anywhere that those who hear it will be so forgiving as not to think they are overcharged with them a woman's tenderness to her children is one of the least deceitful evidences of her virtue but yet the way of expressing it must be subject to the rules of good breeding and though a woman of quality ought not to be less kind to them than mothers of the meanest rank are to theirs yet she may distinguish herself in the manner and avoid the coarse methods which in women of a lower size might be more excusable you must begin early to make them love you that they may obey you this mixture is nowhere more necessary than in children and i must tell you that you are not to expect returns of kindness from yours if ever you have any without grains of allowance and yet it is not so much a defect in their good nature as a 
shortness of thought in them their first insufficiency maketh them lean so entirely upon their parents for what is necessary that the habit of it maketh them continue the same expectations for what is unreasonable and as often as they are denied so often they think they are injured and whilst their desires are strong and their reasons yet in the cradle their anger looketh no farther than the thing they long for and cannot have and to be displeased for their own good is a maxim they are very slow to understand so that you may conclude the first thoughts of your children will have no small mixture of mutiny which being so natural you must not be angry except you would increase it you must deny them as seldom as you can and when there is no avoiding it you must do it gently you must flatter away their ill-humor and take the next opportunity of pleasing them in some other thing before they either ask or look for it this will strengthen your authority by making it soft to them and confirm their obedience by making it their interest you are to have as strict a guard upon yourself amongst your children as if you were amongst your enemies they are apt to make wrong inferences to take encouragement from half words and misapply what you may say or do so as either to lessen their duty or to extend their liberty farther than is convenient let them be more in awe of your kindness than of your power and above all take heed of supporting a favorite child in its impertinence which will give right to the rest of claiming the same privilege if you have a divided number leave the boys to the father's more peculiar care that you may with greater justice pretend to a more immediate jurisdiction over those of your own sex you are to live so with them that they may never choose to avoid you except when they have offended and then let them tremble that they may distinguish but their penance must not continue so long as to grow too sour upon their stomachs that it may not harden instead of correcting them the kind and severe part must have their several turns seasonably applied but your indulgence is to have the broader mixture that love rather than fear may be the root of their obedience your servants are in the next place to be considered and you must remember not to fall into the mistake of thinking that because they receive wages and are so much inferior to you therefore they are below your care to know how to manage them it would be as good reason for a master workman to despise the wheels of his engines because they are made of wood these are the wheels of your family and let your directions be never so faultless yet if these engines stop or move wrong the whole order of your house is either at a stand or discomposed besides the inequality which is between you must not make you forget that nature maketh no such distinction but that servants may be looked upon as humble friends and that returns of kindness and good usage are as much due to such of them as deserve it as their service is due to us when we require it a foolish haughtiness in the style of speaking or in the manner of commanding them is in itself very undecent besides that it begetteth an aversion in them of which the least ill effect to be expected is that they will be slow and careless in all that is enjoined them and you will find it true by your experience that you will be so much the more obeyed as you are less imperious be not too hasty in giving your orders nor too angry when they are not altogether observed much less are you to be loud and too much disturbed an evenness in distinguishing when they do well or ill is that which will make your family move by a rule and without noise and will the better set out your skill in conducting it with ease and silence that it may be like a well-disciplined army which knoweth how to anticipate the orders that are fit to be given them you are never to neglect the duty of the present hour to do another thing 
which though it may be better in itself is not to be unseasonably preferred a lot well chosen hours for the inspection of your family which may be so distinguished from the rest of your time that the necessary cares may come in their proper place without any influence upon your good humor or interruption to other things by these methods you will put yourself in possession of being valued by your servants and then their obedience will naturally follow i must not forget one of the greatest articles belonging to a family which is the expense it must not be such as by failing either in the time or measure of it may rather draw censure than gain applause if it was well examined there is more money given to be laughed at than for any one thing in the world though the purchasers do not think so a well-stated rule is like the line when that is once passed we are under another pole so the first straying from a rule is a step towards making that which was before a virtue to change its nature and to grow either into a vice or at least an impertinence the art of laying out money wisely is not attained to without a great deal of thought and it is yet more difficult in the case of a wife who is accountable to her husband for her mistakes in it it is not only his money his credit too is at stake if what lieth under the wife's care is managed either with indecent thrift or too loose profusion you are therefore to keep the mean between these two extremes and it being hardly possible to hold the balance exactly even let it rather incline towards the liberal side as more suitable to your quality and less subject to reproach of the two a little money misspent is sooner recovered than the credit which is lost by having it unhandsomely saved and a wise husband will less forgive a shameful piece of parsimony than a little extravagance if it be not too often repeated his mind in this must be your chief direction and his temper when once known will in great measure justify your part in the management if he is pleased with it in your clothes avoid too much gaudy do not value yourself upon an embroidered gown and remember that a reasonable word or an obliging look will gain you more respect than all your fine trappings this is not said to restrain you from a decent compliance with the world provided you take the wiser and not the foolisher part of your sex for your pattern some distinctions are to be allowed whilst they are well suited to your quality and fortune and in the distribution of the expense it seemeth to me that a full attendance and well-chosen ornaments for your house will make you a better figure than too much glittering in what you wear which may with more ease be imitated by those that are below you yet this must not tempt you to starve everything but your own apartment or in order to more abundance there give just cause to the least servant you have to complain of the want of what is necessary above all fix it in your thoughts as an unchangeable maxim that nothing is truly fine but what is fit and that just so much as is proper for your circumstances of their several kinds is much finer than all you can add to it when you once break through these bounds you launch into a wide sea of extravagance everything will become necessary because you have a mind to it and you have a mind to it not because it is fit for you but because somebody else hath it this lady's logic setteth reason upon its head by carrying the rule from things to persons and appealing from what is right to every fool that is in the wrong the word necessary is miserably applied it disordereth families and overturneth governments by being so abused remember that children and fools want everything because they want wit to distinguish and therefore there is no stronger evidence of a crazy understanding than the making too large a catalogue of things necessary 
when in truth there are so very few things that have a right to be placed in it try everything first in your judgment before you allow it a place in your desire else your husband may think it is as necessary for him to deny as it is for you to have whatever is unreasonable and if you shall too often give him that advantage the habit of refusing may perhaps reach to things that are not unfit for you there are unthinking ladies who do not enough consider how little their own figure agreeth with the fine things they are so proud of others when they have them will hardly allow them to be visible they cannot be seen without light and that is many times so saucy and so prying that like a too forward gallant it is to be forbid the chamber some when you are ushered into their dark ruelle it is with such solemnity that a man would swear there was something in it till the unskilful lady breaketh silence and beginneth a chat which discovereth it is a puppet play with magnificent scenes many esteem things rather as they are hard to be gotten than that they are worth getting this looketh as if they had an interest to pursue that maxim because a great part of their own value dependeth upon it truth in these cases would be often unmannerly and might derogate from the prerogative great ladies would assume to themselves of being distinct creatures from those of their sex which are inferior and of less difficult access in other things too your condition must give the rule to you and therefore it is not a wife's part to aim at more than a bounded liberality the farther extent of that quality otherwise to be commended belongeth to the husband who hath better means for it generosity wrong placed becometh a vice it is no more a virtue when it groweth into an inconvenience virtues must be enlarged or restrained according to differing circumstances a princely mind will undo a private family therefore things must be suited or else they will not deserve to be commended let them in themselves be never so valuable and the expectations of the world are best answered when we acquit ourselves in that manner which seemeth to be prescribed to our several conditions without usurping upon those duties which do not so particularly belong to us i will close the consideration of this article of expense with this short word do not fetter yourself with such a restraint in it as may make you remarkable but remember that virtue is the greatest ornament and good sense the best equipage end of house family and children this is section 04 of the complete works of george savile first marquis of halifax this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. The Complete Works of George Savile, First Marquis of Halifax. Section 4. Advice to a Daughter, Behavior and Conversation. It is time now to lead you out of your house into the world, a dangerous step where your virtue alone will not secure you, except it is attended with a great deal of prudence you must have both for your guard and not stir without them the enemy is abroad and you are sure to be taken if you are found straggling your behavior is therefore to incline strongly towards the reserved part your character is to be immovably fixed upon that bottom not excluding a mixture of greater freedom as far as it may be innocent and well-timed the extravagancies of the age have made caution more necessary and by the same reason that the too great license of ill men hath by consequence in many things restrained the lawful liberty of those who did not abuse it the unjustifiable freedoms of some of your sex have involved the rest in the penalty of being reduced 
and though this cannot so alter the nature of things as to make that criminal which in itself is indifferent yet if it maketh it dangerous that alone is sufficient to justify the restraint a close behavior is the fittest to receive virtue for its constant guest because there and there only it can be secure proper reserves are the outworks and must never be deserted by those who intend to keep the place they keep off the possibilities not only of being taken but of being attempted and if a woman seeth danger though at never so remote a distance she is for that time to shorten her line of liberty she who will allow herself to go to the utmost extent of every thing that is lawful is so very near going farther that those who lie at watch will begin to count upon her mankind from the double temptation of vanity and desire is apt to turn everything a woman doth to the hopeful side and there are few who dare make an impudent application till they discern something which they are willing to take for an encouragement it is safer therefore to prevent such forwardness than to go about to cure it it gathereth strength by the first allowances and claimeth a right from having been at any time suffered with impunity therefore nothing is with more care to be avoided than such a kind of civility as may be mistaken for invitation and it will not be enough for you to keep yourself free from any criminal engagements for if you do that which either raiseth hopes or createth discourse there is a spot thrown upon your good name and those kind of stains are the harder to be taken out being dropped upon you by the man's vanity as well as by the woman's malice most men are in one sense platonic lovers though they are not willing to own that character they are so far philosophers as to allow that the greatest part of pleasure lieth in the mind and in pursuance of that maxim there are few who do not place the felicity more in the opinion of the world of their being prosperous lovers than in the blessing itself how much soever they appear to value it this being so you must be very cautious not to gratify these chameleons at the price of bringing a cloud upon your reputation which may be deeply wounded though your conscience is unconcerned your own sex too will not fail to help the least appearance that giveth a handle to be ill-turned the best of them will not be displeased to improve their own value by laying others under a disadvantage when there is a fair occasion given for it it distinguisheth them still the more their own credit is more exalted and like a picture set off with shades shineth more when a lady either less innocent or less discreet is set near to make them appear so much the brighter if these lend their breath to blast such as are so unwary as to give them this advantage you may be sure there will be a stronger gale from those who besides malice or emulation have an interest too to strike hard upon a virtuous woman it seemeth to them that their load of infamy is lessened by throwing part of it upon others so that they will not only improve it when it lieth in their way but take pains to find out the least mistake an innocent woman committeth in revenge of the injury she doth in leading a life which is a reproach to them with these you must be extreme wary and neither provoke them to be angry nor invite them to be intimate to the men you are to have a behavior which may secure you without offending them no ill-bred affected shyness nor a roughness unsuitable to your sex and unnecessary to your virtue but a way of living that may prevent all coarse railleries or unmannerly freedoms looks that forbid without rudeness and oblige 
without invitation or leaving room for the saucy inferences men's vanity suggesteth to them upon the least encouragements this is so very nice that it must engage you to have a perpetual watch upon your eyes and to remember that one careless glance giveth more advantage than a hundred words not enough considered the language of the eyes being very much the most significant and the most observed your civility which is always to be preserved must not be carried to a compliance which may betray you into irrecoverable mistakes this french ambiguous word complaisance hath led your sex into more blame than all other things put together it carrieth them by degrees into a certain thing called a good kind of woman an easy idle creature that doth neither good nor ill but by chance hath no choice but leaveth that to the company she keepeth time which by degrees addeth to the signification of words hath made her according to the modern style little better than one who thinketh it a rudeness to deny when civilly required either her service in person or her friendly assistance to those who would have a meeting or want a confidant she is a certain thing always at hand an easy companion who hath ever great compassion for distressed lovers she censureth nothing but rigour and is never without a plaister for a wounded reputation in which chiefly lieth her skill in chirurgery she seldom hath the propriety of any particular gallant but liveth upon brokage and waiteth for the scraps her friends are content to leave her there is another character not quite so criminal yet not less ridiculous which is that of a good-humoured woman one who thinketh she must always be in a laugh or a broad smile because good humour is an obliging quality thinketh it less ill manners to talk impertinently than to be silent in company when such a prating engine rideth admiral and carrieth the lantern in a circle of fools a cheerful coxcomb coming in for a recruit the chattering of monkeys is a better noise than such a concert of senseless merriment if she is applauded in it she is so encouraged that like a ballad singer who if commended breaketh his lungs she letteth herself loose and overfloweth upon the company she conceiveth that mirth is to have no intermission and therefore she will carry it about with her though it be to a funeral and if a man should put a familiar question she doth not know very well how to be angry for then she would be no more that pretty thing called a good-humoured woman this necessity of appearing at all times to be so infinitely pleased is a grievous mistake since in a handsome woman that invitation is unnecessary and in one who is not so ridiculous it is not intended by this that you should forswear laughing but remember that fools being always painted in that posture it may fright those who are wise from doing it too frequently and going too near a copy which is so little inviting and much more from doing it loud which is an unnatural sound and looketh so much like another sex that few things are more offensive that boisterous kind of jollity is as contrary to wit and good manners as it is to modesty and virtue besides it is a coarse kind of quality that throweth a woman into a lower form and degradeth her from the rank of those who are more refined some ladies speak loud and make a noise to be the more minded which looketh as if they beat their drums for volunteers and if by misfortune none come into them they may not without reason be a good deal out of countenance there is one thing yet more to be avoided which is the example of those who intend nothing farther than the vanity of conquest and think themselves secure of not having their honour tainted by it 
some are apt to believe their virtue is too obscure and not enough known except it is exposed to a broader light and set out to its best advantage by some public trials these are dangerous experiments and generally fail being built upon so weak a foundation as that of a too great confidence in ourselves it is as safe to play with fire as to dally with gallantry love is a passion that hath friends in the garrison and for that reason must by a woman be kept at such a distance that she may not be within the danger of doing the most usual thing in the world which is conspiring against herself else the humble gallant who is only admitted as a trophy very often becometh the conqueror he putteth on the style of victory and from an admirer groweth into a master for so he may be called from the moment he is in possession the first resolutions of stopping at good opinions and esteem grow weaker by degrees against the charms of courtship skilfully applied a lady is apt to think a man speaketh so much reason whilst he is commending her that she hath much ado to believe him in the wrong when he is making love to her and when besides the natural inducements your sex hath to be merciful she is bribed by well-chosen flattery the poor creature is in danger of being caught like a bird listening to the whistle of one that hath a snare for it conquest is so tempting a thing that it often maketh women mistake men's submissions which with all their fair appearance have generally less respect than art in them you are to remember that men who say extreme fine things many times say them most for their own sakes and that the vain gallant is often as well pleased with his own compliments as he could be with the kindest answer where there is not that ostentation you are to suspect there is design and as strong perfumes are seldom used but where they are necessary to smother an unwelcome scent so excessive good words leave room to believe they are strewed to cover something which is to gain admittance under a disguise you must therefore be upon your guard and consider that of the two respect is more dangerous than anger it puts even the best understandings out of their place for the time till their second thoughts restore them it stealeth upon us insensibly throweth down our defences and maketh it too late to resist after we have given it that advantage whereas railing goeth away in sound it hath so much noise in it that by giving warning it bespeaketh caution respect is a slow and sure poison and like poison swelleth us within ourselves where it prevaileth too much it groweth to be a kind of apoplexy in the mind turneth it quite round and after it hath once seized the understanding becometh mortal to it for these reasons the safest way is to treat it like a sly enemy and to be perpetually upon the watch against it i will add one advice to conclude this head which is that you will let every seven years make some alteration in you towards the graver side and not be like the girls of fifty who resolve to be always young whatever time with his iron teeth hath determined to the contrary unnatural things carry a deformity in them never to be disguised the liveliness of youth in a riper age looketh like a new patch upon an old gown so that a gay matron a cheerful old fool may be reasonably put into the list of the tamer kind of monsters there is a certain creature called a grave hobby horse a kind of she numps that pretendeth to be pulled to a play and must needs go to bartholomew fair to look after the young folks whom she only seemeth to make her care in reality she taketh them for her excuse 
such an old butterfly is of all creatures the most ridiculous and the soonest found out it is good to be early in your caution to avoid any thing that cometh within distance of such despicable patterns and not like some ladies who defer their conversion till they have been so long in possession of being laughed at that the world doth not know how to change their style even when they are reclaimed from that which gave the first occasion for it the advantages of being reserved are too many to set down i will only say that it is a guard to a good woman and a disguise to an ill one it is of so much use to both that those ought to use it as an artifice who refuse to practice it as a virtue end of section four advice to a daughter behavior and conversation read by john greenman this is section five of the complete works of george saville first marquis of halifax this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer visit librivox dot org advice to a daughter friendships by george saville read by john greenman i must in a particular manner recommend to you a strict care in the choice of your friendships perhaps the best are not without their objections but however be sure that yours may not stray from the rules which the wiser part of the world hath set to them the leagues of offensive and defensive seldom hold in politics and much less in friendships the violent intimacies which once broken of which they scarce ever fail make such a noise the bag of secrets untied they fly about like birds let loose from a cage and become the entertainment of the town besides these great dearnesses by degrees grow injurious to the rest of your acquaintance and throw them off from you there is such an offensive distinction when the dear friend cometh into the room that it is flinging stones at the company who are not apt to forgive it do not lay out your friendship too lavishly at first since it will like other things be so much the sooner spent neither let it be too sudden a growth for as the plants which shoot up too fast are not of that continuance as those which take more time for it so too swift a progress in pouring out your kindness is a certain sign that by the course of nature it will not be long lived you will be responsible to the world if you pitch upon such friends as at the time are under the weight of any criminal objection in that case you will bring yourself under the disadvantages of their character and must bear your part of it choosing implieth approving and if you fix upon a lady for your friend against whom the world shall have given judgment tis not so well natured as to believe you are altogether averse to her way of living since it doth not discourage you from admitting her into your kindness and resemblance of inclinations being thought none of the least inducements to friendship you will be looked upon at least as a well-wisher if not a partner with her in her faults if you can forgive them in another it may be presumed you will not be less gentle to yourself and therefore you must not take it ill if you are reckoned a croupier and condemned to pay an equal share with such a friend of the reputation she hath lost if it happeneth that your friend should fall from the state of innocence after your kindness was engaged to her you may be slow in your belief in the beginning of the discovery but as soon as you are convinced by a rational evidence you must without breaking too roughly make a far and a quick retreat from such a mistaken acquaintance else by moving too slowly from one that is so tainted the contagion may reach you so far as to give you part of the scandal though not of the guilt 
this matter is so nice that as you must not be too hasty to join in the censure upon your friend when she is accused so you are not on the other side to defend her with too much warmth for if she should happen to deserve the report of common fame besides the vexation that belongeth to such a mistake you will draw an ill appearance upon yourself and it will be thought you pleaded for her not without some consideration of yourself the anger which must be put on to vindicate the reputation of an injured friend may incline the company to suspect you would not be so zealous if there was not a possibility that the case might be your own for this reason you are not to carry your dearness so far as absolutely to lose your sight where your friend is concerned because malice is too quick-sighted it doth not follow that friendships must be blind there is to be a mean between these two extremes else your excess of good nature may betray you into a very ridiculous figure and by degrees who may be preferred to such offices as you will not be proud of your ignorance may lessen the guilt but will improve the jest upon you who shall be kindly solicitous to procure a meeting and innocently contribute to the ills you would avoid whilst the contriving lovers when they are alone shall make you the subject of their mirth and perhaps with respect to the goddess of love be it spoken it is not the worst part of their entertainment at least it is the most lasting to laugh at the believing friend who was so easily deluded let the good sense of your friends be a chief ingredient in your choice of them else let your reputation be never so clear it may be clouded by their impertinence it is like our houses being in the power of a drunken or a careless neighbor only so much worse as that there will be no insurance here to make you amends as there is in the case of fire to conclude this paragraph if formality is to be allowed in any instance it is to be put on to resist the invasion of such forward women as shall press themselves into your friendship where if admitted they will either be a snare or an encumbrance end of advice to a daughter friendships this is section six of the complete works of george saville first marquis of halifax this librivox recording is in the public domain for more information or to volunteer visit LibriVox.org advice to a daughter censure read by john greenman i will come next to the consideration how you are to manage your censure in which both care and skill will be a good deal required to distinguish is not only natural but necessary and the effect of it is that we cannot avoid giving judgment in our minds either to absolve or to condemn as the case requireth the difficulty is to know when and where it is fit to proclaim the sentence an aversion to what is criminal a contempt of what is ridiculous are the inseparable companions of understanding and virtue but the letting them go farther than our own thoughts hath so much danger in it that though it is neither possible nor fit to suppress them entirely yet it is necessary they should be kept under very great restraints an unlimited liberty of this kind is little less than sending a herald and proclaiming war to the world which is an angry beast when so provoked the contest will be unequal though you are never so much in the right and if you begin against such an adversary it will tear you in pieces with this justification that it is done in its own defence you must therefore take heed of laughing except in company that is very sure it is throwing snowballs against bullets and it is the disadvantage of a woman 
that the malice of the world will help the brutality of those who will throw a slovenly untruth upon her you are for this reason to suppress your impatience for fools who besides that they are too strong a party to be unnecessarily provoked are of all others the most dangerous in this case a blockhead in his rage will return a dull jest that will lie heavy though there is not a grain of wit in it others will do it with more art and you must not think yourself secure because your reputation may perhaps be out of the reach of ill-will for if it findeth that part guarded it will seek one which is more exposed it flieth like a corrupt humor in the body to the weakest part if you have a tender side the world will be sure to find it and to put the worst color upon all you say or do give an aggravation to everything that may lessen you and a spiteful turn to everything that might recommend you anger layeth open those defects which friendship would not see and civility might be willing to forget malice needeth no such invitation to encourage it neither are any pains more superfluous than those we take to be ill spoken of if envy which never dieth and seldom sleepeth is content sometimes to be in a slumber it is very unskilful to make a noise to awake it besides your wit will be misapplied if it is wholly directed to discern the faults of others when it is so necessary to be often used to mend and prevent your own the sending our thoughts too much abroad hath the same effect as when a family never stayeth at home neglect and disorder naturally followeth as it must do within ourselves if we do not frequently turn our eyes inward to see what is amiss with us where it is a sign we have an unwelcome prospect when we do not care to look upon it but rather seek our consolations in the faults of those we converse with avoid being the first in fixing a hard censure let it be confirmed by the general voice before you give in to it neither are you then to give sentence like a magistrate or as if you had a special authority to bestow a good or ill name at your discretion do not dwell too long upon a weak side touch and go away take pleasure to stay longer where you can commend like bees that fix only upon those herbs out of which they may extract the juice of which their honey is composed a virtue stuck with bristles is too rough for this age it must be adorned with some flowery or else it will be unwillingly entertained so that even where it may be fit to strike do it like a lady gently and assure yourself that where you care to do it you will wound others more and hurt yourself less by soft strokes than by being harsh or violent the triumph of wit is to make your good nature subdue your censure to be quick in seeing faults and slow in exposing them you are to consider that the invisible thing called a good name is made up of the breath of numbers that speak well of you so that if by a disobliging word you silence the meanest the gale will be less strong which is to bear up your esteem and though nothing is so vain as the eager pursuit of empty applause yet to be well thought of and to be kindly used by the world is like a glory about a woman's head tis a perfume she carrieth about with her and leaveth wherever she goeth tis a charm against ill-will malice may empty her quiver but cannot wound the dirt will not stick the jests will not take without the consent of the world a scandal doth not go deep it is only a slight stroke upon the injured party and returneth with the greater force upon those that gave it end of advice to a daughter censure read by john greenman
This is section seven of The Complete Works of George Saville, First Marquis of Halifax. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Complete Works of George Saville, First Marquis of Halifax, Advice to a Daughter, Vanity and Affectation. Read by John Greenman. I must with more than ordinary earnestness give you caution against vanity, it being the fault to which your sex seemeth to be the most inclined. And, since affectation for the most part attendeth it, I do not know how to divide them. I will not call them twins, because more properly vanity is the mother, and affectation is the darling daughter. Vanity is the sin, and affectation is the punishment. The first may be called the root of self-love, the other the fruit. Vanity is never at its full growth till it spreadeth into affectation, and then it is complete. Not to dwell any longer upon the definition of them, I will pass to the means and motives to avoid them. In order to it you are to consider that the world challengeth the right of distributing esteem and applause, so that where any assume by their single authority to be their own carvers, it groweth angry, and never faileth to seek revenge. And if we may measure a fault by the greatness of the penalty, there are few of a higher size than vanity as there is scarce a punishment which can be heavier than that of being laughed at. Vanity maketh a woman tainted with it, so top full of herself that she spilleth it upon the company. And because her own thoughts are entirely employed in self-contemplation, she endeavoureth by a cruel mistake to confine her acquaintance to the same narrow circle of that which only concerneth her ladyship forgetting that she is not of half that importance to the world that she is to herself, so mistaken she is in her value by being her own appraiser. She will fetch such a compass in discourse to bring in her beloved self, and rather than fail her fine petticoat, that there can hardly be a better scene than such a trial of ridiculous ingenuity it is a pleasure to see her angle for commendations and rise so dissatisfied with the ill-bred company if they will not bite to observe her throwing her eyes about to fetch in prisoners and go about cruising like a privateer and so out of countenance if she return without booty is no ill piece of comedy she is so eager to draw respect that she always misseth it, yet thinketh it so much her due, that when she faileth she groweth waspish, not considering that it is impossible to commit a rape upon the will, that it must be fairly gained, and will not be taken by storm, and that in this case the tax ever riseth highest by a benevolence. If the world, instead of admiring her imaginary excellencies, taketh the liberty to laugh at them, she appealeth from it to herself, for whom she giveth sentence, and proclaimeth it in all companies. On the other side, if encouraged by a civil word, she is so obliging that she will give thanks for being laughed at in good language. She taketh a compliment for a demonstration, and setteth it up as an evidence, even against her looking-glass. But the good lady, being all this while in a most profound ignorance of herself, forgetteth that men would not let her talk upon them, and throw so many senseless words at their head, if they did not intend to put her person to fine and ransom for her impertinence. Good words of any other lady are so many stones thrown at her, she can by no means bear them they make her so uneasy that she cannot keep her seat, but up she riseth, and goeth home half burst with anger and straight-lacing. If by great chance she saith anything that hath sense in it, 
she expecteth such an excessive rate of commendations that to her thinking the company ever riseth in her debt she looketh upon rules as things made for the common people and not for persons of her rank and this opinion sometimes tempteth her to extend her prerogative to the dispensing with the commandments if by great fortune she happeneth in spite of her vanity to be honest she is so troublesome with it that as far as in her lieth she maketh a scurvy thing of it her bragging of her virtue looketh as if it cost her so much pains to get the better of herself that the inferences are very ridiculous her good humor is generally applied to the laughing at good sense it would do one good to see how heartily she despiseth anything that is fit for her to do the greatest part of her fancy is laid out in choosing her gown as her discretion is chiefly employed in not paying for it she is faithful to the fashion to which not only her opinion but her senses are wholly resigned so obsequious she is to it that she would be ready to be reconciled even to virtue with all its faults if she had her dancing master's word that it was practised at court to a woman so composed when affectation cometh in to improve her character it is then raised to the highest perfection she first setteth up for a fine thing and for that reason will distinguish herself right or wrong in everything she doth she would have it thought that she is made of so much the finer clay and so much more sifted than ordinary that she hath no common earth about her to this end she must neither move nor speak like other women because it would be vulgar and therefore must have a language of her own since ordinary english is too coarse for her the looking-glass in the morning dictateth to her all the motions of the day which by how much the more studied are so much the more mistaken she cometh into a room as if her limbs were set on with ill-made screws which maketh the company fear the pretty thing should leave some of its artificial person upon the floor she doth not like herself as god almighty made her but will have some of her own workmanship which is so far from making her a better thing than a woman that it turneth her into a worse creature than a monkey she falleth out with nature against which she maketh war without admitting a truce those moments excepted in which her gallant may reconcile her to it when she hath a mind to be soft and languishing there is something so unnatural in that affected easiness that her frowns could not be by many degrees so forbidden when she would appear unreasonably humble one may see she is so excessively proud that there is no enduring it there is such an impertinent smile such a satisfied simper when she faintly disowneth some fulsome commendation a man happeneth to bestow upon her against his conscience that her thanks for it are more visible under such a thin disguise than they could be if she should print them if a handsomer woman taketh any liberty of dressing out of the ordinary rules the mistaken lady followeth without distinguishing the unequal pattern and maketh herself uglier by an example misplaced either forgetting the privilege of good looks in another or presuming without sufficient reason upon her own her discourse is a senseless chime of empty words a heap of compliments so equally applied to differing persons that they are neither valued nor believed her eyes keep pace with her tongue and are therefore always in motion one may discern that they generally incline to the compassionate side and that notwithstanding her pretence to virtue she is gentle to distressed lovers and ladies that are merciful she will repeat the tender part of a play so feelingly that the company may guess without injustice she was not altogether a disinterested spectator she thinketh that paint and sin are concealed by railing at them 
Upon the latter she is less hard, and being divided between the two opposite prides of her beauty and her virtue, she is often tempted to give broad hints that some body is dying for her ; and of the two she is less unwilling to let the World think she may be sometimes prophaned, than that she is never worshipped. Very great Beauty may perhaps so dazzle for a time, that Men may not so clearly see the deformity of these Affectations ; but when the brightness goeth off, and that the Lover's Eyes are by that means set at liberty to see things as they are, he will naturally return to his Senses, and recover the Mistake into which the Lady's Good Looks had at first engaged him, and being once undeceived, ceaseth to worship that as a goddess, which he seeth is only an artificial shrine moved by wheels and springs to delude him. Such women please only like the first opening of a scene, that hath nothing to recommend it but the being new. They may be compared to flies, that have pretty shining wings for two or three hot months, but the first cold weather maketh an end of them. So the latter season of these fluttering creatures is dismal. From their nearest friends they receive a very faint respect, from the rest of the world the utmost degree of contempt. Let this picture supply the place of any other rules which might be given to prevent your resemblance to it, the deformity of it, well considered, is instruction enough from the same reason that the sight of a drunkard is a better sermon against that vice than the best that was ever preached upon that subject end of advice to a daughter vanity and affectation read by john greenman this is section eight of the Complete Works of George Saville, First Marquis of Halifax. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Complete Works of George Saville, First Marquis of Halifax. Advice to a Daughter. Pride. Read by John Greenman. After having said this against vanity, I do not intend to apply the same censure to pride, well placed and rightly defined. It is an ambiguous word. One kind of it is as much a virtue as the other is a vice. But we are naturally so apt to choose the worst that it is become dangerous to commend the best side of it. A woman is not to be proud of her fine gown, nor, when she hath less wit than her neighbors, to comfort herself that she hath more lace. Some ladies put so much weight upon ornaments, that if one could see into their hearts, it would be found that even the thought of death is made less heavy to them by the contemplation of their being laid out in state, and honorably attended to the grave one may come a good deal short of such an extreme and yet still be sufficiently impertinent by setting a wrong value upon things which ought to be used with more indifference a lady must not appear solicitous to engross respect to herself but be content with a reasonable distribution and allow it to others that she may have it returned to her she is not to be troublesomely nice nor distinguish herself by being too delicate as if ordinary things were too coarse for her this is an unmannerly and offensive pride and when it is practised deserveth to be mortified of which it seldom faileth she is not to lean too much upon her quality much less to despise those who are below it some make quality an idol, and then their reason must fall down and worship it. They would have the world think that no amends can ever be made for the want of a great title or an ancient coat of arms, 
they imagine that with these advantages they stand upon the higher ground which maketh them look down upon merit and virtue as things inferior to them this mistake is not only senseless but criminal too in putting a greater price upon that which is a piece of good luck than upon things which are valuable in themselves laughing is not enough for such a folly it must be severely whipped as it justly deserves it will be confessed there are frequent temptations given by pert upstarts to be angry and by that to have our judgments corrupted in these cases but they are to be resisted and the utmost that is to be allowed is when those of a new edition will forget themselves so as either to brag of their weak side or to endeavor to hide their meanness by their insolence to cure them by a little seasonable raillery a little sharpness well placed without dwelling too long upon it these and many other kinds of pride are to be avoided that which is to be recommended to you is the emulation to raise yourself to a character by which you may be distinguished an eagerness for precedence in virtue and all such other things as may gain you a greater share of the good opinion of the world esteem to virtue is like a cherishing air to plants and flowers which maketh them blow and prosper and for that reason it may be allowed to be in some degree the cause as well as the reward of it that pride which leadeth to a good end cannot be a vice since it is the beginning of a virtue and to be pleased with just applause is so far from a fault that it would be an ill symptom in a woman who should not place the greatest part of her satisfaction in it humility is no doubt a great virtue but it ceaseth to be so when it is afraid to scorn an ill thing against vice and folly it is becoming your sex to be haughty but you must not carry the contempt of things to arrogance towards persons and it must be done with fitting distinctions else it may be inconvenient by being unseasonable a pride that raiseth a little anger to be outdone in any thing that is good will have so good an effect that it is very hard to allow it to be a fault it is no easy matter to carry even between these differing kinds so described but remember that it is safer for a woman to be thought too proud than too familiar end of advice to a daughter pride read by john greenman this is section nine of the complete works of george savile first marquis of halifax this librivox recording is in the public domain the complete works of george savile first marquis of halifax advice to a daughter diversions the last thing i shall recommend to you is a wise and a safe method of using diversions to be too eager in the pursuit of pleasure whilst you are young is dangerous to catch at it in riper years is grasping a shadow it will not be held besides that by being less natural it groweth to be indecent diversions are the most properly applied to ease and relieve those who are oppressed by being too much employed those that are idle have no need of them and yet they above all others give themselves up to them to unbend our thoughts when they are too much stretched by our cares is not more natural than it is necessary but to turn our whole life into a holy day is not only ridiculous but destroyeth pleasure instead of promoting it the mind like the body is tired by being always in one posture too serious breaketh and too diverting looseneth it it is variety that giveth the relish 
so that diversions too frequently repeated grow first to be indifferent and at last tedious whilst they are well chosen and well timed they are never to be blamed but when they are used to an excess though very innocent at first they often grow to be criminal and never fail to be impertinent some ladies are bespoken for merry meetings as bezath was for duels they are engaged in a circle of idleness where they turn round for the whole year without the interruption of a serious hour they know all the players names and are intimately acquainted with all the booths in bartholomew fair no soldier is more obedient to the sound of his captain's trumpet than they are to that which summoneth them to a puppet play or a monster the spring that bringeth out flies and fools maketh them inhabitants in hyde park in the winter they are in encumbrance to the playhouse and the ballast of the drawing-room the streets all this while are so weary of these daily faces that men's eyes are overlaid with them the sight is glutted with fine things as the stomach with sweet ones and when a fair lady will give too much of herself to the world she groweth luscious and oppresseth instead of pleasing these jolly ladies do so continually seek diversion that in a little time they grow into a jest yet are unwilling to remember that if they were seldomer seen they would not be so often laughed at besides they make themselves cheap than which there cannot be an unkinder word bestowed upon your sex to play sometimes to entertain company or to divert yourself is not to be disallowed but to do it so often as to be called a gamester is to be avoided next to the things that are most criminal it hath consequences of several kinds not to be endured it will engage you into a habit of idleness and ill hours draw you into ill-mixed company make you neglect your civilities abroad and your business at home and impose into your acquaintance such as will do you no credit to deep play there will be yet greater objections it will give occasion to the world to ask spiteful questions how you dare venture to lose and what means you have to pay such great sums if you pay exactly it will be inquired from whence the money cometh if you owe and especially to a man you must be so very civil to him for his forbearance that it layeth the ground of having it farther improved if the gentleman is so disposed who will be thought no unfair creditor if were the state faileth he seizeth upon the person besides if a lady could see her own face upon an ill game at a deep stake she would certainly forswear anything that could put her looks under such a disadvantage to dance sometimes will not be imputed to you as a fault but remember that the end of your learning it was that you might the better know how to move gracefully it is only an advantage so far when it goeth beyond it one may call it excelling in a mistake which is no very great commendation it is better for a woman never to dance because she hath no skill in it than to do it too often because she doth it well the easiest as well as the safest method of doing it is in private companies amongst particular friends and then carelessly like a diversion rather than with solemnity as if it was a business or had anything in it to deserve a month's preparation by serious conference with a dancing master much more might be said to all these heads and many more might be added to them but i must restrain my thoughts which are full of my dear child and would overflow into a volume which would not be fit for a new year's gift i will conclude with my warmest wishes for all that is good to you that you may live so as to be an ornament to your family and a pattern to your sex that you may be blessed 
with a husband that may value and with children that may inherit your virtue that you may shine in the world by a true light and silence envy by deserving to be esteemed that wit and virtue may both conspire to make you a great figure when they are separated the first is so empty and the other so faint that they scarce have right to be commended may they therefore meet and never part let them be your guardian angels and be sure never to stray out of the distance of their joint protection may you so raise your character that you may help to make the next age a better thing and leave posterity in your debt for the disadvantage it shall receive by your example let me conjure you my dearest to comply with this kind ambition of a father whose thoughts are so engaged in your behalf that he reckoneth your happiness to be the greatest part of his own end of diversions and end of advice to a daughter read by john greenman this is section ten of the complete works of george saville first marquis of halifax this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Complete Works of George Saville, First Marquis of Halifax, Section 10. The Character of a Trimmer. The Preface. Read by John Greenman. It must be more than ordinary provocation that can tempt a man to write in an age overrun with scribners, as Egypt was with flies and locusts that worst vermin of small authors hath given the world such a surfeit that instead of desiring to write a man would be more inclined to wish for his own ease that he could not read but there are some things which do so raise our passions that our reason can make no resistance and when madmen in two extremes shall agree to make common sense treason and join to fix an ill character upon the only men in the nation who deserve a good one i am no longer master of my better resolution to let the world alone and must break loose from my more reasonable thoughts to expose these false coiners who would make their copper wares pass upon us for good payment amongst all the engines of dissension there hath been none more powerful in all times than the fixing names upon one another of contumely and reproach and the reason is plain in respect of the people who though generally they are uncapable of making a syllogism or forming an argument yet they can pronounce a word and that serveth their turn to throw it with their dull malice at the head of those they do not like such things ever begin in jest and end in blood and the same word which at first maketh the company merry groweth in time to a military signal to cut one another's throats these mistakes are to be lamented though not easily cured being suitable enough to the corrupted nature of mankind but tis hard that men will not only invent ill names but they will rest and misinterpret good ones so afraid some are even of a reconciling sound that they raise another noise to keep it from being heard lest it should set up and encourage a dangerous sort of men who prefer peace and agreement before violence and confusion were it not for this why after we have played the fool with throwing wig and tory at one another as boys do snowballs do we grow angry at a new name which by its true signification might do as much to put us into our wits as the other hath done to put us out of them this innocent word trimmer signifieth no more than this that if men are together in a boat and one part of the company would weigh it down on one side another would make it lean as much to the contrary it happeneth there is a third opinion of those who conceive it could do as well if the boat went even 
without endangering the passengers now tis hard to imagine by what figure in language or by what rule in sense this cometh to be a fault and it is much more a wonder it should be thought a heresy but so it happeneth that the poor trimmer hath now all the powder spent upon him alone while the wig is a forgotten or at least a neglected enemy there is no danger now to the state if some men may be believed but from the beast called a trimmer take heed of him he is the instrument that must destroy church and state a strange kind of monster whose deformity is so exposed that were it a true picture that is made of him it would be enough to fright children and make women miscarry at the sight of it but it may be worth examining whether he is such a beast as he is painted i am not of that opinion and am so far from thinking him an infidel either in church or state that i am neither afraid to expose the articles of his faith in relation to government nor to say that i prefer them before any other political creed that either our angry divines or our refined statesmen would impose upon us i have therefore in the following discourse endeavored to explain the trimmer's principles and opinions and then leave it to all discerning and impartial judges whether he can with justice be so arraigned and whether those who deliberately pervert a good name do not very justly deserve the worst that can be put upon themselves End of the character of a trimmer the preface read by john greenman This is section 11 of The Complete Works of George Saville, First Marquis of Halifax. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Complete Works of George Saville, First Marquis of Halifax. The Trimmer's Opinion of the Laws and Government. Read by John Greenman. Our Trimmer, as he hath a great veneration for laws in general, so he hath a more particular for our own he looketh upon them as the chains that tie up our unruly passions which else like wild beasts let loose would reduce the world into its first state of barbarism and hostility the good things we enjoy we owe to them and all the ill things we are freed from is by their protection god himself thought it not enough to be a creator without being a lawgiver and his goodness had been defective towards mankind in making them if he had not prescribed rules to make them happy to all laws flow from that of nature and where that is not the foundation they may be legally imposed but they will be lamely obeyed by this nature is not meant that which fools and madmen misquote to justify their excesses it is innocent and uncorrupted nature that which disposeth men to choose virtue without its being prescribed and which is so far from inspiring ill thoughts into us that we take pains to suppress the good ones it infuseth the civilized world hath ever paid a willing subjection to laws even conquerors have done homage to them as the romans who took patterns of good laws even from those they had subdued and at the same time that they triumphed over an enslaved people the very laws of that place did not only remain safe but became victorious their new masters instead of suppressing them paid them more respect than they had from those who first made them and by this wise method they arrived to such an admirable constitution of laws that to this day they reign by them this excellency of them triumpheth still and the world payeth now an acknowledgment of their obedience to that mighty empire though so many ages after it is dissolved and by a later instance the kings of france who in practice use their laws pretty familiarly 
yet think their picture is drawn with most advantage upon their seals when they are placed in the seat of justice and though the hieroglyphic is not there of so much use to the people as they would wish yet it showeth that no prince is so great as not to think fit for his own credit at least to give an outward when he refuseth a real worship to the laws they are to mankind that which the sun is to plants whilst it cherisheth and preserveth them where they have their force and are not clouded or suppressed everything smileth and flourisheth but where they are darkened and not suffered to shine out it maketh everything to wither and decay they secure men not only against one another but against themselves too they are a sanctuary to which the crown hath occasion to resort as often as the people so that it is an interest as well as a duty to preserve them there would be no end of making a panegyric of laws let it be enough to add that without laws the world would become a wilderness and men little less than beasts but with all this the best things may come to be the worst if they are not in good hands and if it be true that the wisest men generally make the laws it is as true that the strongest do often interpret them and as rivers belong as much to the channel where they run as to the spring from whence they first rise so the laws depend as much upon the pipes through which they are to pass as upon the fountain from whence they flow the authority of a king who is head of the law as well as the dignity of public justice is debased when the clear stream of the law is puddled and disturbed by bunglers or conveyed by unclean instruments to the people our trimmer would have them appear in their full lustre and would be grieved to see the day when instead of speaking with authority from the seats of justice they should speak out of a grate with a lamenting voice like prisoners that desire to be rescued he wisheth that the bench may have a natural as well as a legal superiority to the bar he thinketh men's abilities very much misplaced when the reason of him that pleadeth is visibly too strong for those who judge and give sentence when those from the bar seem to dictate to their superiors upon the bench their furs will look scurvily about them and the respect of the world will leave the bare character of a judge to follow the essential knowledge of a lawyer who may be greater in himself than the other can be with all his trappings an uncontested superiority in any calling will have the better of any discountenance that authority can put upon it and therefore if ever such an unnatural method should be introduced it is then that westminster hall might be said to stand upon its head and though justice itself can never be so yet the administration of it would be rendered ridiculous a judge hath such power lodged in him that the king will never be thought to have chosen well where the voice of mankind hath not beforehand recommended the man to his station when men are made judges of what they do not understand the world censureth such a choice not out of ill-will to the men but fear to themselves if the king had the sole power of choosing physicians men would tremble to see bunglers preferred yet the necessity of taking physic from a doctor is generally not so great as that of receiving justice from a judge and yet the inferences will be very severe in such cases for either it will be thought that such men bought what they were not able to deserve or which is as bad that obedience shall be looked upon as a better qualification in a judge than skill or integrity when such sacred things as the laws are not only touched but guided by profane hands men will fear that out of the tree of the law from whence we expect shade and shelter such workmen will make cudgels to beat us with or rather they will turn to the cannon upon our properties 
that were entrusted with them for their defence. To see the laws mangled, disguised, speak quite another language than their own, to see them thrown from the dignity of protecting mankind to the disgraceful office of destroying them, and notwithstanding their innocence in themselves to be made the worst instruments that the most refined villainy can make use of, will raise men's anger above the power of laying it down again, and tempt them to follow the evil examples given them of judging without hearing, when so provoked by their desire of revenge. Our trimmer, therefore, as he thinketh the laws are jewels, so he believeth that they are nowhere better set than in the constitution of our English government, if rightly understood, and carefully preserved. It would be too great partiality to say they are perfect or liable to no objection. Such things are not of this world. But if they have more excellencies and fewer faults than any other we know, it is enough to recommend them to our esteem. The dispute, which is a greater beauty, a monarchy or a commonwealth, hath lasted long between their contending lovers, and they have behaved themselves so like lovers, who in good manners must be out of their wits, who used such figures to exalt their own idols on either side, and such angry aggravations to reproach one another in the contest, that moderate men have in all times smiled upon this eagerness, and thought it differed very little from a downright frenzy. We in England, by a happy use of the controversy, conclude them both in the wrong, and reject them from being our pattern, not taking the words in the utmost extent, which is monarchy, a thing that leaveth men no liberty and a commonwealth such a one as alloweth them no quiet we think that a wise mean between these barbarous extremes is that which self-preservation ought to dictate to our wishes and we may say we have attained to this mean in a greater measure than any nation now in being or perhaps any we have read of though never so much celebrated for the wisdom or felicity of their constitutions we take from one the too great power of doing hurt and yet leave enough to govern and protect us we take from the other the confusion the parity the animosities and the license and yet reserve a due care of such a liberty as may consist with men's allegiance but it being hard if not impossible to be exactly even our government hath much the stronger bias towards monarchy which by the general consent and practice of mankind seemeth to have the advantage in dispute against a commonwealth the rules of a commonwealth are too hard for the bulk of mankind to come up to that form of government requireth such a spirit to carry it on as doth not dwell in great numbers, but is restrained to so very few, especially in this age, that let the methods appear never so reasonable in paper, they must fail in practice, which will ever be suited more to men's nature as it is, than as it should be. Monarchy is liked by the people, for the bells and the tinsel, the outward pomp and gilding, and there must be milk for babes, since the greatest part of mankind are, and ever will be, included in that list, and it is approved by wise and thinking men, all circumstances and objections impartially considered, that it hath so great an advantage above all other forms, when the administration of that power falleth in good hands, that all other governments look out of countenance, when they are set in competition with it. Lycurgus might have saved himself the trouble of making laws if either he had been immortal, or that he could have secured to posterity a succeeding race of princes like himself. His own example was a better law than he could with all his skill tell how to make. Such a prince is a living law that dictateth to his subjects 
whose thoughts in that case never rise above their obedience the confidence they have in the virtue and knowledge of the master preventing the scruples and apprehensions to which men are naturally inclined in relation to those that govern them such a magistrate is the life and soul of justice whereas the law is but a body and a dead one too without his influence to give it warmth and vigour and by the irresistible power of his virtue he doth so reconcile dominion and allegiance that all disputes between them are silenced and subdued and indeed no monarchy can be perfect and absolute without exception but where the prince is superior by his virtue as well as by his character and his power so that to screw out precedents of unlimited power is a plain diminution to a prince that nature hath made great and who had better make himself a glorious example to posterity than borrow an authority from dark records raised out of the grave which besides their non-usage have always in them matter of controversy and debate and it may be affirmed that the instances are very rare of princes having the worst in the dispute with their people if they were eminent for justice in time of peace or conduct in time of war such advantage the crown giveth to those who adorn it by their own personal virtues but since for the greater honour of good and wise princes and the better to set off their character by the comparison heaven hath decreed there must be a mixture and that such as are perverse or insufficient or perhaps both are at least to have their equal turns in the government of the world and besides that the will of man is so various and so unbounded a thing and so fatal too when joined with power misapplied it is no wonder if those who are to be governed are unwilling to have so dangerous as well as so uncertain a standard of their obedience there must be therefore rules and laws for want of which or at least the observation of them it was as capital for man to say that nero did not play well upon the lute as to commit treason or blaspheme the gods and even vespasian himself had like to have lost his life for sleeping whilst he should have attended and admired that empress impertinence upon the stage there is a wantonness in great power that men are generally too apt to be corrupted with and for that reason a wise prince to prevent the temptation arising from common frailty would choose to govern by rules for his own sake as well as for his people's since it only secureth him from errors and doth not lessen the real authority that a good magistrate would care to be possessed of for if the will of a prince is contrary either to reason itself or to the universal opinion of his subjects the law by a kind of restraint rescueth him from a disease that would undo him if his will on the other side is reasonable or well directed that will immediately becometh a law and he is arbitrary by an easy and natural consequence without taking pains or overturning the world for it if princes consider laws as things imposed on them they have the appearance of fetters of iron but to such as would make them their choice as well as their practice they are chains of gold and in that respect are ornaments as in others they are a defence to them and by a comparison not improper for god's vicegerents upon earth as our maker never commandeth our obedience to anything that as reasonable creatures we ought not to make our own election so a good and wise governor though all laws were abolished would by the voluntary direction of his own reason do without restraint the very same things that they would have enjoined our trimmer thinketh that the king and kingdom ought to be one creature not to be separated in their political capacity and when either of them undertake to act apart it is like the crawling of worms after they are cut in pieces which cannot be a lasting motion the whole creature not stirring at a time 
if the body have a dead palsy the head cannot make it move and god hath not yet delegated such a healing power to princes as that they can in a moment say to a languishing people oppressed and in despair take up your beds and walk the figure of a king is so comprehensive and exalted a thing that it is a kind of degrading him to lodge that power separately in his own natural person which can never be safely or naturally great but where the people are so united to him as to be flesh of his flesh and bone of his bone for when he is reduced to the single definition of a man he sinketh into so low a character that it is a temptation upon men's allegiance and an impairing that veneration which is necessary to preserve their duty to him whereas a prince who is so joined to his people that they seem to be his limbs rather than his subjects clothed with mercy and justice rightly applied in their several places his throne supported by love as well as by power and the warm wishes of his devoted subjects like never failing incense still ascending towards him looketh so like the best image we can frame to ourselves of god almighty that men would have much ado not to fall down and worship him and would be much more tempted to the sin of idolatry than to that of disobedience our trimmer is of opinion that there must be so much dignity inseparably annexed to the royal function as may be sufficient to secure it from insolence and contempt and there must be condescensions from the throne like kind showers from heaven that the prince may look so much the more like god almighty's deputy upon earth for power without love hath a terrifying aspect and the worship which is paid to it is like that which the indians give out of fear to wild beasts and devils he that feareth god only because there is an hell must wish there were no god and he who feareth the king only because he can punish must wish there were no king so that without a principle of love there can be no true allegiance and there must remain perpetual seeds of resistance against a power that is built upon such an unnatural foundation as that of fear and terror all force is a kind of foul play and whosoever aimeth at it himself doth by implication allow it to those he playeth with so that there will be ever matter prepared in the minds of people when they are provoked and the prince to secure himself must live in the midst of his own subjects as if he were in a conquered country raise arms as if he were immediately to meet or resist an invasion and all this while sleep as unquietly from the fear of the remedies as he did before from that of the disease it being hard for him to forget that more princes have been destroyed by their guards than by their people and that even at the time when the rule was quod principi placuit lex esto the armies and the praetorian bands which were the instruments of that unruly power were frequently the means made use of to destroy them who had it there will ever be this difference between god and his vicegerents that god is still above the instruments he useth and out of the danger of receiving hurt from them but princes can never lodge power in any hands which may not at some time turn it back upon them for though it is possible enough for a king to have power to satisfy his ambition yet no kingdom hath money enough to satisfy the avarice of under workmen who learn from that prince who will exact more than belongeth to him to expect from him much more than they deserve and growing angry upon the first disappointment they are the devils which grow terrible to the conjurers themselves who brought them up and can't send them down again and besides that there can be no lasting radical security but when the governed are satisfied with the governors it must be a dominion very unpleasant to a prince of an elevated mind to impose an abject and sordid servility instead of receiving the willing sacrifice of duty and obedience 
the bravest princes in all times who were uncapable of any other kind of fear have feared to grieve their own people such a fear is a glory and in this sense tis an infamy not to be a coward so that the mistaken heroes who are void of this generous kind of fear need no other aggravation to complete their ill characters when a despotic prince hath bruised all his subjects with a slavish obedience all the force he can use cannot subdue his own fears enemies of his own creation to which he can never be reconciled it being impossible to do injustice and not to fear revenge there is no cure for this fear but the not deserving to be hurt and therefore a prince who doth not allow his thoughts to stray beyond the rules of justice hath always the blessing of an inward quiet and assurance as a natural effect of his good meaning to his people and though he will not neglect due precautions to secure himself in all events yet he is uncapable of entertaining vain and remote suspicions of those of whom he resolveth never to deserve ill it is very hard for a prince to fear rebellion who neither doth nor intendeth to do anything to provoke it therefore too great a diligence in the governors to raise and improve dangers and fears from the people is no very good symptom and naturally begetteth an inference that they have thoughts of putting their subjects allegiance to a trial and therefore not without some reason fear beforehand that the irregularities they intend may raise men to a resistance our trimmer thinketh it no advantage to a government to endeavour the suppressing all kind of right which may remain in the body of the people or to employ small authors in it whose officiousness or want of money may encourage them to write though it is not very easy to have abilities equal to such a subject they forget that in their too high strained arguments for the rights of princes they very often plead against humane nature which will always give a bias to those reasons which seem of her side it is the people that readeth those books and it is the people that must judge of them and therefore no maxims should be laid down for the right of government to which there can be any reasonable objection for the world hath an interest and for that reason is more than ordinary discerning to find out the weak sides of such arguments as are intended to do them hurt and it is a diminution to a government to promote or countenance such well-affected mistakes which are turned upon it with disadvantage whenever they are detected and exposed and naturally the too earnest endeavors to take from men the right they have tempt them by the example to claim that which they have not in power as in most other things the way for princes to keep it is not to grasp more than their arms can well hold the nice and unnecessary inquiring into these things or the licensing some books and suppressing some others without sufficient reason to justify the doing either is so far from being an advantage to a government that it exposes it to the censure of being partial and to the suspicion of having some hidden designs to be carried on by these unusual methods when all is said there is a natural reason of state an undefinable thing grounded upon the common good of mankind which is immortal and in all changes and revolutions still preserveth its original right of saving a nation when the letter of the law perhaps would destroy it and by whatsoever means it moveth carrieth a power with it that admitteth of no opposition being supported by nature which inspireth an immediate consent at some critical times into every individual member to that which visibly tendeth to preservation of the whole and this being so a wise prince instead of controverting the right of this reason of state will by all means endeavour it may be of his side and then he will be secure 
our trimmer cannot conceive that the power of any prince can be lasting but where tis built upon the foundation of his own unborrowed virtue he must not only be the first mover and the fountain from whence the great acts of state originally flow but he must be thought so to his people that they may preserve their veneration for him he must be jealous of his power and not impart so much of it to any about him as that he may suffer an eclipse by it he cannot take too much care to keep himself up for when a prince is thought to be led by those with whom he should onely advise and that the commands he giveth are transmitted through him and are not of his own growth the world will look upon him as a bird adorned with feathers that are not his own or consider him rather as an engine than a living creature besides twould be a contradiction for a prince to fear a commonwealth and at the same time create one himself by delegating such a power to any number of men near him as is inconsistent with the figure of a monarch it is the worst kind of coordination the crown can submit to for it is the exercise of power that draweth the respect along with it and when that is parted with the bare character of a king is not sufficient to keep it up but though it is a diminution to a prince to parcel out so literally his power amongst his favorites it is worse to divide with any other man and to bring himself in competition with a single rival a partner in government is so unnatural a thing that it is a squinty-eyed allegiance that must be paid to such a double-bottom monarchy the two czars of muscovy are an example that the more civilized part of the world will not be prone to follow whatsoever gloss may be put upon this method by those to whom it may be of some use the prince will do well to remember and reflect upon the story of certain men who had set up a statue in honor of the sun yet in a very little time they turned their backs to the sun and their faces to the statue these mystical unions are better placed in the other world than they are in this and we shall have much ado to find that in a monarch god's vicegerency is delegated to more heads than that which is anointed princes may lend some of their light to make another shine but they must still preserve the superiority of being the brighter planet and when it happeneth that the reversion is in men's eyes there is more care necessary to keep up the dignity of possessions that men may not forget who is king either out of their hopes or fears who shall be if the sun should part with all his light to any of the stars the indians would not know where to find their god after he had so deposed himself and would make the light wherever it went the object of their worship all usurpation is alike upon sovereignty it is no matter from what hand it cometh and crowned heads are to be more circumspect in respect men's thoughts are naturally apt to ramble beyond what is present they love to work at a distance and in their greedy expectations which their minds may be filled with of a new master the old one may be left to look a little out of countenance our trimmer owneth a passion for liberty yet so restrained that it doth not in the least impair or taint his allegiance he thinketh it hard for a soul that doth not love liberty ever to raise itself to another world he taketh it to be the foundation of all virtue and the only seasoning that giveth a relish to life and though the laziness of a slavish subjection hath its charms for the more gross and earthly part of mankind yet to men made of a better sort of clay all that the world can give without liberty hath no taste it is true nothing is sold so cheap by unthinking men but that doth no more lessen the real value of it 
than a country fellow's ignorance doth that of a diamond in selling it for a pot of ale liberty is the mistress of mankind she hath powerful charms which do so dazzle us that we find beauties in her which perhaps are not there as we do in other mistresses yet if she was not a beauty the world would not run mad for her therefore since the reasonable desire of it ought not to be restrained and that even the unreasonable desire of it cannot be entirely suppressed those who would take it away from a people possessed of it are likely to fail in the attempting or be very unquiet in the keeping of it our trimmer admireth our blessed constitution in which dominion and liberty are so well reconciled it giveth to the prince the glorious power of commanding freemen and to the subject the satisfaction of seeing the power so lodged as that their liberties are secure it doth not allow the crown such a ruining power as that no grass can grow where e'er it treadeth but a cherishing and protecting power such a one as hath a grim aspect only to the offending subjects but is the joy and the pride of all the good ones their own interest being so bound up in it as to engage them to defend and support it and though in some instances the king is restrained yet nothing in the government can move without him our laws make a distinction between vassalage and obedience between a devouring prerogative and a licentious ungovernable freedom and as of all the orders of building the composite is the best so ours by a happy mixture and a wise choice of what is best in others is brought into a form that is our felicity who live under it and the envy of our neighbor that cannot imitate it the crown hath power sufficient to protect our liberties the people have so much liberty as is necessary to make them useful to the crown our government is in a just proportion no tyranny no unnatural swelling either of power or liberty and whereas in all overgrown monarchies reason learning and inquiry are hanged in effigy for mutineers here they are encouraged and cherished as the surest friends to a government established upon the foundation of law and justice when all is done those who look for perfection in this world may look as the jews have for their messiahs and therefore our trimmer is not so unreasonably partial as to free our government from all objections no doubt there have been fatal instances of its sickness and more than that of its mortality for some time though by a miracle it hath been revived again but till we have another race of mankind in all constitutions that are bounded there will ever be some matter of strife and contention and rather than want pretensions men's passions and interests will raise them from the most inconsiderable causes our government is like our climate there are winds which are sometimes loud and unquiet and yet with all the trouble they give us we owe great part of our health unto them they clear the air which else would be like a standing pool and instead of refreshment would be a disease unto us there may be fresh gales of asserting liberty without turning into such storms of hurricane as that the state should run any hazard of being cast away by them these strugglings which are natural to all mixed governments while they are kept from growing into convulsions do by a mutual agitation from the several parts rather support and strengthen than weaken or maim the constitution and the whole frame instead of being torn or disjointed cometh to be the better and closer knit by being thus exercised but whatever faults our government may have or a discerning critic may find in it when he looketh upon it alone let any other be set against it and then it showeth its comparative beauty 
let us look upon the most glittering outside of unbounded authority and upon a nearer inquiry we shall find nothing but poor and miserable deformity within let us imagine a prince living in his kingdom as if in a great galley his subjects tugging at the oar laden with chains and reduced to real rags that they may gain him imaginary laurels let us represent him gazing among his flatterers and receiving their false worship like a child never contradicted and therefore always cousined or like a lady complimented only to be abused condemned never to hear truth and consequently never to do justice wallowing in the soft bed of wanton and unbridled greatness not less odious to the instruments themselves than to the objects of his tyranny blown up into an ambitious dropsy never to be satisfied by the conquest of other people or by the oppression of his own by aiming to be more than a man he falleth lower than the meanest of them a mistaken creature swelled with panegyrics and flattered out of his senses and not only an encumbrance but a nuisance to mankind a hardened and unrelenting soul and like some creatures that grow fat with poisons he groweth great by other men's miseries an ambitious ape of the divine greatness an unruly giant that would storm even heaven itself but that his scaling ladders are not long enough in short a wild and devouring creature in rich trappings and with all his pride no more than a whip in god's almighty hand to be thrown into the fire when the world hath been sufficiently scourged with it this picture laid in right colors would not invite men to wish for such a government but rather to acknowledge the happiness of our own under which we enjoy all the privilege reasonable men can desire and avoid all the miseries many others are subject to so that our trimmer would keep it with all its faults and doth as little forgive those who give the occasion of breaking it as he doth those that take it our trimmer is a friend to parliaments notwithstanding all their faults and excesses which of late have given such matter of objection to them he thinketh that though they may at some times be troublesome to authority yet they add the greatest strength to it under a wise administration he believeth no government is perfect except a kind of omnipotence reside in it to exercise upon great occasions now this cannot be obtained by force alone upon people let it be never so great there must be their consent too or else a nation moveth only by being driven a sluggish and constrained motion void of that life and vigor which is necessary to produce great things whereas the virtual consent of the whole being included in their representatives and the king giving the sanction to the united sense of the people every act done by such an authority seemeth to be an effect of their choice as well as a part of their duty and they do with an eagerness of which men are incapable whilst under a force execute whatsoever is so enjoined as their own wills better explained by parliament rather than from the terror of incurring the penalty of the law for omitting it and by means of this political omnipotence whatever sap or juice there is in a nation may be to the last drop produced whilst it riseth naturally from the root whereas all power exercised without consent is like the giving wounds and gashes and tapping a tree at unseasonable times for the present occasion which in a very little time must needs destroy it our trimmer believeth that by the advantage of our situation there can hardly any such sudden disease come upon us but that the king may have time enough left to consult with his physicians in parliament pretense indeed may be made but a real necessity so pressing that no delay is to be admitted is hardly to be imagined and it will be neither easy to give an instance of any such thing for the time past or reasonable to presume it will ever happen for the time to come 
but if that strange thing should fall out our trimmer is not so straight-laced as to let a nation die or to be stifled rather than it should be helped by any but the proper officers the cases themselves will bring the remedies along with them and he is not afraid to allow that in order to its preservation there is a hidden power in government which would be lost if it was defined a certain mystery by virtue of which a nation may at some critical times be secured from ruin but then it must be kept as a mystery it is rendered useless when touched by unskilful hands and no government ever had or deserved to have that power which was so unwary as to anticipate their claim to it our trimmer cannot help thinking it had been better if the triennial act had been observed because tis the law and we would not have the crown by such an example teach the nation to break it all irregularity is catching it hath a contagion in it especially in an age so much more inclined to follow ill patterns than good ones he would have had a parliament because tis an essential part of the constitution even without the law it being the only provision in extraordinary cases in which there would be otherwise no remedy and there can be no greater solecism in government than a failure of justice he would have had one because nothing else can unite and heal us all other means are mere shifts and projects houses of cards to be blown down with the least breath and cannot resist the difficulties which are even presumed in things of this kind and he would have had one because it might have done the king good and could not possibly have done him hurt without his consent which in that case is not to be supposed and therefore for him to fear it is so strange and so little to be comprehended that the reasons can never be presumed to grow in our soil or to thrive in it when transplanted from any other country and no doubt there are such irresistible arguments for calling a parliament that though it might be denied to the unmannerly mutinous petitions of men that are malicious and disaffected it will be granted to the soft and obsequious murmurs of his majesty's best subjects and there will be such rhetoric in their silent grief that it will at last prevail against the artifices of those who either out of guilt or interest are afraid to throw themselves upon their country knowing how scurvily they have used it that day of judgment will come though we know neither the day nor the hour and our trimmer would live so as to be prepared for it with full assurance in the meantime that the lamenting voice of a nation cannot long be resisted and that a prince who could so easily forgive his people when they had been in the wrong cannot fail to hear them when they are in the right end of the trimmer's opinion of the laws and government read by john greenman This is section 12 of the complete works of George Saville, first Marquis of Halifax. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Trimmer's Opinion Concerning the Protestant Religion Religion hath such a superiority above other things, and that indispensable influence upon all mankind, that it is as necessary to our living happy in this world as it is to our being saved in the next without it man is an abandoned creature one of the worst beasts nature hath produced and fit only for the society of wolves and bears therefore in all ages it hath been the foundation of government and though false gods have been imposed upon the credulous part of the world yet they were gods still in their opinion and the awe and reverence men had to them and their oracles kept them within bounds towards one another which the laws with all their authority could never have effected without the help of religion the laws would not be able to subdue the perverseness of men's wills 
which are wild beasts and require a double chain to keep them down for this reason tis said that it is not a sufficient ground to make war upon a neighboring state because they are of another religion let it be never so differing yet if they worship nor acknowledge no deity at all they may be invaded as public enemies of mankind because they reject the only thing that can bind them to live well with one another the consideration of religion is so twisted with that of government that it is never to be separated and though the foundations of it ought to be eternal and unchangeable yet the terms and circumstances of discipline are to be suited to the several climates and constitutions so that they may keep men in a willing acquiescence unto them without discomposing the world by nice disputes which can never be of equal moment with the public peace our religion here in england seemeth to be distinguished by a peculiar effect of god almighty's goodness in permitting it to be introduced or rather restored by a more regular method than the circumstances of most other reformed churches would allow them to do in relation to the government and the dignity with which it hath supported itself since and the great men of our church hath produced ought to recommend it to the esteem of all protestants at least our trimmer is very partial to it for these reasons and many more and desireth that it may preserve its due jurisdiction and authority so far he is from wishing it oppressed by the unreasonable and malicious cavils of those who take pains to raise objections against it the questions will then be how and by what methods this church shall best support itself the present circumstances considered in relation to dissenters of all sorts i will first lay this for a ground that as there can be no true religion without charity so there can be no true humane prudence without bearing and condescension this principle doth not extend to oblige the church always to yield to those who are disposed to contest with her the expediency of doing it is to be considered and determined according to the occasion and this leads me to lay open the thoughts of our trimmer in reference first to the protestants and then to the popish recusants what hath lately happened among us maketh an apology necessary for saying anything that looketh like favor towards a sort of men who have brought themselves under such a disadvantage the late conspiracy hath such broad symptoms of the disaffection of the whole party that upon the first reflections while our thoughts are warm it would almost persuade us to put them out of the protection of our good nature and to think that the christian indulgence which our compassion for other men's sufferings cannot easily deny seemeth not only to be forfeited by the ill appearances that are against them but even becometh a crime when it is so misapplied yet for all this upon second and cooler thoughts moderate men will not be so ready to involve a whole party in the guilt of a few and to admit inferences and presumptions to be evidence in a case where the sentence must be so heavy as it ought to be against all those who have a fixed resolution against the government established besides men who act by a principle grounded upon moral virtue can never let it be clearly extinguished by the most repeated provocations if a right thing agreeable to nature and good sense taketh root in the heart of a man that is impartial and unbiased no outward circumstances can ever destroy it it is true the degrees of a man's zeal for the prosecution of it may be differing the faults of other men the considerations of the public and the seasonable prudence by which wise men will ever be directed may give great allays they may lessen and for a time perhaps suppress the exercise of that which in general propositions may be reasonable 
but still whatever is so will inevitably grow and spring up again having a foundation in nature which is never to be destroyed our trimmer therefore endeavoreth to separate the detestation of those who had either a hand or a thought in the late plot from the principle of prudential as well as christian charity towards mankind and for that reason would fain use the means of reclaiming such of the dissenters as are not incurable and even of bearing to a degree those that are as far as may consist with the public interest and security he is far from justifying an affected separation from the communion of the church and even in those that mean well and are mistaken he looketh upon it as a disease that hath seized upon their minds very troublesome as well as dangerous by the consequence it may produce he doth not go about to excuse their making it an indispensable duty to meet in numbers to say their prayers such meetings may prove mischievous to the state at least the laws which are the best judges have determined that there is danger in them he hath good nature enough to lament that the perverseness of a part should have drawn rigorous laws upon the whole body of the dissenters but when they are once made no private opinion must stand in opposition to them if they are in themselves reasonable they are in that respect to be regarded even without being enjoined if by the change of time and circumstances they should become less reasonable than when they were first made even then they are to be obeyed too because they are laws till they are mended or repealed by the same authority that enacted them he hath too much deference to the constitution of our government to wish for more prerogative declarations in favor of scrupulous men or to dispense with penal laws in such manner or to such an end that suspecting men might with some reason pretend that so hated a thing as persecution could never make way for itself with any hopes of success otherwise than by preparing the deluded world by a false prospect of liberty and indulgence the inward springs and wheels whereby the engine moved are now so fully laid open and exposed that it is not supposable that such a baffled experiment should ever be tried again the effect it had at the time and the spirit it raised will not easily be forgotten and it may be presumed the remembrance of it may secure us from any more attempts of that nature for the future we must no more break a law to give men ease than we are to rifle an house with a devout intention of giving the plunder to the poor in this case our compassion would be as ill-directed as our charity in the other in short the veneration due to the laws is never to be thrown off let the pretenses be never so specious yet with all this he cannot bring himself to think that an extraordinary diligence to take the uttermost penalty of laws upon the poor offending neighbor is of itself such an all-sufficient virtue that without anything else to recommend men it should entitle them to all kind of preferments and rewards he would not detract from the merits of those who execute the laws yet he cannot think such a piece of service as this can entirely change the man and either make him a better divine or a more knowing magistrate than he was before especially if it be done with a partial and unequal hand in reverence to greater and more dangerous offenders our trimmer would have those mistaken men ready to throw themselves into the arms of the church and he would have those arms as ready to receive them that shall come to us he would have no supercilious look to fright those strayed sheep from coming into the fold again no ill-natured maxims of an eternal suspicion or a belief that those who have once been in the wrong can never be in the right again but a visible preparation of mind to receive with joy all the proselytes that come amongst us and much greater earnestness to reclaim than punish them it is to be confessed 
there is a great deal to forgive a hard task enough for the charity of a church so provoked but that must not cut off all hopes of being reconciled yet if there must be some anger left still let it break out into a christian revenge and by being kinder to the children of disobedience than they deserve let the injured church triumph by throwing shame and confusion of face upon them there should not always be storms and thunder a clear sky would sometime make the church look more like heaven and would do more towards the reclaiming those wanderers than a perpetual terror which seemeth to have no intermission for there is in many and particularly in english men a mistaken pleasure in resisting the dictates of rigorous authority a stomach that riseth against a hard imposition nay in some even a lust in suffering from a wrong point of honour which doth not want the applause from the greater part of mankind who have not learnt to distinguish constancy will be thought a virtue even where it is a mistake and the ill-judging world will be apt to think that opinion most right which produceth the greatest number of those who are willing to suffer for it all this is prevented and falleth to the ground by using well-timed indulgence and the stubborn adversary who valueth himself upon his resistance whilst he is oppressed yieldeth insensibly to kind methods when they are applied to him and the same man naturally melteth into conformity who perhaps would never have been beaten into it we may be taught by the compassion that attendeth the most criminal men when they are condemned that faults are much more natural things than punishments and that even the most necessary acts of severity do some kind of violence to our nature whose indulgence will not be confined within the straight bounds of inexorable justice so that this should be an argument for gentleness besides that it is the likeliest way to make these men ashamed of their separation whilst the pressing them too hard tendeth rather to make them proud of it our trimmer would have the clergy supported in their lawful rights and in all the power and dignity that belongeth to them and yet he thinketh that possibly there may be in some of them a too great eagerness to extend the ecclesiastical jurisdiction which though it may be well intended yet the straining of it too high hath an appearance of ambition that raiseth men's objections to it and is so far unlike the apostolic zeal which was quite otherwise employed that the world draweth inferences from it which do the church no service he is troubled to see men of all sides sick of a calenture of a mistaken devotion and it seemeth to him that the devout fire of mistaken charity with which the primitive christians were inflamed is long since extinguished and instead of it a devouring fire of anger and persecution breaketh out in the world we wrangle now one with another about religion till the blood cometh whilst the ten commandments have no more authority with us than if they were so many obsolete laws or proclamations out of date he thinketh that a nation will hardly be mended by principles of religion where morality is made a heresy and therefore as he believeth devotion misplaced when it gets into a conventicle he concludeth that loyalty is so too when lodged in a drunken club those virtues deserve a better seat of empire and they are degraded when such men undertake their deference as have too great need of an apology themselves our trimmer wisheth that some knowledge may go along with the zeal on the right side and that those who are in possession of the pulpit would quote at least so often the authority of the scriptures as they do that of the state there are many who borrow too often arguments from the government to use against their adversaries and neglect those that are more proper and would be more powerful a divine groweth less and putteth a diminution on his own character 
when he quoteth any law but that of god almighty to get the better of those who contest with him and as it is a sign of a decayed constitution when nature with good diet cannot expel nauseous humours without calling foreign drugs to her assistance so it looketh like want of health in a church when instead of depending upon the power of that truth which it holdeth and the good examples of them that teach it to support itself and to suppress errors it should have a perpetual recourse to the secular authority and even upon the slightest occasions our trimmer hath his objections to the too busy diligence and to the overdoing of some of the dissenting clergy and he doth as little approve of those of our church who wear god almighty's liveries as some old warders in the tower do the kings who do nothing in their place but receive their wages for it he thinketh that the liberty of the late times gave men so much light and diffused it so universally amongst the people that they are not now to be dealt with as they might have been in ages of less enquiry and therefore though in some well-chosen and dearly beloved auditories good resolute nonsense backed with authority may prevail yet generally men are become so good judges of what they hear that the clergy ought to be very wary how they go about to impose upon their understandings which are grown less humble than they were in former times when the men in black had made learning such a sin in the laity that for fear of offending they made a conscience of being able to read but now the world is grown saucy and expecteth reasons and good ones too before they give up their own opinions to other men's dictates though never so magisterially delivered to them our trimmer is far from approving the hypocrisy which seemeth to be the reigning vice amongst some of the dissenting clergy he thinketh it the most provoking sin men can be guilty of in relation to heaven and yet which may seem strange that very sin which shall destroy the soul of the man who preacheth may help to save those of the company that hear him and even those who are cheated by the false ostentation of his strictness of life may by that pattern be encouraged to the real practice of those christian virtues which he doth so deceitfully profess so that the detestation of this fault may possibly be carried on too far by our own orthodox divines if they think it cannot be enough expressed without bending the stick another way a dangerous method and a worse extreme for men of that character who by going to the outmost line of christian liberty will certainly encourage others to go beyond it no man doth less approve the ill-bred methods of some of the dissenters in rebuking authority who behave themselves as if they thought ill manners necessary to salvation yet he cannot but distinguish and desire a mean between the sauciness of some of the scotch apostles and the undecent courtship of some of the silken divines who one would think do practice to bow at the altar only to learn to make the better legs at court our trimmer approveth the principles of our church that dominion is not founded in grace and that our obedience is to be given to a popish king in other things at the same time that our compliance with him in his religion is to be denied yet he cannot but think it a very extraordinary thing if a protestant church should by a voluntary election choose a papist for their guardian and receive directions for supporting their religion from one who must believe it a mortal sin not to endeavor to destroy it such a refined piece of breeding would not seem to be very well placed in the clergy who will hardly find precedence to justify such an extravagant piece of courtship and which is so unlike the primitive methods which ought to be our pattern he hath no such unreasonable tenderness for any sorts of men as to expect their faults should not be impartially laid open as often as they give occasion for it and yet he cannot but smile to see that the same man who setteth up all the sails of his rhetoric to fall upon the dissenters when popery is to be handled 
he doth it so gingerly that he looketh like an ass mumbling of thistles so afraid he is of letting himself loose where he may be in danger of letting his duty get the better of his discretion our trimmer is far from relishing the impertinent wanderings of those who pour out long prayers upon the congregation and all from their own stock which god knoweth for the most part is a barren soil which produceth weeds instead of flowers and by this means they expose religion itself rather than promote men's devotions on the other side there may be too great restraint to put upon men whom god and nature hath distinguished from their fellow laborers by blessing them with a happier talent and by giving them not only good sense but a powerful utterance too hath enabled them to gush out upon the attentive auditory with a mighty stream of devout and unaffected eloquence when a man so qualified endued with learning too and above all adorned with a good life breaketh out into a warm and well-delivered prayer before his sermon it hath the appearance of a divine rapture he raiseth and leadeth the hearts of the assembly in another manner than the most composed or best studied form of set words can ever do and the prewees who serve up all their sermons with the same garnishing would look like so many statues or men of straw in the pulpit compared with those who speak with such a powerful zeal that men are tempted at the moment to believe heaven itself hath dictated their words to em our trimmer is not so unreasonably indulgent to the dissenters as to excuse the irregularities of their complaints and to approve their threatening styles which are so ill suited to their circumstances as well as to their duty he would have them to show their grief and not their anger to the government and by such a submission to authority as becometh them if they cannot acquiesce in what is imposed let them deserve a legislative remedy to their sufferings there being no other way to give them perfect redress and either to seek it or pretend to give it by any other method would not only be vain but criminal too in those that go about it yet with all this there may in the meantime be a prudential latitude left as to the manner of prosecuting the laws now in force against them the government is in some degree answerable for such an administration of them as may be free from the censure of impartial judges and in order to that it would be necessary that one of these methods be pursued either to let loose the laws to their utmost extent without any moderation or restraint in which at least the equality of the government would be without objection the penalties being exacted without remission from the dissenters of all kinds or if that will not be done and indeed there is no reason it should there is a necessity of some connivance to the protestant dissenters to excuse that which in humanity must be allowed to the papists even without any leaning towards them which must not be supposed in those who are or shall be in the administration of public business and it will follow that according to our circumstances the distribution of such connivance must be made in such a manner that the greatest part of it may fall on the protestant side or else the objections will be so strong and the inferences so clear that the friends as well as the enemies of the crown will be sure to take hold of them it will not be sufficient to say that the papists may be connived at because they are good subjects and that the protestant dissenters must suffer because they are ill ones these general maxims will not convince discerning men neither will any late instances make them forget what passed at other times in the world both sides have had their turns in being good and ill subjects and therefore tis easy to imagine what suspicions would arise in the present conjecture if such a partial argument as this should be imposed upon us the truth is this matter speaks so much of itself that it is not only unnecessary but it may be unmannerly to say any more of it 
our trimmer therefore could wish that since notwithstanding the laws which deny churches to say mass in not only the exercise but also the ostentation of popery is as well or better performed in the chapels of so many foreign ministers where the english openly resort in spite of proclamations and orders of council which are grown to be as harmless things to them as the pope's bulls and excommunications are to heretics who are out of his reach i say he could wish that by a seasonable as well as an equal piece of justice there might be so much consideration had of the protestant dissenters as that there might be at some times and at some places a veil thrown over an innocent and retired conventicle and that such an indulgence might be practised with less prejudice to the church or diminution to the laws it might be done so as to look rather like a kind of omission to inquire more strictly than an allowed toleration of that which is against the rule established such a skilful hand as this is very necessary in our circumstances and the government by making no sort of men entirely desperate doth not only secure itself from villainous attempts but lay such a foundation for healing and uniting laws whenever a parliament shall meet that the seeds of differences and animosities between the several contending sides may heaven consenting be for ever destroyed end of the trimmer's opinion concerning the protestant religion read by john greenman this is section thirteen of the complete works of george savile first marquis of halifax this librivox recording is in the public domain the trimmer's opinion concerning the papists by george savile first marquis of halifax read by john greenman to speak of popery leadeth me into such a sea of matter that it is not easy to forbear launching into it being invited by such a fruitful theme and by a variety never to be exhausted but to confine it to the present subject i will only say a short word of the religion itself of its influences here at this time and of our trimmer's opinion in relation to our manner of living with them if a man would speak maliciously of this religion one may say it is like those diseases where as long as one drop of the infection remaineth there is still danger of having the whole mass of blood corrupted by it in swedland there was an absolute cure and nothing of popery heard of till queen christina whether moved by arguments of this or the other world may not be good manners to inquire thought fit to change her religion and country and to live at rome where she might find better judges of her virtues and less ungentle censures of those princely liberties to which she was sometimes disposed than she left at stockholm where the good breeding is as much inferior to that of rome in general as the civility of the religion the cardinals having rescued the church from those clownish methods the fishermen had first introduced and mended that pattern so effectually that a man of that age if he should now come into the world would not possibly know it in denmark the reformation was entire in some states of germany as well as geneva the cure was universal but in the rest of the world where the protestant religion took place the popish humor was too tough to be totally expelled and so it was in england though the change was made with all the advantage imaginable to the reformation it being countenanced and introduced by legal authority and by that means might have been perhaps as perfect as in any other place if the short reign of edward the sixth and the succession of a popish queen had not given such advantage to that religion that it hath subsided ever since under all the hardships that have been put upon it it hath been a strong compact body and made the more so by these sufferings 
it was not strong enough to prevail but it was able with the help of foreign support to carry on an interest which gave the crown trouble and to make a considerable not to say dangerous figure in the nation so much as this could not have been done without some hopes nor these hopes kept up without some reasonable grounds in queen elizabeth's time the spanish zeal for their religion and the revenge for eighty eight gave warmth to the papists here and above all the right of the queen of scots to succeed was while she lived sufficient to give them a better prospect of their affairs in king james time their hopes were supported by the treaty of the spanish match and his gentleness towards them which they were ready to interpret more in their own favor than was either reasonable or became them so little tenderness they have even where it is most due if the interest of their religion cometh in competition with it as for the late king though he gave the most glorious evidence that ever man did of his being a protestant yet by the more than ordinary influence the queen was thought to have over him and it so happening that the greatest part of his anger was directed against the puritans there was such an advantage to men disposed to suspect that they were ready to interpret it a leaning towards popery without which handle it was morally impossible that the ill-affected part of the nation could ever have seduced the rest into a rebellion that which helped to confirm many well-meaning men in their misapprehensions of the king was the long and unusual intermission of parliaments so that every year that passed without one made up a new argument to increase their suspicion and made them presume that the papists had a principal hand in keeping them off this raised such heats in men's minds to think that men who were obnoxious to the laws instead of being punished should have credit enough to secure themselves even at the price of destroying the fundamental constitution that it broke out into a flame which before it could be quenched had almost reduced the nation to ashes amongst the miserable effects of that unnatural war none hath been more fatal to us than the forcing our princes to breathe in another air and to receive the early impressions of a foreign education the barbarity of the english towards the king and the royal family might very well tempt him to think the better of everything he found abroad and might naturally produce more gentleness at least towards a religion by which he was hospitably received at the same time that he was thrown off and persecuted by the protestants though his own subjects to aggravate the offence the queen mother as generally ladies do with age grew most devout and earnest in her religion and besides the temporal rewards of getting larger subsidies from the french clergy she had motives of another kind to persuade her to show her zeal and since by the roman dispensatory a soul converted to the church is a sovereign remedy and layeth up a mighty stock of merit she was solicitous to secure herself in all events and therefore first set upon the duke of gloucester who depended so much upon her good will that she might for that reason have been induced to believe the conquest would not be difficult but it so fell out that he either from his own constancy or that he had those near him by whom he was otherwise advised chose rather to run away from her importunity than by staying to bear the continual weight of it it is believed she had better success with another of her sons who if he was not quite brought off from our religion at least such beginnings were made as made them very easy to be finished his being of a generous and aspiring nature and in that respect less patient in the drudgery of arguing might probably help to recommend a church to him that exempts the laity from the vexation of inquiring perhaps he might though by mistake look upon that religion as more favorable to the enlarged power of kings a consideration which might have its weight with a young prince in his warm blood and that was brought up in arms 
i cannot hinder myself from a small digression to consider with admiration that the old lady of rome with all her wrinkles should yet have charms able to subdue great princes so far from handsome and yet so imperious so painted and yet so pretending after having abused deposed and murthered so many of her lovers she still findeth others glad and proud of their new claims a thing so strange to indifferent judges that those who will allow no other miracles in the church of rome must needs grant this is one not to be contested she sitteth in her shop and selleth at dear rates her rattles and her hobby-horses whilst the deluded world still continueth to furnish her with customers but whither am i carried with this contemplation it is high time to return to my text and to consider the wonderful manner of the king's coming home again led by the hand of heaven and called by the voice of his own people who received him if possible with joys equal to the blessing of peace and union which his restoration brought along with it by this there was an end put to the hopes some might have abroad of making use of his less happy circumstances to throw him into foreign interests and opinions which had been wholly inconsistent with our religion our laws and all other things that are dear to us yet for all this some of those tinctures and impressions might so far remain as though they were very innocent in him yet they might have ill effects here by softening the animosity which seemeth necessary to the defender of the protestant faith in opposition to such a powerful and irreconcilable an enemy you may be sure that among all the sorts of men who applied themselves to the king at his first coming home for his protection the papists were not the last nor as they fain would have flattered themselves the least welcome having their past sufferings as well as their present professions to recommend them and there was something that looked like a particular consideration of them since it so happened that the indulgence promised to dissenters at breda was carried on in such a manner that the papists were to divide with them and though the parliament notwithstanding its resignation to the crown in all things rejected with scorn and anger a declaration framed for this purpose yet the birth and steps of it gave such an alarm that men's suspicions once raised were not easily laid asleep again to omit other things the breach of the triple league and the dutch war with its appurtenances carried jealousies to the highest pitch imaginable and fed the hopes of one party and the fears of the other to such a degree that some critical revolutions were generally expected when the ill success of that war and the sacrifice france thought fit to make of the papists here to their own interest abroad gave them another check and the act of enjoining the test to all in offices was thought to be no ill bargain to the nation though bought at the price of one million two hundred thousand pound and the money applied to continue the war against the dutch than which nothing could be more unpopular or less approved notwithstanding these discouragements popery is a plant that may be mowed down but the root will still remain and in spite of the laws it will sprout up and grow again especially if it should happen that there should be men in power who in weeding it out of our garden will take care to cherish and keep it alive and though the law for excluding them from places of trust was tolerably kept as to their outward form yet there were many circumstances which being improved by the quick-sighted malice of ill-affected men did help to keep up the world in their suspicions and to blow up jealousies to such a height both in and out of parliament that the remembrance of them is very unpleasant and the example so extravagant that it is to be hoped nothing in our age like it will be reattempted 
but to come closer to the case in question in this condition we stand with the papists what shall now be done according to our trimmer's opinion in order to the better bearing this grievance since as i have said before there is no hopes of being entirely free from it papists we must have among us and if their religion keep them from bringing honey to the hive let the government try at least by gentle means to take away the sting from them the first foundation to be laid is that a distinct consideration is to be had of the popish clergy who have such an eternal interest against all accommodation that it is a hopeless thing to propose anything to them less than all their stomachs have been set for it ever since the reformation they have pinned themselves to a principle that admits no mean they believe protestants will be damned and therefore by an extraordinary effect of christian charity they would destroy one half of england that the other might be saved then for this world they must be in possession for god almighty to receive his rents for him not to a compt till the day of judgment which is a good kind of tenure and ye cannot well blame the good men that will stir up the laity to run any hazard in order to the getting them restored what is it to the priest if the deluded zealot undoeth himself in the attempt he singeth masses as jollily and with as good a voice at rome or st omer's as ever he did is a single man and can have no wants but such as may be easily supplied yet that he may not seem altogether insensible or ungrateful to those that are his martyrs he is ready to assure their executors and if they please will procure a grant sub annulo piscatoris that the good man by being hanged hath got a good bargain and saved the singeing of some hundred of years which he would else have had in purgatory there's no cure for this order of men no expedient to be proposed so that though the utmost severity of the laws against them may in some sort be mitigated yet no treaty can be made with men who in this case have left themselves no free will but are so muffled by zeal tied by vows and kept up by such unchangeable maxims of the priesthood that they are to be left as desperate patients and looked upon as men that will continue in an eternal state of hostility till the nation is entirely subdued to them it is then only the lay papists that are capable of being treated with and we are to examine of what temper they are and what arguments are the most likely to prevail upon them and how far tis advisable for the government to be indulgent to them the lay papists generally keep their religion rather because they will not break company with those of their party than out of any settled zeal that hath roots in them most of them do by the mediation of the priests marry amongst one another to keep up an ignorant position by hearing only one side others by a mistake look upon it as they do upon escutcheons the more ancient religion of the two and as some men of a good pedigree will despise meaner men though never so much superior to them by nature so these undervalue reformation as an upstart and think there is more honor in supporting an old error than in embracing what seemeth to them to be a new truth the laws have made them men of pleasure by excluding them from public business and it happeneth well they are so since they will the more easily be persuaded by arguments of ease and conveniency to them they have not put off the man in general nor the englishman in particular those who in the late storm against them went into other countries though they had all the advantage that might recommend them to a good reception yet in a little time they chose to steal over again and live here with hazard rather than abroad with security there is a smell in our native earth better than all the perfumes in the east there is something in a mother though never so angry that the children will more naturally trust her 
than the studied civilities of strangers let them be never so hospitable therefore tis not advisable nor agreeing with the rules of governing prudence to provoke men by hardships to forget that nature which else is sure to be of our side when these men by fair usage are put again into their right senses they will have quite differing reflections from those which rigor and persecution had raised in them a lay papist will first consider his abbey lands which notwithstanding whatever hath or can be alleged must sink considerably in the value the moment that popery prevails and it being a disputable matter whether zeal might not in a little time get the better of the law in that case a considering man will admit that as an argument to persuade him to be content with things as they are rather than run this or any other hazard by change in which perhaps he may have no other advantage than that his now humble confessor may be raised to a bishopric and from thence look down superciliously upon his patron or which is worse run to take possession for god almighty of his abbey in such a manner as the usurping landlord as he will then be called shall hardly be admitted to be so much as a tenant to his own lands lest his title should prejudge that of the church which will then be the landlord he will think what disadvantage tis to be looked upon as a separate creature depending upon a foreign interest and authority and for that reason exposed to the jealousy and suspicion of his countrymen he will reflect what an encumbrance it is to have his house a pasture for hungry priests to graze in which have such a never-failing influence upon the foolish which is the greatest part of every man's family that a man's dominion even over his own children is mangled and divided if not totally undermined by them than to be subject to what arbitrary taxes the popish convocation shall impose upon him for the carrying on the common interest of that religion under penalty of being marked out for half an heretic by the rest of the party to have no share in business no opportunity of showing his own value to the world to live at the best an useless and by others to be thought a dangerous member of the nation where he is born is a burthen to a generous mind that cannot be taken off by all the pleasure of a lazy unmanly life or by the nauseous enjoyment of a dull plenty that produceth no food for the mind which will be considered in the first place by a man that hath a soul when he shall think that if his religion after his wading through a sea of blood come at last to prevail it would infinitely lessen if not entirely destroy the glory riches strength and liberty of his own country and what a sacrifice is this to make to rome where they are wise enough to wonder there should be such fools in the world as to venture struggle and contend nay even die martyrs for that which should it succeed would prove a judgment instead of a blessing to them he will conclude that the advantages of throwing some of their children back again to god almighty when they have too many of them are not equal to the inconveniences they may either feel or fear by continuing their separation from the religion established temporal things will have their weight in the world and though zeal may prevail for a time and get the better in a skirmish yet the war endeth generally on the side of flesh and blood and will do so till mankind is another thing than it is at present and therefore a wise papist in cold blood considering these and many other circumstances which twill be worth his pains to see if he can unmuffle himself from the mask of infallibility will think it reasonable to set his imprisoned senses at liberty and that he hath a right to see with his own eyes hear with his own ears and judge by his own reason the consequences of which might probably be that weighing things in a right scale and seeing them in their true colors he would distinguish between the merit of suffering for a good cause 
and the foolish ostentation of drawing inconveniences upon himself and therefore will not be unwilling to be convinced that our protestant creed may make him happy in the other world and the easier in this a few of such wise proselytes would by their example draw so many after them that the party would insensibly melt away and in a little time without any angry word we should come to a union that all good men would have reason to rejoice at but we are not to presume upon these conversions without preparing men for them by kind and reconciling arguments nothing is so against our nature as to believe those can be in the right who are too hard upon us there is a deformity in everything that doth us hurt and it will look scurvily in our eye while the smart continueth and a man must have an extraordinary measure of grace to think well of a religion that reduceth him and his family to misery in this respect our trimmer would consent to the mitigation of such laws as were made as it is said king henry the eighth got queen elizabeth in a heat against rome it may be said that even states as well as private men are subject to passion a just indignation of a villainous attempt produceth at the same time such remedies as perhaps are not without some mixture of revenge and therefore though time cannot repeal a law it may by a natural effect soften the execution of it there is less danger to rouse a lion when at rest than to awake laws that were intended to have their times of sleeping nay more than that in some cases their natural periods of life dying of themselves without the solemnity of being revoked any otherwise than by the common consent of mankind who do cease to execute when the reasons in great measure fail that first created and justified the rigor of such unusual penalties our trimmer is not eager to pick out some places in history against this or any other party quite contrary it is very solicitous to find out anything that may be healing and tend to an agreement but to prescribe the means of this gentleness so as to make it effectual must come from the only place that can furnish remedies for this cure viz a parliament in the meantime it is to be wished there may be such a mutual calmness of mind as that the protestants might not be so jealous as still to smell the match that was to blow up the king and both houses in the gunpowder treason or to start at every appearance of popery as if it were just taking possession on the other side let not the papists suffer themselves to be led by any hopes though never so flattering to a confidence or ostentation which must provoke men to be less kind to them let them use modesty on their sides and the protestants indulgence on theirs and by this means there would be an overlooking of all venial faults a tacit connivance at all things that do not carry scandal with them and would amount to a kind of natural dispensation with the severe laws since there would be no more accusers to be found when the occasions of anger and animosity are once removed let the papists in the meantime remember that there is a respect due from all the lesser numbers to greater a deference to be paid by an opinion that is exploded to one that is established such a thought well digested will have an influence upon their behavior and produce such a temper as must win the most eager adversaries out of their ill humor to them and give them a title to all the favor that may be consistent with the public peace and security end of the trimmer's opinion concerning the papists read by john greenman this is section fourteen of the complete works of george saville first marquis of halifax this librivox recording is in the public domain the trimmer's opinion in relation to things abroad read by john greenman the world is so composed that it is hard if not impossible for a nation not to be a great deal involved in the fate of their neighbors 
and though by the felicity of our situation we are more independent than any other people yet we have in all ages been concerned for our own sakes in the revolutions abroad there was a time when england was the overbalancing power of christendom and that either by inheritance or conquest the better part of france received laws from us after that we being reduced into our own limits france and spain became the rivals for the universal monarchy and our third power though in itself less than either of the other happened to be superior to any of them by that choice we had of throwing the scales on that side to which we gave our friendship i do not know whether this figure did not make us as great as our former conquest to be a perpetual umpire of two great contending powers who gave us all their courtship and offered all their incense at our altar whilst the fate of either prince seemed to depend upon the oracles we delivered for the king of england to sit on his throne as in the supreme court of justice to which the two great monarchs appeal pleading their cause and expecting their sentence declaring which side was in the right or at least if we pleased which side should have the better of it was a piece of greatness which was peculiar to us and no wonder if we endeavored to preserve it as we did for a considerable time it being our safety as well as glory to maintain it but by a fatality upon our counsels or by the refined policy of this latter age we have thought fit to use industry to destroy this mighty power which we have so long enjoyed and that equality between the two monarchs which we might for ever have preserved hath been chiefly broken by us whose interest it was above all others to maintain it when one of them like the overflowing of the sea had gained more upon the other than our convenience or indeed our safety would allow instead of mending the banks or making new ones we ourselves with our own hands helped to cut them to invite and make way for a farther inundation france and spain have had their several turns in making use of our mistakes and we have been formerly as deaf to the instances of the then weaker part of the world to help them against the house of austria as we can now be to the earnestness of spain that we would assist them against the power of france gondomar was as saucy and as powerful too in king james his court as any french ambassador can have been at any time since men talked as wrong then on the spanish side and made their court by it as well as any can have done since by talking as much for the french so that from that time instead of weighing in a wise balance the power of either crown it looketh as if we had learned only to weigh the pensions and take the heaviest it would be tedious as well as unwelcome to recapitulate all wrong steps so that i will go no farther than the king's restoration at which time the balance was on the side of france and that by the means of cromwell who for a separate interest of his own had sacrificed that of the nation by joining with the stronger side to suppress the power of spain which he ought to have supported such a method was natural enough to an usurper and showed he was not the lawful father of the people by his having so little care of them and the example coming from that hand one would think should for that reason be less likely to be followed but to go on home cometh the king followed with courtships from all nations abroad of which some did it not only to make them forget how familiarly they had used him when he was in other circumstances but to bespeak the friendship of a prince who besides his other greatness was yet more considerable by being re-established by the love of his people france had an interest either to dispose us to so much good will or at least to put us into such a condition that we might give no opposition to their designs and flanders being a perpetual object in their eye a lasting beauty for which they have an incurable passion and not being kind enough to consent to them 
they meditated to commit a rape upon her which they thought would not be easy to do while england and holland were agreed to rescue her whenever they should hear her cry out for help to them to this end they put in practice seasonable and artificial whispers to widen things between us and the states and boyna and the fishery must be talked of here the freedom of the seas and the preservation of trade must be insinuated there and there being combustible matter on both sides in a little time it took fire which gave those that kindled it sufficient cause to smile and hug themselves to see us both fall into the net they had laid for us and it is observable and of good example to us if we will take it that their design being to set us together at cuffs to weaken us they kept themselves lookers-on till our victories began to break the balance then the king of france like a wise prince was resolved to support the beaten side and would no more let the power of the sea than we ought to suffer the monarchy of europe to fall into one hand in pursuance to this he took part with the dutch and in a little time made himself umpire the peace between us some time after upon pretence of his queen's title to part of flanders by right of devolution he falleth into it with a mighty force for which the spaniard was so little prepared that he made a very swift progress and had such a torrent of undisputed victory that england and holland though the wounds they had given one another were yet green being struck with the apprehension of so near a danger to them thought it necessary for their own defence to make up a sudden league into which sweden was taken to interpose for a peace between the two crowns this had so good an effect that france was stopped in its career and the peace of aix-la-chapelle was a little after concluded twas a forced put and though france wisely dissembled their inward dissatisfaction yet from that very moment they resolved to untie the triple knot whatever it cost them for his christian majesty after his conquering meals ever riseth with a stomach and he liked the pattern so well that it gave him a longing desire to have the whole piece amongst the other means used for the attaining this end the sending over the duchess of orleans was not the least powerful she was a very welcome guest here and her own charms and dexterity joined with other advantages that might help her persuasions gave her such an ascendant that she should hardly fail of success one of the preliminaries of her treaty though a trivial thing in itself yet was considerable in the consequence as very small circumstances often are in relation to the government of the world about this time a general humor in opposition to france had made us throw off their fashion and put on vests that we might look more like a distinct people and not be under the servility of imitation which ever payeth a greater deference to the original than is consistent with the equality all independent nations should pretend to france did not like this small beginning of ill humors at least of emulation and wisely considering that it is a natural introduction first to make the world their apes that they may be afterwards their slaves it was thought that one of the instructions madame brought along with her was to laugh us out of these vests which she performed so effectually that in a moment like so many footmen who had quitted their master's livery we all took it again and returned to our old service so that the very time of doing it gave a very critical advantage to france since it looked like an evidence of our returning to their interest as well as to their fashion and would give such a distrust of us to our new allies that it might facilitate the dissolution of the knot which tied them so within their bounds that they were very impatient till they were freed from the restraint but the lady had a more extended commission than this and without doubt laid the foundation of a new strict alliance quite contrary to the other in which we had been so lately engaged 
and of this there were such early appearances that the world began to look upon us as falling into apostasy from the common interest notwithstanding all this france did not neglect at the same time to give good words to the dutch and even to feed them with hopes of supporting them against us when on a sudden that never to be forgotten declaration of war against them cometh out only to vindicate his own glory and to revenge the injuries done to his brother in england by which he became our second in this duel so humble can this prince be when at the same time he doth us more honour than we deserve he layeth a greater share of the blame upon our shoulders than did naturally belong to us the particulars of that war our part in it while we stayed in it and when we were out of breath our leaving the french to make an end of it are things too well known to make it necessary and too unwelcome in themselves to incite me to repeat them only the wisdom of france is in this to be observed that when we had made a separate peace which left them single to oppose the united force of the confederates they were so far from being angry that they would not show so much as the least coldness hoping to get as much by our mediation for a peace as they would have expected from our assistance in the war our circumstances at that time considered this seasonable piece of indulgence in not reproaching us but rather allowing those necessities of state which we gave for our excuse was such an engaging method that it went a great way to keep us still in their chains when to the eye of the world we had absolutely broke loose from them and by what passed afterwards at nijmegen though the king's neutrality gave him the outward figure of a mediator it appeared that his interposition was extremely suspected of partiality by the confederates who upon that ground did both at and before the conclusion of that treaty treat his ministers there with a great deal of neglect in this piece as well as in that of the pyrenean and the aix la chapelle the king of france at the moment of making it had the thought of breaking it for a very little time after he broached his pretensions upon a lost which were things that if they had been offered by a less formidable hand would have been smiled at but ill arguments being seconded by good armies carry such a power with them that naked sense is a very unequal adversary it was thought that these airy claims were chiefly raised with the prospect of getting luxembourg for the equivalent and this opinion was confirmed by the blocking it up afterwards pretending to the country of shime that it might be entirely surrounded by the french dominions and it was so pressed that it might have fallen in a little time if the king of france had not sent orders to his troops to retire and his christian generosity which was assigned for the reason of it made the world smile since it is seen how differently his devout zeal worketh in hungary that specious reason was in many respects ill-timed and france itself gave it so faintly that at the very time it looked out of countenance the true ground of his retiring is worth our observation for at the instance of the confederates offices were done and memorials given but all ineffectual till the word parliament was put into them that powerful word had such an effect that even at that distance it raised the siege which may convince us of what efficacy the king of england's words are when he will give them their full weight and threaten with his parliament it is then that he appeareth that great figure we ought to represent him in our minds the nation his body he the head and joined with that harmony that every word he pronounceth is the word of a kingdom such words as appeareth by this example are as effectual as fleets and armies because they can create them and without this his words sound abroad like a faint whisper that is either not heard or which is worse not minded but though france had made this step of forced compliance it did not mean to leave off the pursuit of their pretensions and therefore immediately proposed the arbitration to the king 
but it appeared that notwithstanding his merit towards the confederates in saving luxembourg the remembrances of what had passed before had left such an ill taste in their mouths that they could not relish our being put into a condition to dispose of their interests and therefore declined it by insisting upon a general treaty to which france had ever since continued to be averse our great earnestness also to persuade the confederates to consent to it was so unusual and so suspicious a method that it might naturally make them believe that france spake to them by our mouth and for that reason if there had been no other might hinder the accepting it and so little care hath been taken to cure this or other jealousies the confederates may have entertained that quite contrary their ministers here every day take fresh alarms from what they observe in small as well as in greater circumstances and they being apt both to take and improve apprehensions of this kind draw such inferences from them as make them entirely despair of us thus we now stand far from being innocent spectators of our neighbor's ruin and by a fatal mistake forgetting what a certain forerunner it is to our own and now it is time our trimmer should tell something of his opinion upon this present state of things abroad he first professeth to have no bias either for or against france and that his thoughts are wholly directed by the interest of his own country he alloweth and hath read that spain used the same methods when it was in its height as france doth now and therefore it is not partiality that moveth him but the just fear which all reasonable men must be possessed with of an overgrowing power ambition is a devouring beast when it hath swallowed one province instead of being cloyed it hath so much of the greater stomach to another and being fed becometh still the more hungry so that for the confederates to expect a security from any thing but their own united strength is a most miserable fallacy and if they cannot resist the encroachments of france by their arms it is in vain for them to dream of any other means of preservation it would have the better grace besides the saving so much blood and ruin to give up all at once make a present of themselves to appease this haughty monarch rather than be whispered flattered or cozened out of their liberty nothing is so soft as the first applications of a greater prince to engage a weaker but that smiling countenance is but a vizard it is not the true face for as soon as their turn is served the courtship flies to some other prince or state where the same part is to be acted over again leaveth the old mistaken friend to neglect and contempt and like an insolent lover to a cast-off mistress reproaches her with that infamy of which he himself was the author sweden bavaria palatine etc may by their fresh examples teach other princes what they are reasonably to expect and what snakes are hid under the flowers the court of france so liberally throweth upon them whilst they can be useful the various methods and deep intrigues with the differing notes in several countries do not only give suspicion but assurance that everything is put in practice by which universal monarchy may be obtained who can reconcile the withdrawing of his troops from luxembourg in consideration of the war in hungary which was not then declared and presently after encouraging the turk to take vienna and consequently to destroy the empire or who would think that the persecution of the poor protestants of france will be accepted by god as an atonement for hazarding the loss of the whole christian faith can he be thought in earnest when he seemed to be afraid of the spaniards and for that reason must have luxembourg and that he cannot be safe from germany unless he is in possession of strasbourg all injustice and violence must in itself be grievous but the aggravation of supporting him by false arguments and insulting reasons has something in it yet more provoking than the injuries themselves 
and the world hath ground enough to apprehend from such a method of arguing that even their senses are to be subdued as well as their liberties then the variety of arguments used by france in several countries is very observable in england and denmark nothing insisted on but the greatness and authority of the crown on the other side the great men in poland are commended who differ in opinion with the king and they argue like friends to the privilege of the diet against the separate power of the crown in sweden they are troubled that the king should have changed something there of late by his single authority from the ancient and settled authority and constitutions at Ratisbon, the most christian majesty taketh the liberties of all the electors and free states into his protection and telleth them the emperor is a dangerous man an aspiring hero that would infallibly devour them if he was not at hand to resist him on their behalf but above all in holland he hath the most obliging tenderness for the commonwealth and is in such disquiets lest it should be invaded by the prince of orange that they can do no less in gratitude than undo themselves when he bids them to show how sensible they are of his excessive good nature yet in spite of all these contradictions there are in the world such refined statesmen as will upon their credit affirm the following paradoxes to be real truth first that france alone is sincere and keepeth its faith and consequently that it is the only friend we can rely upon that the king of france of all men living hath the least mind to be a conqueror that he is a sleepy tame creature void of all ambition a poor kind of a man that hath no farther thoughts than to be quiet that he is charmed by his friendship to us that it is impossible he should ever do us hurt and therefore though flanders was lost it would not in the least concern us that he would fain help the crown of england to be absolute which would be to take pains to put it into a condition to oppose him as it is and must be our interest as long as he continueth in such an overbalancing power and greatness such a creed as this if once received might prepare our belief for greater things and as he that taught men to eat a dagger began first with a penknife so if we can be prevailed with to digest the smaller mistakes we may at last make our stomach strong enough for that of transubstantiation our trimmer cannot easily be converted out of his senses by these state sophisters and yet he hath no such peevish obstinacy as to reject all correspondence with france because we ought to be apprehensive of the too great power of it he would not have the king's friendship to the confederates extended to the involving him in any unreasonable or dangerous engagements neither would he have him lay aside the consideration of his better establishment at home out of his excessive zeal to secure his allies abroad but sure there might be a mean between these two opposite extremes and it may be wished that our friendship with france should at least be so bounded that it may consist with the humour as well as the interest of england there is no woman but hath her fears of contracting too near an intimacy with a much greater beauty because it exposeth her too often to a comparison that is not advantageous to her and sure it may become a prince to be as jealous of his dignity as a lady can be of her good looks and to be as much out of countenance to be thought an humble companion to so much a greater power to be always seen in an ill light to be so darkened by the brightness of a greater star is somewhat mortifying and when england might ride admiral at the head of the confederates to look like the kitching yacht to the grand louis is but a scurvy figure for us to make in the map of christendom it would rise upon our trimmer's stomach if ever which god forbid the power of calling and intermitting parliaments here should be transferred to the crown of france 
and that all the opportunities of our own settlements at home should give way to their projects abroad and that our interests should be so far sacrificed to our compliance that all the omnipotence of france can never make us full amends for it in the meantime he shrinketh at the dismal prospect he can by no means drive away from his thoughts that when france hath gathered all the fruit arising from our mistakes and that we can bear no more with them they will cut down the tree and throw it into the fire all this while some superfine statesmen to comfort us would fain persuade the world that this or that accident may save us and for all that is or ought to be dear to us would have us to rely wholly upon chance not considering that fortune is wisdom's creature and that god almighty loves to be on the wisest as well as the strongest side therefore this is such a miserable shift such a shameful evasion that they would be laughed to death for it if the ruining consequence of this mistake did not more dispose men to rage and a detestation of it our trimmer is far from idolatry in other things in one thing only he cometh near it his country is in some degree his idol he doth not worship the sun because tis not peculiar to us it rambles about the world and is less kind to us than others but for the earth of england though perhaps inferior to that of many places abroad to him there is divinity in it and he would rather die than see a spire of english grass trampled down by a foreign trespasser he thinketh there are a great many of his mind for all plants are apt to taste of the soil in which they grow and we that grow here have a root that produceth in us a stalk of english juice which is not to be changed by grafting or foreign infusion and i do not know whether anything less will prevail than the modern experiment by which the blood of one creature is transmitted into another according to which before the french blood can be let into our bodies every drop of our own must be drawn out of them our trimmer cannot but lament that by a sacrifice too great for one nation to make to another we should be like a rich mine made useless only for want of being wrought and that the life and vigor which should move us against our enemies is miserably applied to tear our own bowels that being made by our happy situation not only safer but if we please greater too than other countries which far exceed us in extent that having courage by nature learning by industry and riches by trade we should corrupt all these advantages so as to make them insignificant and by a fatality which seemeth peculiar to us misplace our active rage one against another whilst we are turned into statues on that side where lieth our greatest danger to be unconcerned not only at our neighbor's ruin but our own and let our island lie like a great hulk in the sea without rudder or sail all the men cast away in her or as if we were all children in a great cradle and rocked asleep to a foreign tune i say when our trimmer representeth to his mind our roses blasted and discolored whilst the lilies triumph and grow insolent upon the comparison when he considereth our own once flourishing laurel now withered and dying and nothing left us but a remembrance of a better part in history than we shall make in the next age which will be no more to us than an escutcheon hung upon our door when we are dead when he foreseeth from hence growing infamy from abroad confusion at home and all this without the possibility of a cure in respect of the voluntary fetters good men put upon themselves by their allegiance without a good measure of preventing grace he would be tempted to go out of the world like a roman philosopher rather than endure the burden of life under such a discouraging prospect 
but mistakes as all other things have their periods and many times the nearest way to cure is not to oppose them but stay till they are crushed with their own weight for nature will not allow anything to continue long that is violent violence is a wound and as a wound must be curable in a little time or else tis mortal but a nation comes near to be immortal therefore the wound will one time or another be cured though perhaps by such rough methods if too long forborne as may even make the best remedies we can prepare to be at the same time a melancholy contemplation to us there is but one thing god almighty's providence excepted to support a man from sinking under these afflicting thoughts and that is the hopes we draw singly from the king himself without the mixture of any other consideration though the nation was lavish of their kindness to him at his first coming yet there remaineth still a stock of warmth in men's hearts for him besides the good influences of his happy planet are not yet all spent and though the stars of men past their youth are generally declining and have less force like the eyes of decaying beauties yet by a blessing peculiar to himself we may yet hope to be saved by his autumnal fortune he hath something about him that will draw down a healing miracle for his and our deliverance a prince which seemeth fitted for such an offending age in which men's crimes have been so general that the not forgiving his people had been the destroying of them whose gentleness giveth him a natural dominion that hath no bounds with such a noble mixture of greatness and condescension an engaging look that disarmeth men of their ill humors and their resentments something in him that wanteth a name and can be no more defined than it can be resisted a gift of heaven of its lasting finishing where it will be peculiarly kind the only prince in the world that dares be familiar or that hath right to triumph over those forms which were first invented to give awe to those who could not judge and to hide defects from those that could a prince that hath exhausted himself by his liberality and endangered himself by his mercy who outshineth by his own light and natural virtues all the varnish of studied acquisitions his faults are like shades to a good picture or like allay to gold to make it the more useful he may have some but for any man to see them through so many reconciling virtues is a sacrilegious piece of ill-nature of which no generous mind can be guilty a prince that deserveth to be loved for his own sake even without the help of a comparison our love our duty and our danger all join to cement our obedience to him in short whatever he can do it is no more possible for us to be angry with him than with the bank that secureth us from the raging sea the kind shade that hideth us from the scorching sun the welcome hand that reacheth us a reprieve or with the guardian angel that rescueth our souls from the devouring jaws of wretched eternity end of the trimmer's opinion in relation to things abroad read by john greenman This is section 15 of the complete works of George Saville, first Marquis of Halifax, read by John Greenman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Character of a Trimmer. Conclusion. Read by John Greenman. To conclude, our trimmer is so fully satisfied of the truth of those principles by which he is directed in reference to the public, that he will neither be bald, threatened, laughed nor drunk out of them and instead of being converted by the arguments of his adversaries to their opinions he is very much confirmed in his own by them he professeth solemnly 
that were it in his power to choose he would rather have his ambition bounded by the commands of a great and wise master than let it range with a popular license though crowned with success yet he cannot commit such a sin against the glorious thing called liberty nor let his soul stoop so much below itself as to be content without repining to have his reason wholly subdued or the privilege of acting like a sensible creature torn from him by the imperious dictates of unlimited authority in what hand soever it happens to be placed what is there in this that is so criminal as to deserve the penalty of that most singular apothegm a trimmer is worse than a rebel what do angry men ail to rail so against moderation doth it not look as if they were going to some very scurvy extreme that is too strong to be digested by the more considering part of mankind these arbitrary methods besides the injustice of them are god be thanked very unskilful too for they fright the birds by talking so loud from coming into the nets that are laid for them and when men agree to rifle a house they seldom give warning or blow a trumpet but there are some small statesmen who are so full charged with their own expectations that they cannot contain and kind heaven by sending such a seasonable curse upon their undertakings hath made their ignorance an antidote against their malice some of these cannot treat peaceably yielding will not satisfy them they will have men by storm there are others that must have plots to make their service more necessary and have an interest to keep them alive since they are to live upon them and persuade the king to retrench his own greatness so as to shrink into the head of a party which is the betraying him into such an unprincely mistake and to such a wilful diminution of himself that they are the last enemies he ought to allow himself to forgive such men if they could would prevail with the sun to shine only upon them and their friends and to leave all the rest of the world in the dark this is a very unusual monopoly and may come within the equity of the law which maketh it treason to imprison the king when such unfitting bounds are put to his favor and he confined to the narrow limits of a particular set of men that would enclose him these honest and only loyal gentlemen if they may be allowed to bear witness for themselves make a king their engine and degrade him into a property at the very time that their flattery would make him believe they paid divine worship to him besides these there is a flying squadron on both sides that are afraid the world should agree small dabblers in conjuring that raise angry apparitions to keep men from being reconciled like wasps that fly up and down buzz and sting to keep men unquiet but these insects are commonly short-lived creatures and no doubt in a little time mankind will be rid of them they were giants at least who fought once against heaven but for such pygmies as these to contend against it is such a provoking folly that the insolent bunglers ought to be laughed and hissed out of the world for it they should consider there is a soul in that great body of the people which may for a time be drowsy and unactive but when the leviathan is roused it moveth like an angry creature and will neither be convinced nor resisted the people can never agree to show their united powers till they are extremely tempted and provoked to it so that to apply cupping glasses to a great beast naturally disposed to sleep and to force the tame thing whether it will or no to be valiant must be learnt out of some other book than machiavel who would never have prescribed such a preposterous method it is to be remembered that if princes have law and authority on their sides the people on theirs may have nature which is a formidable adversary duty justice religion nay even 
humane prudence too biddeth the people suffer anything rather than resist but uncorrected nature where e'er it feels the smart will run to the nearest remedy men's passions in this case are to be considered as well as their duty let it be never so strongly enforced for if their passions are provoked they being as much a part of us as our limbs they lead men into a short way of arguing that admitteth no distinction and from the foundation of self-defence they will draw inferences that will have miserable effects upon the quiet of a government our trimmer therefore dreads a general discontent because he thinketh it differeth from a rebellion only as a spotted fever doth from the plague the same species under a lower degree of malignity it worketh several ways sometimes like a slow poison that hath its effects at a great distance from the time it was given sometimes like dry flax prepared to catch at the first fire or like seed in the ground ready to sprout upon the first shower in every shape tis fatal and our trimmer thinketh no pains or precaution can be so great as to prevent it in short he thinketh himself in the right grounding his opinion upon that truth which equally hateth to be under the oppressions of wrangling sophistry of the one hand or the short dictates of mistaken authority on the other our trimmer adoreth the goddess truth though in all ages she hath been scurvily used as well as those that worshipped her tis of late become such a ruining virtue that mankind seemeth to be agreed to commend and avoid it yet the want of practice which repealeth the other laws hath no influence upon the law of truth because it hath root in heaven and an intrinsic value in itself that can never be impaired she showeth her greatness in this that her enemies even when they are successful are ashamed to own it nothing but powerful truth hath the prerogative of triumphing not only after victories but in spite of them and to put conquest herself out of countenance she may be kept under and suppressed but her dignity still remaineth with her even when she is in chains falsehood with all her impudence hath not enough to speak ill of her before her face such majesty she carrieth about her that her most prosperous enemies are fain to whisper their treason all the power upon earth can never extinguish her she hath lived in all ages and let the mistaken zeal of prevailing authority christen any opposition to it with what name they please she maketh it not only an ugly and unmannerly but a dangerous thing to persist she hath lived very retired indeed nay sometime so buried that only some few of the discerning part of mankind could have a glimpse of her with all that she hath eternity in her she knoweth not how to die and from the darkest clouds that shade and cover her she breaketh from time to time with triumph for her friends and terror to her enemies our trimmer therefore inspired by this divine virtue thinketh fit to conclude with these assertions that our climate is a trimmer between that part of the world where men are roasted and the other where they are frozen that our church is a trimmer between the frenzy of platonic visions and the lethargic ignorance of popish dreams that our laws are trimmers between the excess of unbounded power and the extravagance of liberty not enough restrained that true virtue hath ever been thought a trimmer and to have its dwelling in the middle between the two extremes that even god almighty himself is divided between his two great attributes his mercy and his justice in such company our trimmer is not ashamed of his name and willingly leaveth to the bold champions of either extreme the honor of contending with no less adversaries than nature religion liberty prudence humanity and common sense end of 
the conclusion of the character of a trimmer read by john greenman this is section sixteen of the complete works of george savile the anatomy of an equivalent this librivox recording is in the public domain the complete works of george savile first marquis of halifax the anatomy of an equivalent read by john greenman one the world hath of late years never been without some extraordinary word to furnish the coffee-houses and fill the pamphlets sometimes it is a new one invented and sometimes an old one revived they are usually fitted to some present purpose with intentions as differing as the various designs several parties may have either to delude the people or to expose their adversaries they are not of long continuance but after they have passed a little while and that they are grown nauseous by being so often repeated they give place to something that is newer thus after whig tory and trimmer have had their time now they are dead and forgotten being supplanted by the word equivalent which reigneth in their stead the birth of it is in short this after many repeated essays to dispose men to the repeal of oaths and tests made for the security of the protestant religion the general aversion to comply in it was found to be so great that it was thought advisable to try another manner of attempting it and to see whether by putting the same thing into another mould and softening an harsh proposition by a plausible term they might not have better success to this end instead of an absolute quitting of these laws without any condition which was the first proposal now it is put into general language and runneth thus if you will take away the oaths and tests you shall have as good a thing for them this put into the fashionable word is now called an equivalent two so much to the word itself i will now endeavor in short to examine and explain in order to the having it fully understood first what is the nature of a true equivalent and in the next place what things are not to be admitted under that denomination i shall treat these as general propositions and though i cannot undertake how far they may be convincing i may safely do it that they are impartial of which there can be no greater evidence than that i make neither inference nor application but leave that part entirely to the reader according as his own thoughts shall direct and dispose him three i will first take notice that this word by the application which hath been made of it in some modern instances lieth under some disadvantage not to say some scandal it is transmitted hither from france and if as in most other things that we take from them we carry them beyond the pattern it should prove so in this we should get into a more partial style than the principles of english justice will i hope ever allow us to be guilty of the french king's equivalents in flanders are very extraordinary bargains his manner of proposing and obtaining them is very differing from the usual methods of equal dealing in a later instance denmark by the encouragement as well as by the example of france hath proposed things to the duke of holstein which are called equivalents but that they are so the world is not yet sufficiently convinced and probably the parties concerned do not think them to be so and consequently do not appear to be at all disposed to accept them princes enjoin and prescribe such things when they have strength and power to supply the want of arguments and according to practice in these cases the weaker are never thought to have an ill bargain if they have anything left them so that the first qualification of an equivalent must be that the appraisers be indifferent else it is only a sound there can be nothing real in it for when the same party that proposeth a bargain 
claimeth a right to set the value, or, which is worse, hath power, too, to make it good. The other may be forced to submit to the conditions, but he can by no means ever be persuaded to treat upon them. 4. The next thing to be considered is, that to make an equivalent in reality an equal thing in the proposer, it must be a better thing than that which is required by him, just as good is subject to the hazard of not being quite so good. It is not easy to have such an even hand as to make the value exactly equal. Besides, according to the maxim in law, melior condicio possidentis, the offer is not fair except the thing offered is better in value than the thing demanded there must be allowance for removing what is fixed and there must be something that may be a justification for changing the value of things very often dependeth more upon other circumstances than upon what is merely intrinsic to them therefore the calculation must be made upon that foot perhaps in most cases and particularly the want which one of the parties may have of the thing he requireth make it more valuable to him than it is in itself if the party proposing doth not want the thing he would have in exchange his requiring it is impertinent if he doth his want of it must go into the appraisement and by consequence every proposer of an equivalent must offer a better thing or else he must not take it unkindly to be refused, except the other party hath an equal want of the same thing, which is very improbable, since naturally he that wanteth most will speak first. 5. Another thing necessary to the making a fair bargain is that let the parties who treat be never so unequal in themselves, yet as to the particular thing proposed, there must be an exact equality as far as it relateth to the full liberty of taking or refusing, concurring or objecting, without any consequence of revenge, or so much as dissatisfaction. For it is impossible to treat where it is an affront to differ. In that case there is no mean between the two extremes, either an open quarrel or an entire submission. The way of bargaining must be equal, else the bargain itself cannot be so. For example, the proposer is not only to use equal terms as to the matter, but fair ones in the manner, too. There must be no intimations of anger in the case of refusal, much less any open threatening. Such a style is so ill-suited to the usual way of treating that it looketh more like a breach of the peace than the making a bargain. It would be yet more improper and less agreeing with the nature of an equivalent if, whilst two men are chaffering about the price, one of them should actually take the thing in question at his own rate, and afterwards desire to have his possession confirmed by a formal agreement. Such a proceeding would not only destroy that particular contract, but make it impossible to have any other with the party that could be guilty of such a practice. 6. Violence preceding destroyeth all contract. 6. Violence preceding destroyeth all contract, and even though the party that offer it should have a right to the thing he so taketh, yet it is to be obtained by legal means, else it may be forfeited by his irregularity in the pursuit of it. The law is such an enemy to violence, and so little to be reconciled to it, that in the case of a rape the punishment is not taken off though the party injured afterwards consenteth the justice of the law hath its eye upon the first act and the maxim of volenti non fit injuria doth not in this case help the offender it being a plea subsequent to the crime which maketh it to be rejected as a thing wrong dated and out of time in taking away goods or money it is the same thing the party robbed, by giving them afterwards to the taker, doth not exempt him from the punishment of the violence. Quite contrary, the man from whom they were taken is punishable, if he doth not prosecute. If the case should be that a man thus taking away a thing without price claimeth a right to take it, then whether it is well or ill-founded is not the question. 
but sure the party from whom it is so taken whilst he is treating to sell or exchange it can never make a bargain with so arbitrary a chapman there being no room left after that to talk of the value seven to make an equal bargain there must be a liberty of differing not only in everything that is really essential but in everything that is thought so by either party and most especially by him who is in possession of the thing demanded his opinion must be a rule to him and even his mistake in the value though it may not convince the man he hath to deal with yet he will be justified for not accepting what is offered till that mistake is fairly rectified and overruled when a security is desired to be changed that side which desireth it must not pretend to impose upon the other so as to dictate to them and tell them without debate that they are safe in what is proposed since of that the counsel on the other side must certainly be the most competent judges the hand it cometh from is a great circumstance either to invite or discourage in all matters of contract the qualifications of the party offering must suit with the proposition itself else let it be never so fair there is ground for suspicion eight when men are of a temper that they think they have wrong done them if they have not always the better side of a bargain if they happen to be such as by experience have been found to have an ill memory for their word if the character they bear doth not recommend their justice wherever their interest is concerned in these cases thinking men will avoid dealing not only to prevent surprise but to cut off the occasions of difficulty or dispute it is yet more discouraging when they are either a precedent practice or standing maxims of gross partiality in assuming a privilege of exemption from the usual methods of equal dealing to illustrate this by an instance suppose that in any case the church of rome should have an interest to promote a bargain let her way of dealing be a little examined which will direct those with whom she treateth how far they are to rely upon what she proposeth to them we may begin with the quality in the world the least consisting with equal dealing viz an incurable partiality to herself which that it may arrive to its full perfection is crowned with infallibility at the first setting out she maketh herself uncapable of dealing upon terms of equality by the power she claimeth of binding and loosing which hath been so often applied to treaties as well as to sins if the definition of justice is to deal equally she cannot be guilty of it without betraying her prerogative and according to her principles she giveth up the superiority derived to her by apostolical succession if she degradeth herself so as to be judged by the rules of common right especially if the bargain should be with heretics who in her opinion have forfeited the claim they might otherwise have had to it nine besides her taste hath been so spoiled by unreasonable bargains that she can never bring down her palate to anything that is fair or equal she hath not only judged it an equivalent but a great bargain for the other side to give them absolutions and indulgence for the real payment of great sums for which she hath drawn bills to have them repaid with interest in purgatory this spiritual bank hath carried on such a trade upon these advantageous terms that it can never submit to the small profits an ordinary bargain would produce the several popes have in exchange for the peter pence and all their other rents and fines out of england sent sanctified roses relics and other such wonder-working trifles and by virtue of their character of holy fathers have used princes like children by sending them such rattles to play with which they made them buy at extravagant rates besides which they were to be thankful too into the bargain a chip of the cross a piece of st lawrence's gridiron a hair of st peter have been thought equivalents for much more substantial things 
the popes being masters of the jewel house have set the rates upon them and they have passed though the whole shop should not take up the value of a bodkin in lombard street upon the credit of them they are unconscionable purchasers for they get all the money from the living by praying for them when they are dead and it is observable that the northern part of christendom which best understandeth trade were the first that refused to make any more bargains with them so that it looketh as if the chief quarrel to the heretics was not as they were ill christians but as they were unkind merchants in so discourteously rejecting the commodities of the growth of rome to conclude this head there is no bartering with infallibility it being so much above equality that it cannot bear the indignity of a true equivalent ten in all bargains there is a necessity of looking back and reflecting how far a present proposal is reconcilable with a former practice for example if at any time a thing is offered quite differing from the arguments used by the proposer and inconsistent with the maxims held out by him at other times or in a public case if the same men who promote and press a thing with the utmost violence do in a little time after with as much violence press the contrary and profess a detestation of the very thing for which they had before employed all their interest and authority or if in the case of a law already made there should be a privilege claimed to exempt those from the obligation of observing it who yet should afterwards desire and press to have a new law made in exchange for the old one by which they would not be bound and that they should propose a security by a thing of the very same nature as that which they did not allow to be any before these incoherences must naturally have the effect of raising suspicion or rather they are a certain proof that in such circumstances it is irrational for men to expect an effectual equivalent eleven if whatsoever is more than ordinary is suspicious everything that is unnatural is more so it is not only unnecessary but unnatural too to persuade with violence what is folly to refuse to push men with eagerness into a good bargain for themselves is a style very much unsuitable to the nature of the thing but it goeth further and is yet more absurd to grow angry with men for not receiving a proposal that is for their advantage men ought to be content with the generosity of offering good bargains and should give their compassion to those who do not understand them but by carrying their good nature so far as to be choleric in such a case they would follow the example of the church of rome where the definition of charity is very extraordinary in her language the writ de horetico comburendo is a love letter and burning men for differing with them in opinion howsoever miscalled cruelty is as they understand it the perfection of flaming charity when anger in these cases lasteth long it is most probable that it is for our own sakes good nature for others is one of those diseases that is cured by time and especially where it is offered and rejected but for ourselves it never faileth and cannot be extinguished but with our life it is fair if men can believe that their friends love them next to themselves to love them better is too much the expression is so unnatural that it is cloying and men must have no sense who in this case have no suspicion twelve another circumstance necessary to a fair bargain is that there must be openness or freedom allowed as the effect of that equality which is the foundation of contracting there must be full liberty of objecting and making doubts and scruples if they are such as can be answered the party convinced is so much the more confirmed and encouraged to deal instead of being hindered by them but if instead of an answer to satisfy there is nothing but anger for a reply it is impossible not to conclude that there is never a good one to give 
so that the objection remaining without being fully confuted there is an absolute bar put to any further treaty there can be no dealing where one side assumeth a privilege to impose so as to make an offer and not bear the examination of it this is giving judgment not making a bargain where it is called unmannerly to object or criminal to refuse the surest way is for men to stay where they are rather than treat upon such disadvantage if it should happen to be in any country where the governing power should allow men liberty of conscience in the choice of their religion it would be strange to deny them liberty of speech in making a bargain such a contradiction would be so discouraging that they must be unreasonably sanguine who in that case can entertain the hopes of a fair equivalent thirteen an equal bargain must not be a mystery nor a secret the purchaser or proposer is to tell directly and plainly what it is he intendeth to give in exchange for that which he requireth it must be viewed and considered by the other party that he may judge of the value for without knowing what it is he cannot determine whether he shall take or leave it an assertion in general that it shall be as good or a better thing is not in this a sufficient excuse for the mistake of dealing upon such uncertain terms in all things that are dark and not enough explained suspicion naturally followeth a secret generally implieth a defect or a deceit and if a false light is an objection no light at all is yet a greater to pretend to give a better thing and to refuse to show it is very near saying it is not so good a one at least so it will be taken in common construction a mystery is yet a more discouraging thing to a protestant especially if the proposition should come from a papist it being one of his great objections to that church that there are so many of them invisible and impossible which are so violently thrust upon their understandings that they are overlaid with them they think that rational creatures are to be convinced only by reason and that reason must be visible and freely exposed else they will think themselves used with contempt instead of equality and will never allow such a suspected secrecy to be a fit preface to a real equivalent fourteen in matters of contract not only the present value but the contingencies and consequences as far as they can be fairly supposed are to be considered for example if there should be a possibility that one of the parties may be ruined by accepting and the other only disappointed by his refusing the consequences are so extremely unequal that it is not imaginable a man should take that for an equivalent which hath such a fatal possibility at the heels of it if it should happen in a public case that such a proposal should come from the minor part of an assembly or nation to the greater it is very just that the hazard of such a possibility should more or less likely fall upon the lesser part rather than upon the greater for whose sake and advantage things are and must be calculated in all public constitutions suppose in any mixed government the chief magistrate should propose upon a condition in the senate diet or other supreme assembly either to enact or abrogate one or more laws by which a possibility might be let in of destroying their religion and property which in other language signifieth no less than soul and body where could be the equivalent in the case not only for the real loss but even for the fear of losing them men can fall no lower than to lose all and if losing all destroyeth them the venturing all must fright them in an instance when men are secure that how far soever they may be overrun by violence yet they can never be undone by law except they give their assistance to make it possible though it should neither be likely nor intended still the consequence which may happen is too big for any present thing to make amends for it 
while the word possible remaineth it must forbid the bargain wherever it falleth out therefore that in an example of a public nature the changing enacting or repealing a law may naturally tend to the misplacing the legislative power in the hands of those who have a separate interest from the body of a people there can be no treating till it is demonstrably made out that such a consequence shall be absolutely impossible for if that shall be denied by those who make the proposal if it is because they cannot do it the motion at first was very unfair if they can and will not it would be yet less reasonable to expect that such partial dealers would ever give an equivalent fit to be accepted fifteen it is necessary in all dealing to be assured in the first place that the party proposing is in a condition to make good his offer that he is neither under any former obligations or pretended claims which may render him uncapable of performing it else he is so far in the condition of a minor that whatever he disposeth by sale or exchange may be afterwards resumed and the contract becometh void being originally defective for want of a sufficient legal power in him that made it in the case of a strict settlement where the party is only tenant for life there is no possibility of treating with one under such fetters no purchase or exchange of lands or anything else can be good where there is such an incapacity of making out a title the interest vested in him being so limited that he can do little more than pronounce the words of a contract he can by no means perform the effect of it in more public instances the impossibility is yet more express as suppose in any kingdom where the people have so much liberty left them as that they may make contracts with the crown there should be some peculiar rights claimed to be so fixed to the royal function that no king for the time being could have power to part with them being so fundamentally tied to the office that they can never be separated such rights can upon no occasion be received in exchange for anything the crown may desire from the people that can never be taken in payment which cannot lawfully be given so that if they should part with that which is required upon those terms it must be a gift it cannot be a bargain there is not in the whole dictionary a more untractable word than inherent and less to be reconciled to the word equivalent the party that will contract in spite of such a claim is content to take what is impossible to grant and if he complaineth of his disappointment he neither can have remedy nor deserveth it if a right so claimed happeneth to be of so comprehensive a nature as that by a clear inference it may extend to everything else as well as to the particular matter in question as often as the supreme magistrate shall be so disposed there can in that case be no treating with a prerogative that swalloweth all the right the people can pretend to and if they have no right to any thing of which they are possessed it is a jest and not a bargain to observe any formality in parting with it a claim may be so stated that by the power and advantage of interpreting it shall have such a murthering eye that if it looketh upon a law like a basilisk it shall strike it dead where is the possibility of treating where such a right is assumed nay let it be supposed that such a claim is not well founded in law and that upon a predisquisition it could not be made out yet even in this case none that are well advised will conclude a bargain till it is fully stated and cleared or indeed so much as engage in a treaty till by way of preliminary all possibility shall be removed of any trouble or dispute sixteen there is a collateral circumstance in making a contract which yet deserveth to be considered as much as anything that belongeth to it and that is the character and figure of the parties contracting if they treat only by themselves and if by others the qualification of the instruments they employ the proposer especially must not be so low as to want credit 
nor so raised as to carry him above the reach of ordinary dealing in the first there is scandal in the other danger there is no rule without some exception but generally speaking the means should be suited to the end and since all men who treat pretend an equal bargain it is desirable that there may be equality in the persons as well as in the thing the manner of doing things has such an influence upon the matter that men may guess at the end by the instruments that are used to obtain it who are a very good direction how far to rely upon or suspect the sincerity of that which is proposed an absurdity in the way of carrying on a treaty in any one circumstance if it is very gross is enough to persuade a thinking man to break off and take warning from such an ill appearance some things are so glaring that it is impossible not to see and consequently not to suspect them as suppose in a private case there should be a treaty of marriage between two honorable families and the proposing side should think fit to send a woman that had been carted to persuade the young lady to an approbation and consent the unfitness of the messenger must naturally dispose the other party to distrust the message and to resist the temptation of the best match that could be offered when conveyed by that hand and ushered in by such a discouraging preliminary in a public instance the suspicion arising from unfit mediators still groweth more reasonable in proportion as the consequence is much greater of being deceived if a jew should be employed to solicit all sorts of christians to unite and agree the contrariety of his profession would not allow men to stay till they heard his arguments they would conclude from his religion that either the man himself was mad or that he thought those to be so whom he had the impudence to endeavor to persuade or suppose an adamite should be very solicitous and active in all places and with all sorts of persons to settle the church of england in particular and a fair liberty of conscience for all dissenters though nothing in the world has more to be said for it than naked truth yet if such a man should run up and down without clothes let his arguments be never so good or his commission never so authentic his figure would be such a contradiction to his business that how serious soever that might be in itself his interposition would make a jest of it though it should not go so far as this yet if men have contrarieties in their way of living not to be reconciled as if they should pretend infinite zeal for liberty and at the same time be in great favor and employed by those who will not endure it if they are affected singular and conform to the generality of the world in no one thing but in playing the knave if demonstration is a familiar word with them most especially where the thing is impossible if they quote authority to supply their want of sense and justify the value of their arguments not by reason but by their being paid for them in which by the way those who pay them have probably a very melancholy equivalent if they brandish a prince's word like a sword in a crowd to make way for their own impertinence and in dispute as criminals formerly fled to the statue of the prince for sanctuary if they should now when baffled creep under the protection of a king's name where out of respect they are no farther to be pursued in these cases though the proposition should be really good they will be corrupted by passing through such conduits and it would be a sufficient mistake to enter into a treaty but it would be little less than madness from such hands to expect an equivalent seventeen having touched upon these particulars as necessary in order to the stating the nature of an equal bargain and the circumstances belonging to it let it now be examined in two or three instances what things are not to be admitted by way of contract to pass under the name of an equivalent first though it will be allowed that in the general corruption of mankind which will not admit justice alone to be sufficient tie to make a good contract 
that a punishment added for the breach of it is a fitting or rather a necessary circumstance yet it does not follow that in all cases a great penalty upon the party offending is an absolute and an entire security it must be considered in every particular case how far the circumstances may rationally lead a man to rely more or less upon it in a private instance the penalty inflicted upon the breach of contract must be first such a one as the party injured can enforce and secondly such a one as he will enforce when it is in his power if the offending party is in a capacity of hindering the other from bringing the vengeance of the law upon him if he hath strength or privilege sufficient to overrule the letter of the contract in that case a penalty is but a word there is no consequence belonging to it secondly the forfeiture or punishment must be such as the man aggrieved will take for example if upon a bargain one of the parties shall stipulate to subject himself in case of his failure to have his ears cut or his nose slit by the other with security given that he shall not be prosecuted for executing this part of the agreement the penalty is no doubt heavy enough to discourage a man from breaking his contract but on the other side it is of such a kind that the other how much soever he may be provoked will not in cold blood care to inflict it such an extravagant clause would seem to be made only for show and sound and no man would think himself safer by a thing which one way or other is sure to prove ineffectual in a public case suppose in a government so constituted that a law may be made in the nature of a bargain it is in itself no more than a dead letter the life is given to it by the execution of what it containeth so that let it in itself be never so perfect it dependeth upon those who are entrusted with seeing it observed if it is in any country where the chief magistrate chooseth the judges and the judges interpret the laws a penalty in any one particular law can have no effect but what is precarious it may have a loud voice to threaten but it has not an hand to give a blow for as long as the governing power is in possession of this prerogative let who will choose the meat if they choose the cooks it is they that will give the taste to it so that it is clear that the rigor of a penalty will not in all cases fix a bargain neither is it universally a true position that the increase of punishment for the breach of a new law is an equivalent for the consent to part with an old one eighteen in most bargains there is a reference to the time to come which is therefore to be considered as well as that which cometh within the compass of the present valuation where the party contracting hath not a full power to dispose what belongeth to him or them in reversion who shall succeed after him in his right he cannot make any part of what is so limited to be the condition of the contract further he cannot enjoin the heir or successor to forbear the exercise of any right that is inherent to him as he is a man neither can he restrain him without his own consent from doing any act which in itself is lawful and liable to no objection for example a father cannot stipulate with any other man that in consideration of such a thing done or to be done his son shall never marry because marriage is an institution established by the laws of god and man and therefore no body can be so restrained by any power from doing such an act when he thinketh fit being warranted by an authority that is not to be controlled nineteen now as there are rights inherent in men's persons in their single capacities there are rights as much fixed to the body politic which is a creature that never dieth for instance there can be no government without a supreme power that power is not always in the same hands it is in different shapes and dresses but still wherever it is lodged it must be unlimited it hath a jurisdiction over everything else but it cannot have it above itself supreme power can no more be limited than infinity can be measured because it ceaseth to be the thing 
its very being is dissolved when any bounds can be put to it where this supreme power is mixed or divided the shape only differeth the argument is still the same the present state of venice cannot restrain those who succeed them in the same power from having an entire and unlimited sovereignty they may indeed make present laws which shall retrench their present power if they are so disposed and those laws if not repealed by the same authority that enacted them are to be observed by the succeeding senate till they think fit to abrogate them and no longer for if the supreme power shall still reside in the senate perhaps composed of other men or of other minds which will be sufficient the necessary consequence is that one senate must have as much right to alter such a law as another could have to make it twenty suppose the supreme power in any state should make a law to enjoin all subsequent lawmakers to take an oath never to alter it it would produce these following absurdities first all supreme power being instituted to promote the safety and benefit and to prevent the prejudice and danger which may fall upon those who live under the protection of it the consequence of such an oath would be that all men who are so trusted shall take god to witness that such a law once made being judged at the time to be advantageous for the public though afterwards by the vicissitude of times or the variety of accidents or interests it should plainly appear to them to be destructive they will suffer it to have its course and will never repeal it secondly if there could in any nation be found a set of men who having a part in the supreme legislative power should as much as in them lieth betray their country by such a criminal engagement so directly opposite to the nature of their power and to the trust reposed in them if these men have their power only for life when they are dead such an oath can operate no farther and though that would be too long a lease for the life of such a monster as an oath so composed yet it must then certainly give up the ghost it could bind none but the first makers of it another generation would never be tied up by it thirdly in those countries where the supreme assemblies are not constant standing courts but called together upon occasions and composed of such as the people choose for that time only with a trust and character that remaineth no longer with them than till that assembly is regularly dissolved such an oath taken by the members of a senate diet or other assembly so chosen can have very little effect because at the next meeting there may be quite another set of men who will be under no obligation of that kind the eternity intended to that law by those that made it will be cut off by new men who shall succeed them in their power if they have a differing taste or another interest twenty one to put it yet farther suppose a clause in such a law that it shall be criminal in the last degree for any man chosen in a subsequent assembly to propose the repealing of it and since nothing can be enacted which is not first proposed by this means it seemeth as if a law might be created which should never die but let this be examined first such a clause would be so destructive to the being of such a constitution as that it would be as reasonable to say that a king had a right to give or sell his kingdom to a foreign prince as that any number of men who are entrusted with the supreme power or any part of it should have a right to impose such shackles upon the liberty of those who are to succeed them in the same trust the ground of that trust is that every man who is chosen into such an assembly is to do all that in him lieth for the good of those who chose him the english of such a clause would be that he is not to do his best for those that chose him because though he should be convinced that it might be very fatal to continue that law and therefore very necessary to repeal it yet he must not repeal it because it is made a crime and attended with a penalty but secondly to show the emptiness as well as injustice of such a clause 
it is clear that although such an invasion of right should be imposed it will never be obeyed there will only be deformity in the monster it will neither sting nor bite such lawgivers would only have the honor of attempting a contradiction which can never have any success for as such a law in itself would be a madness so the penalty would be a jest which may be thus made out twenty two a law that carrieth in itself reason enough to support it is so far from wanting the protection of such a clause or from needing to take such an extraordinary receipt for long life that the admitting it must certainly be the likeliest and the shortest way to destroy it such a clause in a law must imply an opinion that the greatest part of mankind is against it since it is impossible such an exorbitance should be done for its own sake the end of it must be to force men by a penalty to that which they could not be persuaded to whilst their reason is left at liberty this position being granted which i think can hardly be denied put the case that a law should be made with this imaginary clause of immortality after which another assembly is chosen and if the majority of the electors shall be against this law the greater part of the elected must be so too if the choice is fair and regular which must be presumed since the supposition of the contrary is not to come within this argument when these men shall meet the majority will be visible beforehand of those who are against such a law so that there will be no hazard to any single man in proposing the repeal of it when he cannot be punished but by the majority and he hath such a kind of assurance as cometh near a demonstration that the greater number will be of his mind and consequently that for their own sakes they will secure him from any danger for these reasons wherever in order to the making a bargain a proposition is advanced to make a new law which is to tie up those who neither can nor will be bound by it it may be a good jest but it will never be a good equivalent twenty three in the last case let it be examined how far a promise ought to be taken for a security in a bargain there is such a variety of methods for the security of those that deal according to their dispositions and interests some are binding others inducing circumstances and are to be so distinguished first ready payment is without exception so of that there can be no dispute in default of that the good opinion men may have of one another is a great ingredient to supply the want of immediate performances where the trust is grounded upon inclination only the generosity is not always returned but where it springeth from a long experience it is a better foundation and yet that is not always secure in ordinary dealing one promise may be an equivalent to another but it is not so for a thing actually granted or conveyed especially if the thing required in exchange for it is of great value either in itself or in its consequences a bare promise as a single security in such a case is not an equal proposal if it is offered by way of addition it generally giveth cause to doubt the title is crazy where so slender a thing is brought in to be a supplement twenty four the earnest of making good a promise must be such a behavior proceeding as may encourage the party to whom it is made to depend upon it where instead of that there hath been want of kindness and which is worse than an invasion of right a promise hath no persuading force and till the objection to such a proceeding is forgotten which can only be the work of time and the skin is a little grown over the tender part the wound must not be touched there must be some intermission at least to abate the smart of unkind usage or else a promise in the eye of the party injured is so far from strengthening a security that it raiseth more doubts and giveth more justifiable cause to suspect it a word is not like a bone that being broken and well set again is said to be sometimes stronger in that very part 
it is far from being so in a word given and not made good every single act either weakeneth or improveth our credit with other men and as an habit of being just to our word will confirm so an habit of too freely dispensing with it must necessarily destroy it a promise hath its effect to persuade a man to lay some weight upon it where the promiser hath not only the power but may reasonably be supposed to have the will of performing it and further that there be no visible interest of the party promising to excuse himself from it or to evade it all obligations are comparative and where they seem to be opposite or between the greater and the lesser which of them ought to have precedence in all respects every man is apt to be his own judge twenty five if it should fall out that the promiser with full intent at the time to perform might by the interposition of new arguments or differing advice think himself obliged to turn the matter of conscience on the other side and should look upon it to be much a greater fault to keep his word than to break it such a belief will untie the strictest promise that can be made and though the party thus absolving himself should do it without the mixture or temptation of private interest being moved to it merely by his conscience as then informed yet how far soever that might diminish the fault in him it would in no degree lessen the inconveniences to the party who is disappointed by the breach of an engagement upon which he relied twenty six a promise is to be understood in the plain and natural sense of the words and to be sure not in his who made it if it was given as part of a bargain that would be like giving a man power to raise the value of his money in the payment of his debt by which though he paid but half or less he might pretend according to the letter to have made good the contract the power of interpreting a promise entirely taketh away the virtue of it a merchant who should once assume that privilege would save himself the trouble of making any more bargains it is still worse if this jurisdiction over a man's promise should be lodged in hands that have power to support such an extraordinary claim and if in other cases forbearing to deal upon those terms is advisable in this it becometh absolutely necessary twenty seven there must in all respects be a full liberty to claim a promise to make it reasonable to take it in any part of payment else it would be like agreeing for a rent and at the same time making it criminal to demand it a superiority of dignity or power in the party promising maketh it a more tender thing for the other party to treat upon that security the first maketh it a nice thing to claim the latter maketh it a difficult thing to obtain in some cases a promise is in the nature of a covenant and then between equal parties the breach of it will bear a suit but where the greatness of the promiser is very much raised above the level of equality there is no forfeiture to be taken it is so far from the party grieved his being able to sue or recover damages that he will not be allowed to explain or expostulate and instead of his being relieved against the breach of promise he will run the hazard of being punished for breach of good manners such a difficulty is putting all or part of the payment in the fire where men must burn their fingers before they can come at it that cannot properly be called good payment which the party to whom it is due may not receive with ease and safety it was a king's brother of england who refused to lend the pope money for this reason that he would never take the bond of one upon whom he could not distrain the argument is still stronger against the validity of a promise when the contract is made between a prince and a subject the very offering a king's word in mortgage is rather a threatening in case of refusal than an inducing argument to accept it it is unfair at first and by that giveth greater cause to be cautious especially if a thing of that value and dignity as a king's word ought to be should be put into the hands of state brokers to strike up a bargain with 
twenty eight when god almighty maketh covenants with mankind his promise is a sufficient security notwithstanding his superiority and his power because first he can neither err nor do injustice it is the only exception to his omnipotence that by the perfection of his being he is incapacitated to do wrong secondly at the instant of his promise by the extent of his foresight which cannot fail there is no room left for the possibility of anything to intervene which might change his mind lastly he is above the receiving either benefit or inconvenience and therefore can have no interest or temptation to vary from his word when once he hath granted it now though princes are god's vice-regents yet their commission not being so large as that these qualifications are devolved to them it is quite another case and since the offering a security implieth it to be examined by the party to whom it is proposed it must not be taken ill that objections are made to it even though the prince himself should be the immediate proposer let a familiar case be put suppose a prince tempted by a passion too strong for him to resist should descend so as to promise marriage to one of his subjects and as men are naturally in great haste upon such occasions should press to take possession before the necessary forms could be complied with would the poor lady's scruples be called criminal for not taking the security of the royal word or would her allegiance be tainted by her resisting the sacred person of her sovereign because he was impatient of delay courtesy in this case might persuade her to accept it if she was so disposed but sure the just exercise of power can never claim it twenty nine there is one case where it is more particularly a duty to use very great caution in accepting the security of a promise and that is when men are authorized and trusted by others to act for them this putteth them under much greater restraints than those who are at liberty to treat for themselves it is lawful though it is not prudent for any man to make an ill bargain for himself but it is neither the one nor the other where the party contracting treateth on behalf of another by whom he is entrusted men who will unwarily accept an ill security if it is for themselves forfeit their own discretion and undergo the penalty but they are not responsible to anybody else they lie under the mortification and the loss of committing the error by which though they may expose their judgment to some censure yet their morality suffers no reproach by it but those who are deputed by others to treat for them upon terms of best advantage though the confidence placed in them should prevent the putting any limits to their power in their commission yet the condition implied if not expressed is that the persons so trusted shall neither make an ill bargain nor accept a slight security the obligation is yet more binding when the trust is of a public nature the aggravation of disappointing a body of men that rely upon them carrieth the fault as high as it can go and perhaps no crime of any kind can outdo such a deliberate breach of trust or would more justly make men forfeit the protection of humane society thirty i will add one thing more upon this head which is that it is not always a true proposition that tis safe to rely upon a promise if at the time of making it it is the interest of the promiser to make it good this though many times it is a good inducement yet it hath these exceptions to it first if the proposer hath at other times gone plainly against his visible interest the argument will turn the other way and his former mistakes are so many warnings to the others not to come within the danger of any more let the inducements to those mistakes be never so great and generous that does not alter the nature they are mistakes still interest is an uncertain thing it goeth and cometh and varieth according to times and circumstances as good build upon a quicksand as upon a presumption that interest shall not alter 
where are the men so distinguished from the rest of mankind that it is impossible for them to mistake their interest who are they that have such an exemption from humane frailty as that it can never happen to them not to see their interest for want of understanding or not to leap over it by excess of zeal above all princes are the most liable to mistake not out of any defect in their nature which might put them under such an unfortunate distinction quite contrary the blood they derive from wise and great ancestors doth rather distinguish them on the better side besides that their great character and office of governing giveth a noble exercise to their reason which can very hardly fail to raise and improve it but there is one circumstance annexed to their glorious calling which in this respect is sufficient to outweigh all those advantages it is that mankind divided in most things else agree in this to conspire in their endeavors to deceive and mislead them which maketh it above the power of humane understanding to be so exactly guarded as never to admit a surprise and the highest applause that could ever yet be given to the greatest men that ever wore a crown is that they were no oftener deceived thus i have ventured to lay down my thoughts of the nature of a bargain and the due circumstances belonging to an equivalent and will now conclude with this short word Quote, where distrusting may be the cause of provoking anger and trusting may be the cause of bringing ruin the choice is too easy to need the being explained Unquote. end of the anatomy of an equivalent read by john greenman This is section 17 of the complete works of George Saville, first Marquess of Halifax. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Letter to a Dissenter Upon Occasion of His Majesty's Late Gracious Declaration of Indulgence Read by John Greenman Sir, since addresses are in fashion, give me leave to make one to you this is neither the effect of fear interest or resentment therefore you may be sure it is sincere and for that reason it may expect to be kindly received whether it will have power enough to convince dependeth upon the reasons of which you are to judge and upon your preparation of mind to be persuaded by truth whenever it appeareth to you it ought not to be the less welcome for coming from a friendly hand one whose kindness to you is not lessened by difference of opinion and who will not let his thoughts for the public be so tied or confined to this or that subdivision of protestants as to stifle the charity which besides all other arguments is at this time become necessary to preserve us i am neither surprised nor provoked to see that in the condition you were put into by the laws and the ill circumstances you lay under by having the exclusion and rebellion laid to your charge you were desirous to make yourselves less uneasy and obnoxious to authority men who are sore run to the nearest remedy with too much haste to consider all the consequences grains of allowance are to be given where nature giveth such strong influences when to men under sufferings it offereth ease the present pain will hardly allow time to examine the remedies and the strongest reason can hardly gain a fair audience from our mind whilst so possessed till the smart is a little allayed i do not know whether the warmth that naturally belongeth to new friendships may not make it a harder task for me to persuade you it is like telling lovers in the beginning of their joys that they will in a little time have an end such an unwelcome style doth not easily find credit 
but i will suppose you are not so far gone in your new passion but that you will hear still and therefore i am under the less discouragement when i offer to your consideration two things the first is the cause you have to suspect your new friends the second the duty incumbent upon you in christianity and prudence not to hazard the public safety neither by desire of ease nor of revenge to the first consider that notwithstanding the smooth language which is now put on to engage you these new friends did not make you their choice but their refuge they have ever made their courtship to the church of england and when they were rejected there they made their application to you in the second place the instance of this might be given in all times i do not repeat them because whatsoever is unnecessary must be tedious the truth of this assertion being so plain as not to admit a dispute you cannot therefore reasonably flatter yourselves uh, that there is any inclination to you they never pretended to allow you any quarter but to usher in liberty for themselves under that shelter i refer you to mr coleman's letters and to the journals of parliament where you may be convinced if you can be so mistaken as to doubt nay at this very hour they can hardly forbear in the height of their courtship to let fall hard words of you so little is nature to be restrained it will start out sometimes disdaining to submit to the usurpation of art and interest this alliance between liberty and infallibility is bringing together the two most contrary things that are in the world the church of rome doth not only dislike the allowing liberty but by its principles it cannot do it wine is not more expressly forbid to the mohammedans than giving heretics liberty to the papists they are no more able to make good their vows to you than men married before and their wife alive can confirm their contract with another the continuance of their kindness would be a habit of sin of which they are to repent and their absolution is to be had upon no other terms than their promise to destroy you you are therefore to be hugged now only that you may be better squeezed at another time there must be something extraordinary when the church of rome setteth up bills and offereth plaisters for tender consciences by all that hath hitherto appeared her skill in chirurgery lieth chiefly in a quick hand to cut off limbs and she is the worst at healing of any that ever pretended to it to come so quick from another extreme is such an unnatural motion that you ought to be upon your guard the other day you were sons of belial now you are angels of light this is a violent change and it will be fit for you to pause upon it before you believe it if your features are not altered neither is their opinion of you whatever may be pretended do you believe less than you did that there is idolatry in the church of rome sure you do not see then how they treat both in words and writing those who entertain that opinion conclude from hence how inconsistent their favor is with this single article except they give you a dispensation for this too and by a non obstante secure you that they will not think the worse of you think a little how dangerous it is to build upon a foundation of paradoxes popery now is the only friend to liberty and the known enemy to persecution the men of taunton and tiverton are above all other eminent for loyalty the quakers from being declared by the papists not to be christians are now made favorites and taken into their particular protection they are on a sudden grown the most accomplished men of the kingdom in good breeding and give thanks with the best grace in double refined language 
so that I should not wonder, though a man of that persuasion, in spite of his hat, should be master of the ceremonies. Not to say harsher words, these are such very new things, that it is impossible not to suspend our belief, till by a little more experience we may be informed whether they are realities or apparitions. We have been under shameful mistakes if these opinions are true, but for the present we are apt to be incredulous, except we could be convinced that the priest's words, in this case too, are able to make such a sudden and effectual change, and that their power is not limited to the sacrament, but that it extendeth to alter the nature of all other things, as often they are so disposed. Let me now speak of the instruments of your friendship, and then leave you to judge whether they do not afford matter of suspicion. No sharpness is to be mingled where healing only is intended. So nothing will be said to expose particular men, how strong soever the temptation may be, or how clear the proofs to make it out. A word or two in general for your better caution shall suffice. Suppose, then, for argument's sake, that the mediators of this new alliance should be such as have been formerly employed in treaties of the same kind, and there detected to have acted by order, and to have been empowered to give encouragements and rewards. Would not this be an argument to suspect them? If they should plainly be under engagements to one side, their arguments to the other ought to be received accordingly. Their fair pretenses are to be looked upon as part of their commission, which may not improbably give them a dispensation in the case of truth, when it may bring a prejudice upon the service of those by whom they are employed. If there should be men who, having formerly had means and authority to persuade by secular arguments, have, in pursuance of that power, sprinkled money amongst the dissenting ministers, and if those very men should now have the same authority, practice the same methods, and disperse where they cannot otherwise persuade, it seemeth to me to be rather an evidence than a presumption of the deceit. If there should be ministers amongst you, who, by having fallen under temptation of this kind, are in some sort engaged to continue their frailty, by the awe they are in, lest it should be exposed, the persuasions of these unfortunate men must sure have the less force, and their arguments, though never so specious, are to be suspected, when they come from men who have mortgaged themselves to severe creditors, that expect a rigorous observation of the contract, let it be never so unwarrantable. If these, or any others, should at this time preach up anger and vengeance against the Church of England, may it not, without injustice, be suspected that a thing so plainly out of season springeth rather from corruption than mistake, and that those who act this choleric part do not believe themselves, but only pursue higher directions, and endeavor to make good that part of their contract which obligeth them, upon a forfeiture, to make use of their inflaming eloquence? They might apprehend their wages would be retrenched if they should be moderate, and therefore, whilst violence is their interest, those who have not the same arguments have no reason to follow such a partial example. If there should be men, who by the load of their crimes against the government have been bowed down to comply with it against their conscience, who by incurring the want of a pardon have drawn upon themselves a the necessity of an entire resignation, such men are to be lamented, but not to be believed. Nay, they themselves, when they have discharged their unwelcome task, will be inwardly glad that their forced endeavors do not succeed, and are pleased when men resist their insinuations, which are far from being voluntary or sincere, but are squeezed out of them by the weight of their being so obnoxious. If, in the height of this great dearness of comparing things, it should happen that at this instant 
there is a much surer friendship with those who are so far from allowing liberty that they allow no living to a protestant under them let the scene lie in what part of the world it will the argument will come home and sure it will afford sufficient ground to suspect apparent contradictions must strike us neither nature nor reason can digest them self-flattery and the desire to deceive ourselves to gratify present appetite with all their power which is great cannot get the better of such broad conviction as some things carry along with them will you call these vain and empty suspicions have you been at all times so void of fears and jealousies as to justify your being so unreasonably valiant in having none upon this occasion such an extraordinary courage at this unseasonable time to say no more is too dangerous a virtue to be commended if then for these and a thousand other reasons there is cause to suspect sure your new friends are not to dictate to you or advise you for instance the addresses that fly abroad every week and murther us with another to the same the first drafts are made by those who are not very proper to be secretaries to the protestant religion and it is your part only to write them out fair again strange that you have been formerly so much against set forms should now be content the priests should indict for you the nature of thanks is an unavoidable consequence of being pleased or obliged they grow in the heart and from thence show themselves either in looks speech writing or action no man was ever thankful because he was bid to be so but because he had or thought he had some reason for it if then there is cause in this case to pay such extravagant acknowledgments they will flow naturally without taking such pains to procure them and it is unkindly done to tire all the post-horses with carrying circular letters to solicit that which would be done without any trouble or constraint if it is really in itself such a favor what needeth so much pressing men to be thankful and with such eager circumstances that where persuasions cannot delude threatenings are employed to fright them into a compliance thanks must be voluntary not only unconstrained but unsolicited else they are either trifles or snares they either signify nothing or a great deal more than is intended by those that give them if an inference should be made that whosoever thanketh the king for his declaration is by that engaged to justify it in point of law it is a greater stride than i presume all those care to make who are persuaded to address if it shall be supposed that all the thankers will be repealers of the test whenever a parliament shall meet such an expectation is better prevented before than disappointed afterwards and the surest way to avoid the lying under such a scandal is not to do anything that may give a color to the mistake these bespoke thanks are little less improper than love letters that were solicited by the lady to whom they are to be directed so that besides the little ground there is to give them the manner of getting them doth extremely lessen their value it might be wished that you would have suppressed your impatience and have been content for the sake of religion to enjoy it within yourselves without the liberty of a public exercise till a parliament had allowed it but since that could not be and that the artifices of some amongst you have made use of the well-meant zeal of the generality to draw them into this mistake i am so far from blaming you with that sharpness which perhaps the matter in strictness would bear that i am ready to err on the side of the more gentle construction there is a great difference between enjoying quietly the advantages of an act irregularly done by others and the going about to support it against the laws in being the law is so sacred that no trespass against it is to be defended yet frailties may in some measure be excused when they cannot be justified 
the desire of enjoying a liberty from which men have been so long restrained may be a temptation that their reason is not at all times able to resist if in such a case some objections are leapt over indifferent men will be more inclined to lament the occasion than to fall too hard upon the fault whilst it is covered with the apology of a good intention but where to rescue yourselves from the severity of one law you give a blow to all the laws by which your religion and liberty are to be protected and instead of silently receiving the benefit of this indulgence you set up for advocates to support it you become voluntary aggressors and look like counsel retained by the prerogative against your odd friend magna charta who hath done nothing to deserve her falling thus under your displeasure if the case then should be that the price expected from you for this liberty is giving up your right in the laws sure you will think twice before you go any further in such a losing bargain after giving thanks for the breach of one law you lose the right of complaining of the breach of all the rest you will not very well know how to defend yourselves when you are pressed and having given up the question when it was for your advantage you cannot recall it when it shall be to your prejudice if you will set up at one time a power to help you which at another time by parity of reason shall be made use of to destroy you you will neither be pitied nor relieved against a mischief you draw upon yourselves by being so unreasonably thankful it is like calling in auxiliaries to help who are strong enough to subdue you in such a case your complaints will come too late to be heard and your sufferings will raise mirth instead of compassion if you think for your excuse to expound your thanks so as to restrain them to this particular case others for their ends will extend them further and in these differing interpretations that which is backed by authority will be the most likely to prevail especially when by the advantages you have given them they have in truth the better of the argument and that the inferences from your own concessions are very strong and express against you this is so far from being a groundless supposition that there was a late instance of it the last session of parliament in the house of lords where the first thanks though things of course were interpreted to be the approbation of the king's whole speech and a restraint from the further examination of any part of it though never so much disliked and it was with difficulty obtained not to be excluded from the liberty of objecting to this mighty prerogative of dispensing merely by this innocent and usual piece of good manners by which no such thing could possibly be intended this showeth that some bounds are to be put to your good breeding and that the constitution of england is too valuable a thing to be ventured upon a compliment now that you have for some time enjoyed the benefit of the end it is time for you to look into the danger of the means the same reason that made you desirous to get liberty must make you solicitous to preserve it so that the next thought will naturally be not to engage yourself beyond retreat and to agree so far with the principles of all religion as not to rely upon a deathbed repentance there are certain periods of time which being once passed make all cautions ineffectual and all remedies desperate our understandings are apt to be hurried on by the first heats which if not restrained in time do not give us leave to look back till it is too late consider this in the case of your anger against the church of england and take warning by their mistake in the same kind when after the late king's restoration they preserved so long the bitter taste of your rough usage to them in other times that it made them forget their interest and sacrifice it to their revenge either you will blame this proceeding in them and for that reason not follow it or if you allow it you have no reason to be offended with them so that you must either dismiss your anger or lose your excuse 
except you should argue more partially than will be supposed of men of your morality and understanding if you had now to do with those rigid prelates who made it a matter of conscience to give you the least indulgence but kept you at an uncharitable distance and even to your most reasonable scruples continued stiff and inexorable the argument might be fair on your side but since the common danger hath so laid open that mistake that all the former haughtiness towards you is for ever extinguished and that it hath turned the spirit of persecution into a spirit of peace charity and condescension shall this happy change only affect the church of england and are you so in love with separation as not to be moved by this example it ought to be followed were there no other reason than that it is virtue but when besides that it has become necessary to your preservation it is impossible to fail the having its effect upon you if it should be said that the church of england is never humble but when she is out of power and therefore loseth the right of being believed when she pretendeth to it the answer is first it would be an uncharitable objection and very much mistimed an unseasonable triumph not only ungenerous but unsafe so that in these respects it cannot be urged without scandal even though it could be said with truth secondly this is not so in fact and the argument must fall being built upon a false foundation for whatever may be told you at this very hour and in the heat and glare of your present sunshine the church of england can in a moment bring clouds again and turn the royal thunder upon your heads blow you off the stage with a breath if she should give but a smile or a kind word the least glimpse of her compliance would throw you back into the state of suffering and draw upon you all the arrears of severity which have accrued during the time of this kindness to you and yet the church of england with all her faults will not allow herself to be rescued by such unjustifiable means but chooseth to bear the weight of power rather than lie under the burthen of being criminal it cannot be said that she is unprovoked books and letters come out every day to call for answers yet she will not be stirred from the supposed authors and the style one would swear they were undertakers and had made a contract to fall out with the church of england there are lashes in every address challenges to draw the pen in every pamphlet in short the fairest occasions in the world given to quarrel but she wisely distinguisheth between the body of dissenters whom she will suppose to act as they do with no ill intent and these small skirmishers picked and sent out to piquir and to begin a fray amongst the protestants for the entertainment as well as the advantage of the church of rome this conduct is so good that it will be scandalous not to applaud it and it is not equal dealing to blame our adversaries for doing ill and not commend them when they do well to hate them because they persecuted and not to be reconciled to them when they are ready to suffer rather than receive all the advantages that can be gained by a criminal compliance is a principle no sort of christians can own since it would give an objection to them never to be answered think a little who they were that promoted your former persecutions and then consider how it would look to be angry with the instruments and at the same time to make a league with the authors of your sufferings have you enough considered what will be expected from you are you ready to stand in every borough by virtue of a conge delire but instead of election be satisfied if you are returned will you in parliament justify the dispensing power with all its consequences and repeal the test by which you will make way for the repeal of all the laws that were made to preserve your religion and to enact others that shall destroy it are you disposed to change the liberty of debate into the merit of obedience and to be made instruments to repeal or enact laws when the roman consistory are lords of the articles 
are you so linked with your new friends as to reject any indulgence a parliament shall offer you if it shall not be so comprehensive as to include the papists in it consider that the implied conditions of your new treaty are no less than that you are to do everything you are desired without examining and that for this pretended liberty of conscience your real freedom is to be sacrificed your former faults hang like chains still about you you are let loose only upon bail the first act of non-compliance sendeth you to jail again you may see that the papists themselves do not rely upon the legality of this power which you are to justify since the being so very earnest to get it established by law and the doing such very hard things in order as they think to obtain it is a clear evidence that they do not think that the single power of the crown is in this case a good foundation especially when this is done under a prince so very tender of all the rights of sovereignty that he would think it a diminution to his prerogative where he conceiveth it strong enough to go alone to call in the legislative help to strengthen and support it you have formerly blamed the church of england and not without reason for going so far as they did in their compliance and yet as soon as they stopped you see they are not only deserted but prosecuted conclude then from this example that you must either break off your friendship or resolve to have no bounds in it if they do not succeed in their design they will leave you first if they do you must either leave them when it will be too late for your safety or else after the queasiness of starting at a surplice you must be forced to swallow transubstantiation remember that the other day those of the church of england were trimmers for enduring you and now by a sudden turn you are become the favorites do not deceive yourselves it is not the nature of lasting plants thus to shoot up in a night you may look gay and green for a little time but you want a root to give you a continuance it is not so long since as to be forgotten that the maxim was it is impossible for a dissenter to be a rebel consider at this time in france even the new converts are so far from being employed that they are disarmed their sudden change maketh them still to be distrusted notwithstanding that they are reconciled what are you to expect then from your dear friends to whom whenever they shall think fit to throw you off again you have in other times given such arguments for their excuse besides all this you act very unskillfully against your visible interest if you throw away the advantages of which you can hardly fail in the next probable revolution things tend naturally to what you would have if you would let them alone and not by an unseasonable activity lose the influence of your good star which promiseth you everything that is prosperous the church of england convinced of its error in being severe to you the parliament whenever it meeteth sure to be gentle to you the next heir bred in the country which you have so often quoted for a pattern of indulgence a general agreement of all thinking men that we must no more cut ourselves off from the protestants abroad but rather enlarge the foundations upon which we are to build our defences against the common enemy so that in truth all things seem to conspire to give you ease and satisfaction if by too much haste to anticipate your good fortune you do not destroy it the protestants have but one article of humane strength to oppose the power which is now against them and that is not to lose the advantage of their numbers by being so unwary as to let themselves be divided we all agree in our duty to our prince our objections to his belief do not hinder us from seeing his virtues and our not complying with his religion hath no effect upon our allegiance we are not to be laughed out of our passive obedience and the doctrine of non-resistance though even those who perhaps owe the best part of their security to that principle are apt to make a jest of it 
so that if we give no advantage by the fatal mistake of misapplying our anger by the natural course of things this danger will pass away like a shower of hail fair weather will succeed as lowering as the sky now looketh and all this by plain and easy receipt let us be still quiet and undivided firm at the same time to our religion our loyalty and our laws and so long as we continue this method it is next to impossible that the odds of two hundred to one should lose the bet except the church of rome which hath been so long barren of miracles should now in her declining age be brought to bed of one that would outdo the best she can brag of in her legend to conclude the short question will be whether you will join with those who must in the end run the same fate with you if protestants of all sorts in their behavior to one another have been to blame they are upon the more equal terms and for that very reason it is fitter for them now to be reconciled our disunion is not only a reproach but a danger to us those who believe in modern miracles have more right or at least more excuse to neglect all secular cautions but for us it is as justifiable to have no religion as wilfully to throw away the humane means of preserving it i am dear sir your affectionate humble servant t w end of a letter to a dissenter read by john greenman This is section 18 of the complete works of George Saville, first Marquis of Halifax. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Some cautions offered to the consideration of those who are to choose members to serve for the ensuing Parliament. Read by John Greenman. I will make no other introduction than that it is hoped the counties and boroughs will remember in general that besides other consequences they will have the credit of a good choice or the scandal that belongeth to an ill one the creators will be thought like their creatures and therefore an ill choice will either be a disparagement of their understanding or their morals there cannot be a fuller approbation of a thing than the choosing of it so that the fault of the members chosen if known beforehand will be judged to be of the growth of that county or borough after such a solemn approbation of them in short those who send up their representatives to westminster should take care they may be such as will do them right and their country honor now to the particulars one a very extraordinary earnestness to be chosen is no very good symptom a desire to serve the nation in parliament is an englishman's ambition always to be encouraged and never to be disapproved a man may not only be willing to stand but he may declare that willingness to his friends that they may assist him and by all the means becoming a modest and prudent man he may endeavor to succeed and prevent the being disappointed in it but there is a wide difference between this and the raising a kind of petty war in the county or corporation entering the lists rather for a combat than an election throwing fireballs to put men into heat and omitting to spread no reports whether true or false which may give an advantage by laying a blemish upon a competitor these methods will ever be suspicious it will never be thought a natural thing for men to take such extravagant pains for the mere sake of doing good to others to be content to suffer something for a good end is that which many would do without any great repugnance but where a man can honestly propose nothing to himself except troubles 
charge and loss by absence from his own affairs to be so violent in the pursuit of so ill a bargain is not at all suited to the languishing virtue of mankind so corrupted such a self-denying zeal in such a self-seeking age is so little to be imagined that it may without injury be suspected therefore when these blustering pretenders come upon the stage their natural temper and other circumstances ought to be very well considered before men trust them with the disposal of their money or their liberty and i am apt to believe there could hardly be found one single man whose other qualifications would overbalance the objections that lie against such importunate suitors two recommending letters ought to have no effect upon elections in this i must distinguish for though in strictness perhaps there should be no exception yet in compliance with long practice and out of an indulgence that is necessary in a time when mankind is too much loosened from severe rules to be kept close up to them letters sent only from equal men doing good men right by giving evidence in their behalf offering them as fitly qualified when they really are so and freeing them from unjust aspersions may still be allowed the letters i mean are from men of power where it may be beneficial to comply and inconvenient to oppose choice must not only be free from force but from influence which is a degree of force there must be no difficulty no apprehension that a refusal will be ill taken or resented the freeholders must be freemen too they are to have no shackles upon their votes in an election and the men who stand should carry their own letters of recommendation about them which are their good character and behavior in the world without borrowing evidence especially when it cometh from suspected hands those who make use of these epistles ought to have no more advantage from them than the muscovites have from the letters put into their hands when they are buried to recommend them to st nicholas the first should as little get admittance for men into the parliament as these letters can introduce the bearers into heaven the scandal of such letters liest first in the arrogant imposing of those that write them and next in the wretched meanness of those that need them men must be fallen very low in their credit who upon such an occasion have a recourse to power to support it their enemies could not give stronger evidence of their not being fit for that which they pretend to and if the electors judge otherwise they will be pretty sure in a little time to see their mistake and to repent it three non-attendance in former parliaments ought to be a bar against the choice of men who have been guilty of it it is one of the worst kinds of non-residence and the least to be excused it is very hard that men should despise a duty which perhaps is the only ground of the respect that is paid to them it is such a piece of sauciness for any one to press for the honor of serving in parliament and then to be careless in attending it that in a house where there were so many officers the penalty had not been improper to have cashiered them for not appearing at the general muster if men forbear to come out of laziness let them be gratified by taking their ease at home without interruption if out of small cunning to avoid difficulties and to escape from the inconvenience of voting in critical cases let them enjoy that despicable pitch of wisdom and never pretend to make a figure where the public is to be served if it would not be thought advisable to trust a man immediately after he hath been drawn out of a jail it may be as reasonable to look upon one who for his non-attendance in the house hath been sent for in custody as a kind of bankrupt which putteth him upon unequal terms with those who have been assiduous in the discharge of their duty they who thought fit in one session to neglect the public business may be justly suspected by their standing in the next to intend their own besides these more deliberate offenders 
there are some who do not attend even when they are in the house absent in their thoughts for want to comprehending the business that is doing and therefore diverted from it by anything that is trivial such men are nuisances to a serious assembly and when they are numerous it amounteth almost to a dissolution it being scarce possible for good sense to be heard whilst a noise is made by the buzzing of these horse-flies the roman censors who degraded a senator for yawning whilst there was a debate would have much more abundant matter here upon which they might exercise their jurisdiction to conclude this head there are so few that ever mended in these cases that after the first experiment it is not at all reasonable to take them upon a new trial four men who are unquiet and busy in their natures are to give more than ordinary proofs of their integrity before the electing them into a public trust can be justified as a hot summer breedeth greater swarms of flies so an active time breedeth a greater number of these shining gentlemen it is pretty sure that men who cannot allow themselves to be at rest will let nobody else be at quiet such a perpetual activity is apt by degrees to be applied to the pursuit of their private interest and their thoughts being in a continual motion they have not time to dwell long enough upon anything to entertain a scruple so that they are generally at full liberty to do what is most convenient for them without being fettered by any restraints nay further whenever it happeneth that there is an impunity for cheating these nimble gentlemen are apt to think it a disparagement to their understandings not to go into it i doubt it is not a wrong to the present age to say that a knave is a less unpopular calling than it hath been in former times and to say truth it would be ingratitude in some men to turn honest when they owe all they have to their knavery the people are in this respect unhappy they are too many to do their own business their numbers which make their strength are at the same time the cause of their weakness they are too unwieldy to move and for this reason nothing can ever redeem them from this incurable impotency so that they must have solicitors to pursue and look after their interests who are too often disposed to dispense with the fidelity they owe to those that trust them especially if the government will pay their bills without abatement it is better these gentlemen's dexterity should be employed anywhere than in parliament where the ill consequence of their being members is too much diffused and not restrained to the county or borough who shall be so unwary as to choose them five great drinkers are less fit to serve in parliament than is apprehended men's virtue as well as their understanding is apt to be tainted by it the appearance of it is sociable and well-natured but it is by no means to be relied upon nothing is more frail than a man too far engaged in wet popularity the habit of it maketh men careless of their business and that naturally leadeth them into circumstances that make them liable to temptation it is seldom seen that any principles have such a root as that they can be proof against the continual droppings of a bottle as to the faculties of the mind there is not less objection the vapors of wine may sometimes throw out sparks of wit but they are like scattered pieces of ore there is no vein to work upon such wit even the best of it is like paying great fines in which case there must of necessity be an abatement of the constant rent nothing sure is a greater enemy to the brain than too much moisture it can the least of any thing bear the being continually steeped and it may be said that thought may be resembled to some creatures which can live only in a dry country yet so arrogant are some men as to think they are so much masters of business as that they can play with it they imagine they can drown their reason once a day and that it shall not be the worse for it 
forgetting that by too often diving the understanding at last groweth too weak to rise up again i will suppose this fault was less frequent when solon made it one of his laws that it was lawful to kill a magistrate if he was found drunk such a liberty taken in this age either in the parliament or out of it would do terrible execution i cannot but mention a petition in the year sixteen forty seven from the county of devon to the house of commons against the undue election of burgesses who are strong in wine and weak in wisdom the cause of such petitions is to be prevented by choosing such as shall not give handle to them six wanting men give such cause of suspicion wherever they deal that surely the choosers will be upon their guard as often as such dangerous pretenders make their application to them let the behavior of such men be never so plausible and untainted yet they who are to pitch upon those they are to trust with all they have may be excused if they do not only consider what they are but what they may be as we pray ourselves we may not be led into temptation we ought not by any means to thrust others into it even though our own interest was not concerned and sure when it is the argument hath not less force if a man hath a small estate and a numerous family where it happeneth that a man hath as many children as he hath tenants it is not a recommending circumstance for his election when it cometh to be the question with such a man whether he shall be just to the public or cruel to his family it is very possible the decision may be on the side of corrupted nature it is a compliment to this age which it doth not deserve to suppose men are so tied up to morality as that they cannot be pinched out of it especially now when it is called starving not to be embroidered or served in plate the men chosen to serve their country should not be loaden with suits that may tempt them to assume privileges much less under such necessities as may more immediately prepare them for corruption men who need a parliament for their own particular interest have more reason to offer their service than others have to accept of it and though i do not doubt but there may be some whose virtue would triumph over their wants let them be never so pressing yet to expose the public to the hazard of being deceived is that which can never be justified by those that choose and though it must be allowed possible for a wanting man to be honest yet it is impossible for a man to be wise that will depend upon it seven there is a sort of men that have a tinsel wit which make them shine among those who cannot judge club and coffee-house gentlemen petty merchants of small conceits who have an empty habit of prating without meaning they always aim at wit and generally make false fire their business is less to learn than to set themselves out which makes them choose to be with such as can only be witnesses of their small ingenuity rather than with such as might improve it there is a subordinate wit as much inferior to a wit of business as a fiddler at a wake is to the lofty sound of an organ men of this size are in no degree suited to the business of redressing grievances and making laws there is a parliament wit to be distinguished from all other kinds those who have it do not stuff their heads only with cavils and objections they have a deliberate and observing wit a head turned to public things men who place a greater pleasure in mending a fault than in finding it out their understanding directeth them to object in the right place and not like those who go by no other rule than to conclude that must be the best counsel which was not taken these wholesale judges show such a gross and peevish ignorance that it appeareth so openly in all they say or do that they give loud warning to all considering men not to choose them eight 
the dislike of slight airy men must not go so far as to recommend heaviness in opposition to it especially where men are convicted of it by experience in former sessions as a lively coxcomb will seldom fail to lay in his claim for wit so a blockhead is apt to pretend that his heaviness is a proof of his judgment some have an universal lethargy spread upon their understanding without exception others have an insufficiency quad hoc as in some cases men have quad hunk these last can never so turn their thoughts to public business as to give the attention that is necessary to comprehend it there are those who have such a thick shell upon their brains that their ignorance is impenetrable and make us such a stout resistance against common sense that it will never be subdued by it true heart of oak ignorance that will never yield let reason beat never so hard upon it and though their kind neighbors have at several elections sent them up to school again they have still returned the same incurable dunces there is a false gravity that is a very ill symptom and it may be said that as rivers which run very slowly have always the most mud at the bottom so a solid stiffness in the constant course of a man's life is a sign of a thick bed of mud at the bottom of his brain a dull man is so near a dead man that he is hardly to be ranked in the list of the living and as he is not to be buried whilst he is half alive so he is as little to be employed whilst he is half dead parliaments are now grown to be quite other things than they were formerly in ancient times they were little more than great assizes a roll of grievances magna charta confirmed privileges of holy church preserved so many sacks of wool given and away now there are traps and gins laid for the well-meaning country gentleman he is to grapple with the cunning of men in town which is not a little improved by being rewarded and encouraged so that men whose good intentions are not seconded and supported by some degree of ability are as much the more dangerous as they are less criminal than cunning knaves their honest mistakes for want of distinguishing either give a countenance to or at least lessen the scandal of the injurious things that are done to the public and with leave asked for so odd an expression their innocent guilt is as mischievous to the laws and liberties as the most deliberate malice of those that would destroy them nine there is an abuse which daily increaseth of sending such to parliament as are scarce old enough to be sent to the university i would not in this restrain the definition of these boys to the age of twenty-one if my opinion might take place i should wish that none might be chosen into the house of commons under thirty and to make some equality i should from the same motives think it convenient that no lord should have a vote in judicature under that age but to leave this digression i cannot see why the choosers should not at least make it a rule among themselves not to send any man to represent them under the age of twenty-five which is the time of majority in most other places in the world surely it is not that we are earlier plants than our neighbors such supposition could neither be justified by our climate nor by the degree of latitude in which we are placed i must therefore attribute it to the haste our ancestors had and not without reason to free themselves from the severity of wardships but whether this or anything else was the cause of our earlier stepping into man's estate so it is now that according to our laws twenty-one is the age of discretion and the young man is then vested with a legal how defective soever he may be in his natural understanding with all this there ought to be a difference made between coming out of pupilage and leaping into legislatorship it is perhaps inconvenient enough that a man should be so soon let loose to destroy his own estate but it is yet worse that he should then have a power of giving away other men's the law must make general rules to which there always will be some objections 
if there were triers appointed to judge when leading strings should be left off many would wear them a very great while and some perhaps with their gray hairs there being no small number of old boys in all times and especially in this it is necessary therefore to make exceptions to this general rule where the case so much requireth it as it doth in the matter in question the ground of sending these minors to parliament ought not to recommend the continuance of it to those who are lovers of liberty since it was by the authority and influence of great men that their stripling sons were first received by the humble depending boroughs or the complying counties they called it as many do still the best school for young men now experience hath showed us that it is like a school only in this respect that these youngsters when they are admitted deserve to be whipped in it if the house of commons is a school it must be for men of riper age these are too young to learn there and being elevated by a mistaken smattering in small politics they grow too supercilious to learn anywhere else so that instead of improving young promising plants they are destroyed by being misplaced if then they do themselves hurt by it it is sure yet that they do the house no good by coming into it they were not green geese that are said to have saved the capital they were certainly of full age or else their cackling could not have been heard so as to give warning indeed it looked of late when the fashion was to have long continued parliaments as if we might plant a boy in the house with a prospect that he might continue there till he had gray hairs and that the same sapling might have such a root as that he might grow up to be timber without being removed if these young men had skill enough to pitch upon somebody in the house to whom they might resign their opinion and upon whose judgment they might lean without reserve there might be less objection but to speak truth they know as little how to choose as those did who elected them so that there is no other expedient left than the letting them alone one may say generally speaking that a young man being too soon qualified for the serious business of parliaments would really be no good symptom it is a sign of too much phlegm and too little fire in the beginning of age if men have not a little more heat than is convenient for as they grow older they will run a hazard of not having so much as is necessary the truth is the vigor of youth is softened and misapplied when it is not spent either in war or close studies all other courses have an idle mixture that cometh to nothing and maketh them like trees which for want of pruning run up to wood and seldom or never bear any fruit to conclude this head it must be owned that there is no age of our life which doth not carry arguments along with it to humble us and therefore it would be well for the business of the world if young men would stay longer before they went into it and old men not so long before they went out of it ten next to these may be ranked a sort of superfine gentlemen carpet knights men whose heads may be said to be only appurtenances to their perukes which entirely engross all their care and application their understanding is so strictly appropriated to their dress that no part of it is upon pain of their utmost displeasure to be diverted to any other use it is not by this intended to recommend an affected clown or to make it a necessary qualification for a member of parliament that he must renounce clean linen or good manners but surely a too earnest application to make everything sit right about them striketh too deep into their small stock of thoughts to allow it furniture for anything else to do right to these fine-spun gentlemen business is too coarse a thing for them which maketh it an unreasonable hardship upon them to oppress them with it so that in tenderness to them no less than out of care to the public it is best to leave them to their tailors with whom they will live in much better correspondence when the danger is prevented of their falling out about privileges eleven 
men of injustice and violence in their private dealings are not to be trusted by the people with a commission to treat for them in parliament in the fourth of edward third the king commandeth in his writs not to choose any knights who had been guilty of crime or maintenance these warm men seldom fail to run into maintenance taken in a larger extent it is an unnatural sound to come from a man that is arbitrary in his neighborhood to talk of laws and liberties at westminster he is not a proper vehicle for such words which ought never to be profaned an habitual breaker of the laws to be made one of the law-makers is as if the benches in westminster hall should be filled with men out of newgate those who are of this temper cannot change their nature out of respect to their country quite contrary they will less scruple to do wrong to a nation where no body taketh it to himself than to particular men to whose resentments they are more immediately exposed in short they lie under such strong objections that the overbalance of better men cannot altogether purify an assembly where these unclean beasts are admitted twelve excessive spenders and unreasonable savers are to be excluded being both greedy from differing causes they are both of them diseases of infection and for that reason are not to be admitted into public assemblies a prodigal man must be greedy because he thinketh he can never spend enough the wretch must be so because he will never think he can hoard enough the world first admireth men's wisdom for getting money and then raileth at them if they do not throw it away so that the prodigal man is only the less unpopular extreme he is every jot as well prepared as the miser to fall out with his morals when once a good temptation is offered him to lay them aside on the other side some rich men are as eager to overtake those that are richer as a running horse is to get to the race-post before the other that contendeth with him men often desire to heap rather because others have more than that they know what to do with that which they covet with so much impatience so that it is plain the fancy hath as great a share in this imaginary pleasure of gathering as it hath in love ambition or any other passion it is pretty sure that as no man was ever the richer for having a good estate if he did not look after it so neither will he be the honester if he hath never so much want of care will always create want of money so that whether a man is a beggar because he never had any money or because he can never keep any it is all one to those who are to trust him upon this head of prodigality it may be no unreasonable caution to be afraid of those who in former service have been extravagantly liberal to the public money trusting is so hazardous a thing that it should never be done but where it is necessary so that when trustees are found upon trial to be very lavish even without examining into the causes of it which are generally very suspicious it is a reasonable part of preventing wit to change hands or else the choosers will pay the penalty that belongeth to good nature so misplaced and the consequences will be attended with the aggravation of their not being made wiser by such a severe and costly warning thirteen it would be of very great use to take a general resolution throughout the kingdom that none should be chosen for a county but such as have either in possession or reversion a considerable estate in it nor for a borough except he be resiant or that he hath some estate in the county in present or expectancy there have been eminent men of law who were of opinion that in the case of a burgess of a town not resiant the court is to give judgment according to the statute notwithstanding custom to the contrary but not to insist now upon that the prudential part is argument enough to set up a rule to abrogate an ill custom there is not perhaps a greater cause of the corruption of parliaments than by adopting members who may be said to have no title by their births 
the juries are by the law to be ex vicinato and shall there be less care that the representatives of the people be so too sure the interest of the county is best placed in the hands of such as have some share in it the outliers are not so easily kept within the pale of the laws they are often chosen without being known which is more like choosing valentines than members of parliament the motive of their standing is more justly to be supposed that they may redress their own grievances which they know than those of the country to which they are strangers they are chosen at london to serve in cornwall etc and are often parties before they come to be representatives one would think the reproach it is for a county not to have men within their own circle to serve them in parliament should be argument enough to reject these trespassers without urging the ill consequences in other respects of their being admitted fourteen as in some cases it is advisable to give a total exclusion to men not fitly qualified so in others it is more proper to lay down a general rule of caution with allowance of some exceptions where men have given such proofs of themselves as create a right for them to be distinguished of this nature is that which i shall say concerning lawyers who by the same reason that they may be useful may be also very dangerous the negligence and want of application in gentlemen hath made them to be thought more necessary than naturally they are in parliament they have not only engrossed the chair of the speaker but that of a committee is hardly thought to be well filled except it be by a man of the robe this maketh it worthy of the more serious reflection of all gentlemen that it may be an argument to them to qualify themselves in parliamentary learning in such a manner as that they may rely upon their own abilities in order to the serving their country but to come to the point in question it is not without precedent that practising lawyers have been excluded from serving in parliament and without following those patterns strictly i cannot but think it reasonable that whilst a parliament sitteth no member of parliament should plead at any bar the reason of it is in many respects strong in itself and is grown much stronger by the long sitting parliaments of late but i will not dwell upon this the matter now in question being concerning lawyers being elected which i conceive should be done with so much circumspection that probably it would not often happen if lawyers have great practice that ought to take them up if not it is no great sign of their ability and at the same time giveth a suspicion that they may be more liable to be tempted if it should be so in fact that no king ever wanted judges to soften the stiffness of the laws that were made so as to make them suit better with the reason of state and the convenience of the government it is no injury now to suppose it possible for lawyers in the house of commons so to behave themselves in the making of new laws as the better to make way for the having their robes lined with fur they are men used to argue on both sides of a question and if ordinary fees can inspire them with very good reasons in a very ill cause that faculty exercised in parliaments where it may be better encouraged may prove very inconvenient to those that choose them and therefore without arraigning a profession that it would be scandalous for a man not to honor one may by a suspicion which is the more excusable when it is in the behalf of the people imagine that the habit of taking money for their opinion may create in some such a forgetfulness to distinguish that they may take it for their vote they are generally men who by a laborious study hope to be advanced they have it in their eye as a reward for the toil they undergo this maketh them generally very slow and ill disposed let the occasion never so much require it to wrestle with that soil where preferment groweth now if the supposition be in itself not unreasonable and that it should happen to be strengthened and confirmed by experience it will be very unnecessary to say any more upon this article but leave it to the election to consider of it fifteen i cannot forbear to put in a caveat against men tied to a party 
there must in every body be a leaning to that sort of men who profess some principles more than to others who go upon a different foundation but when a man is drowned in a party plunged in it beyond his depth he runneth a great hazard of being upon ill terms with good sense or morality if not with both of them such a man can hardly be called a free agent and for that reason is very unfit to be trusted with the people's liberty after he hath given up his own it is said that in some part of the indies they do so affect little feet that they keep them squeezed while they are children so that they stay at that small size after they are grown men one may say something like this of men locked up in a party they put their thoughts into such a narrow mould that they can never be enlarged nor released from their first confinements men in a party have liberty only for their motto in reality they are greater slaves than anybody else would care to make them a party even in times of peace though against the original contract and the bill of rights sets up and continues the exercise of martial law once enrolled the man that quitteth if they had their will would be hanged for a deserter they communicate anger to one another by contagion and it may be said that if too much light dazzleth the eyesight too much heat doth not less weaken the judgment heat reigneth in the fancy and reason which is a colder faculty of the brain taketh more time to be heard than the other will allow the heat of a party is like the burning of a fever and not a natural warmth evenly distributed to give life and vigor there was a time indeed when anger showed a good sign of honesty but that evidence is very much weakened by instances we have seen since the days of yore and the public spirited color hath been thrown off within the time of memory and lost almost all its credit with some people since they found what governments thought fit to make their so doing a step to their preferment a strong blustering wind seldom continues long in one corner some men knock loud only to be let in the bustle they make is animated by their private interest the outward blaze only is for religion and liberty the true lasting fire like that of the vestals which never went out is an eagerness to get somewhat for themselves a house of commons composed of such men would be more probably so many merchants incorporated in a regular company to make their particular adventures than men sent from the people to serve and represent them there are some splenetic gentlemen who confine their favorable opinion within so narrow a compass that they will not allow it to any man that was not hanged in the late reigns now by that rule one might expect they should rescue themselves from the disadvantage of being now alive and by abdicating a world so little worthy of them get a great name to themselves with the general satisfaction of all those they would leave behind them amongst the many other ill consequences of a stated party it is none of the least that it tempteth low and insignificant men to come upon the stage to expose themselves and to spoil business it turneth a cipher into a figure such an one as it is a man in a party is able to make a noise let it be never so empty a sound a weak man is easily blown out of his small senses by being mustered into a party he is flattered till he liketh himself so well that he taketh it extremely ill if he hath not an employment nothing is more in fashion than for men to desire good places and i doubt nothing is less so than to deserve them from nobody to somebody is such a violent stride that nature which hath the negative voice will not give its royal assent to it so that when insufficient men aim at being in business the worst of their enemies might out of malice to them pray for their preferment there could be no end if one did not stop till this theme had no more matter to furnish 
i will only say nothing is more evident than that the good of the nation hath been sacrificed to the animosities of several contending parties and without entering into the dispute which of them are more or less in the right it is pretty sure that whilst these opposite sets of angry men are playing at football they will break all the windows and do more hurt than their pretended zeal for the nation will ever make amends for in short a man so engaged is retained before the people take him for their counsel he hath such a reserve for his party that it is not advisable for those who would choose him to depend upon his professions all parties assuming such a dispensing power that by their sovereign authority they cancel and dissolve any act or promise that they do not afterwards approve these things considered those who will choose such men deserve whatever followeth sixteen pretenders to exorbitant merit in the late revolution are not without objection against them when they stand to serve in parliament it would not only be a low but a criminal kind of envy to deny a distinguishing justice to men who have been instrumental and active when the service of their country required it but there ought to be moderation in men's claims or else it is out of the power of our poor island to satisfy them it is true service of all kinds is grown much dearer like laborers wages which formerly occasioned several statutes to regulate them but now the men who only carried mortar to the building when it is finished think they are ill dealt with if they are not made master workmen they presently cry out the original contract is broken if their merit is not rewarded at their own rate too some will think there never ought to be an end of their rewards when indifferent judges would perhaps be puzzled to find out the beginning of their merit they bring in such large bills that they must be examined some bounds must be put to men's pretensions else the nation which is to pay the reckoning will every way think it a scurvy thing to be undone whether it be by being overrun by our enemies or by being exhausted by our friends there ought therefore to be deductions where they are reasonable the better to justify the paying what remaineth for example if any of these passionate lovers of the protestant religion should not think fit in their manner of living to give the least evidence of their morality their claims upon that head might sure be struck off without any injustice to them if there are any who set down great sums as a reward due to their zeal for rescuing property from the jaws of arbitrary power their pretensions may fairly be rejected if now they are so far from showing a care and tenderness of the laws that they look rather like counsel retained on the other side it is no less strange than i doubt it is true that some men should be so in love with their dear mistress old england with all her wrinkles as out of an heroic passion to swim over to rescue her from being ravaged and when they have done the feat the first thing after enjoyment is that they go about to strangle her for the sake of true love it is not fit that such ungenteel gallants should be too much encouraged and their arrogance for having done well at first will have no right to be excused if their so doing ill at last doth not make them a little more modest true merit like a river the deeper it is the less noise it maketh these loud proclaimers of their own deserts are not only to be suspected for their truth but the electors are to consider that such meritorious men lay an assessment upon those that choose them the public taxes are already heavy enough without the addition of these private reckonings it is therefore the safer way not to employ men who will expect more for their wages than the mistaken borough that sendeth them up to parliament could be sold for seventeen with all due regard to the noblest of callings military officers are out of their true element when they are misplaced in a house of commons things in this world ought to be well suited there are some appearances so unnatural that men are convinced by them without any other argument the very habit in some cases 
recommendeth or giveth offence if the judges upon the bench should instead of their furs which signify gravity and bespeak respect be clothed like the jockeys at newmarket or wear jackboots and steenkirks they would not in reality have less law but mankind would be so struck with this unusual object that it would be a great while before they could think it possible to receive justice from men so accoutred it is to some degree the same thing in this case such martial habits blue coats red stocking etc make them look very unlike grave senators one would almost swear they were creatures apart and of a differing species from the rest of the body in former times when only the recent shopkeeper was to represent his corporation which by the way is the law still at this day the military looks of one of these sons of mars would have stared the quaking member down again to his borough now the number of them is so increased that the peaceable part of the house may lawfully swear they are in fear of their lives from such an awful appearance of men of war it maketh the room look like a guard-house by such an ill-suited mixture but this is only the outside the bark of the argument the root goeth yet deeper against choosing such men whose talents ought to be otherwise applied their two capacities are so inconsistent that men's undertaking to serve both the cures will be the cause in a little time that we shall neither have men of war nor men of business good in their several kinds an officer is to give up his liberty to obey orders and it is necessarily incident to his calling that he should do so a member of parliament is originally to be tender of his own liberty that other men may the better trust him with theirs an officer is to enable himself by his courage improved by skill and experience to support the laws if invaded when they are made but he is not supposed to be at leisure enough to understand how they should be made a member of parliament is to fill his thoughts with what may best conduce to the civil administration which is enough to take up the whole man let him be never so much raised above the ordinary level these two opposite qualifications being placed in one man make him such an ambiguous divided creature that he doth not know how to move it is best to keep men within their proper sphere few men have understanding enough exactly to fill even one narrow circle fewer are able to fill two especially when they are both of so great compass and that they are so contrary in their own natures the wages he hath as a member and those he receiveth as an officer are paid for services that are very differing and in the doubt which of them should be preferably performed it is likely the greater salary may direct him without the further inducements of complying most where he may expect most advantage by it in short if his dependence is not very great it will make him a scurvy officer if it is great it will make him a scurvier member eighteen men under the scandal of being thought private pensioners are too fair a mark to escape being considered in reference to the point in question in case of plain evidence it is not to be supposed possible that men convicted of such a crime should ever again be elected the difficulty is in determining what is to be done in case of suspicion there are suspicions so well grounded that they may pretend to have the force of proofs provided the penalty goeth only to the forbearing to trust but not extending it so far as to punish there must be some things plain and express to justify the latter but circumstances may be sufficient for the former as where men have had such sudden cures of their ill humours and opposition to the court that it is out of the way of ordinary methods of recovery from such distempers which have a much slower progress it must naturally be imputed to some specific that maketh such a quick alteration of the whole mass of blood where men have raised their way of living without any visible means to support them in it a suspicion is justified even by the example of the law 
which in cases of this kind though of an inferior nature doth upon this foundation not only raise inferences but inflict punishments where men are immoral and scandalous in their lives and dispense familiarly with the rules by which the world is governed for the better preserving the bonds of human society it must be a confidence very ill placed to conclude it impossible for such men to yield to a temptation well offered and pursued when the truth is the habit of such bon vivant which is the fashionable word maketh a suspicion so likely that it is very hard to believe it to be true if there should be nothing but the general report even that is not to be neglected common fame is the only liar that deserveth to have some respect still reserved to it though she telleth many an untruth she often hitteth right and most especially when she speaketh ill of men her credit hath sometimes been carried too far when it hath gone to the divesting men of anything of which they were possessed without more express evidence to justify such a proceeding if there was a doubt whether there ever was any corruption of this kind it would alter the question but sure that will not bear the being controverted we are told that charles v sent over into england one million two hundred thousand crowns to be distributed amongst the leading men to encourage them to carry on elections here was the protestant religion to be bought out for a valuable consideration according to law though not according to gospel which exalteth it above any price that can be set upon it now except we had reason to believe that the virtue of the world is improved since that time we can as little doubt that such temptations may be offered as that they may be received it will be owned that there is to be a great tenderness in suspecting but it must be allowed at the same time that there ought not to be less in trusting where the people are so much concerned especially when the penalty upon the party suspected goeth no further than a suspension of that confidence which it is necessary to have in those who are to represent the nation in parliament nineteen i cannot omit the giving a caution against admitting men to be chosen who have places of any value there needeth the less to be said upon this article the truth of the proposition being supported by such plain arguments sure no man hath such a plentiful spring of thought as that all that floweth from it is too much to be applied to the business of parliament it is not less sure that a member of parliament of all others ought not to be exempted from the rule that no man should serve two masters it doth so split a man's thoughts that no man can know how to make a fitting distribution of them to two such differing capacities it exposeth men to be suspected and tempted more than is convenient for the public service or for the mutual good opinion of one another which there ought to be in such an assembly it either giveth a real dependence upon the government which is inconsistent with the necessity there is that a member of parliament should be disengaged or at least it hath the appearance of it which maketh them not look like free men though they should have virtue enough to be so more reasons would lessen the weight of this last which is that a bill to this effect commonly called the self-denying bill passed even this last house of commons a greater demonstration of the irresistible strength of truth cannot possibly be given so that a copy of that bill in every county or borough would hardly fail of discouraging such pretenders from standing or at least it would prevent their success if their own modesty should not restrain them from attempting it twenty if distinctions may be made upon particular men or remarks fixed upon their votes in parliament they must be allowed in relation to those gentlemen who for reasons best known to themselves thought fit to be against the triennial bill the liberty of opinion is the thing in the world that ought least to be controlled and especially in parliament but as that is an undoubted assertion it is not less so that when men sin against their own light 
give a vote against their own thought they must not plead privilege of parliament against the being arraigned for it by others after they are convicted of it by themselves there cannot be a man who in his definition of a house of commons will state it to be an assembly that for the better redressing of grievances the people feel and for the better furnishing such supplies as they can bear is to continue if the king so pleaseth for his whole reign this could be as little intended as to throw all into one hand and to renounce the claim to any liberty but so much as the sovereign authority would allow it destroyeth the end of parliaments it maketh use of the letter of the law to extinguish the life of it it is in truth some kind of disparagement to so plain a thing that so much has been said and written upon it and one may say it is such an affront to these gentlemen's understandings to censure this vote only as a mistake that as the age goeth it is less discredit to them to call it by its right name and if that is rightly understood by those who are to choose them i suppose they will let them exercise their liberty of conscience at home and not make men their trustees who in this solemn instance have such an unwillingness to surrender it must be owned that this bill hath met with very hard fortune and yet that doth not in the least diminish the value of it it had in it such a root of life that it might be said it was not dead but slept and we see that the last session it was revived and animated by the royal assent when once fully informed of the consequence as well as of the justice of it in the meantime after having told my opinion who ought not to be chosen if i should be asked who ought to be my answer must be choose englishmen and when i have said that to deal honestly i will not undertake that they are easy to be found end of some cautions offered to the consideration of those who are to choose members to serve for the ensuing parliament read by john greenman This is section 19 of The Complete Works of George Saville, First Marquess of Halifax. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Rough Draft of a New Model at Sea, 1694. I will make no other introduction to the following discourse than that, as the importance of our being strong at sea was ever very great, so in our present circumstances, it is grown to be much greater because as formerly our force of shipping contributed greatly to our trade and safety so now it is become indispensably necessary to our very being it may be said now to england martha martha thou art busy about many things but one thing is necessary to the question what shall we do to be saved in this world there is no other answer but this look to your moat the first article of an englishman's political creed must be that he believeth in the sea etc without that there needeth no general counsel to pronounce him incapable of salvation here we are in an island confined to it by god almighty not as a penalty but a grace and one of the greatest that can be given to mankind happy confinement that hath made us free rich and quiet a fair portion in this world and very well worth the preserving a figure that ever hath been envied and could never be imitated by our neighbours our situation hath made greatness abroad by land conquests unnatural things to us it is true we have made excursions and glorious ones too which make our names great in history but they did not last admit the english to be giants in courage yet they must not hope to succeed in making war against heaven 
which seemeth to have enjoined them to acquiesce in being happy within their own circle it is no paradox to say that england hath its root in the sea and a deep one too from whence it sendeth its branches into both the indies we may say further in our present case that if allegiance is due to protection ours to the sea is due from that rule since by that and by that alone we are to be protected and if we have of late suffered usurpation of other methods contrary to the homage we owe to that which must preserve us it is time now to restore the sea to its right and as there is no repentance effectual without amendment so there is not a moment to be lost in the going about it it is not pretended to launch into such a voluminous treatise as to set down everything to which so comprehensive a subject might lead me for as the sea hath little less variety in it than the land so the naval force of england extendeth itself into a great many branches each of which are important enough to require a discourse apart and peculiarly applied to it but there must be preference to some considerations above others when the weight of them is so visibly superior that it cannot be contested it is there first that the foundations are to be laid of our naval o economy amongst these there is one article which in its own nature must be allowed to be the cornerstone of the building the choice of officers with the discipline and encouragement belonging to them upon this head only i shall then take the liberty to venture my opinion into the world with a real submission to those who may offer anything better for the advantage of the public the first question then will be out of what sort of men the officers of the fleet are to be chosen and this immediately leadeth us to the present controversy between the gentlemen and the torpolins the usual objections on both sides are too general to be relied upon partiality and common prejudices direct most men's opinions without entering into the particular reasons which ought to be the ground of it there is so much ease in acquiescing in generals that the ignorance of those who cannot distinguish and the largeness of those who will not maketh men very apt to decline the trouble of stricter inquiries which they think too great a price for being in the right let it be never so valuable this maketh them judge in the lump and either let their opinions swim along with the stream of the world or give them up wholly to be directed by success the effect of this is that they change their minds upon every present uneasiness wanting a steady foundation upon which their judgment should be formed this is a perching upon the twigs of things and not going to the root but sure the matter in question deserveth to be examined in another manner since so much dependeth upon it to state the thing impartially it must be owned that it seemeth to lie fairest for the tarpaulin it giveth an impression that must have so much weight as to make a man's opinion lean very much on that side it carrieth so much authority with it it seemeth to be so unquestionable that those are fittest to command at sea who have not only made it their calling but their element that there must naturally be a prejudice to anything then can be said against it there must therefore be some reason extraordinary to support the argument on the other side or else the gentlemen could never enter the lists against such a violent objection which seemeth not to be resisted i will introduce my argument with an assertion which as i take to be true almost in all cases so it is necessary to be explained and enforced in this the assertion is that there is hardly a single proposition to be made which is not deceitful and the tying our reason too close to it may in many cases be destructive circumstances must come in and are to be made a part of the matter of which we are to judge positive decisions are always dangerous more especially in politics a man who will be master of an argument must do like a skilful general who sendeth scouts on all sides to see whether there may not be an enemy 
so he must look round to see what objections can be made and not go in a straight line which is the ready way to lead him into a mistake before then that we conclude what sort of men are fittest to command at sea a principle is to be laid down that there is a differing consideration to be had of such a subject matter as is in itself distinct and independent and of such an one as being a limb of a body or a wheel of a frame there is a necessity of suiting it to the rest and preserving the harmony of the whole a man must not in that case restrain himself to the separate consideration of that single part but must take care it may fall in and agree with the shape of the whole creature of which it is a member according to this proposition which i take to be indisputable it will not i hope appear an affectation or an extravagant fit of unseasonable politics if before i enter into the particular state of the present question i say something of the government of england and make that the groundwork of what sort of men are most proper to be made use of to command at sea the forms of government to which england must be subjected are either absolute monarchy a commonwealth or a mixed monarchy as it is now with those natural alterations that the exigency of affairs may from time to time suggest as to absolute monarchy i will not allow myself to be transported into such invectives as are generally made against it neither am i ready to enter into the aggravating style of calling everything slavery that restraineth men in any part of their freedom one may discern in this as in most other things the good and bad of it we see by too near an instance that france doth by it it doth not only struggle with the rest of christendom but is in a fair way of giving law to it this is owing in great measure to a despotic and undivided power the uncontrollable authority of the directive councils maketh everything move without disorder or opposition which must give an advantage that is plain enough of itself without being proved by the melancholy experience we have of it at this time i see and admire this yet i consider at the same time that all things of this kind are comparative that as on one side without government men cannot enjoy what belongeth to them in particular nor can a nation be secure or preserve itself in general so on the other side the end of government being that mankind should live in some competent state of freedom it is very unnatural to have the end destroyed by the means that were originally made use of to attain it in this respect something is to be ventured rather than submit to such a precarious state of life as would make it a burden to a reasonable creature and therefore after i have owned the advantages in some kind of an unlimited government yet while they are attended with so many other discouraging circumstances i cannot think but that they may be bought too dear and if it should be so that it is not possible for a state to be great and glorious unless the subjects are wretchedly miserable i am not ashamed to own my low-spirited frailty in preferring such a model of government as may agree with the reasonable enjoyment of a free people before such a one by which empire is to be extended at such an unnatural price besides whatever men's opinions may be one way or another in the general question there is an argument in our case that shutteth the door to any answer to it viz we cannot subsist under a despotic power our very being would be destroyed by it for we are to consider we are a very little spot in the map of the world and make a great figure only by trade which is the creature of liberty one destroyed the other falleth to the ground by a natural consequence that will not admit a dispute if we would be measured by our acres we are poor inconsiderable people we are exalted above our natural bounds by our good laws and our excellent constitution by this we are not only happy at home but considerable abroad our situation our humor our trade do all concur to strengthen this argument 
so that all other reasons must give place to such a one as maketh it out that there is no mean between a free nation and no nation we are no more a people nor england can no longer keep its name from the moment that our liberties are extinguished the vital strength that should support us being withdrawn we should then be no more than the carcass of a nation with no other security than that of contempt and to subsist upon no other tenure than that we should be below the giving temptation to our stronger neighbors to devour us in my judgment therefore there is such a short decision to be made upon this subject that in relation to england an absolute monarchy is as unreasonable a thing to be wished as i hope it will be impossible to be obtained it must be considered in the next place whether england is likely to be turned into a commonwealth it is hard at any time to determine what will be the shape of the next revolution much more at this time would it be inexcusably arrogant to undertake it who can foresee whether it will be from without or from within or from both whether with or without the concurrence of the people whether regularly produced or violently imposed i shall not therefore magisterially declare it impossible that a commonwealth should be settled here but i may give my humble opinion that according to all appearances it is very improbable i will first lay it down for a principle that it is not a sound way of arguing to say that if it can be out that the form of a commonwealth will best suit with the interest of the nation it must for that reason of necessity prevail i will not deny but that interest will not lie is a right maxim wherever it is sure to be understood else one had as good a firm that no man in particular nor mankind in general can ever be mistaken a nation is a great while before they can see and generally they must feel first before their sight is quite cleared this maketh it so long before they can see their interest that for the most part it is too late for them to pursue it if men must be supposed always to follow their true interest it must be meant of a new manufactory of mankind by god almighty there must be some new clay the old stuff never yet made any such infallible creature this being premised it is to be inquired whether instead of inclination or a leaning towards a commonwealth there is not in england a general dislike to it if this be so as i take it to be by a very great disparity in numbers it will be in vain to dispute the reason whilst humor is against it allowing the weight that is due to the argument which may be alleged for it yet if the herd is against it the going about to convince them would have no other effect than to show that nothing can be more impertinent than good reasons when they are misplaced or ill-timed i must observe that there must be some previous dispositions in all great changes to facilitate and to make way for them i think it not at all absurd to affirm that such resolutions are seldom made at all except by the general preparations of men's minds they are half made before it is plainly visible that men go about them though it seemeth to me that this argument alone maketh all others unnecessary yet i must take notice that besides what hath been said upon this subject there are certain preliminaries to the first building a commonwealth some materials absolutely necessary for the carrying on such a fabric which at present are wanting amongst us i mean virtue morality diligence or at least hypocrisy now this age is so plain dealing as not to dissemble so far as to an outward pretense of qualities which seem at present so unfashionable and under so much discountenance from hence we may draw a plain and natural inference that a commonwealth is not fit for us because we are not fit for a commonwealth this being granted the supposition of this form of government of england with all its consequences as to the present question must be excluded and 
absolute monarchy having been so too by the reasons at once alleged it will without further examination fall to a mixed government as we now are i will not say that there is never to be any alteration the constitution of the several parts that concur to make up the frame of the present government may be altered in many things in some for the better and in others perhaps for the worse according as circumstances shall arise to induce a change and as passion and interest shall have more or less influence upon the public councils but still if it remaineth in the whole so far a mixed monarchy that there shall be a restraint upon the prince as to the exercise of a despotic power it is enough to make it a groundwork for the present question it appeareth then that a bounded monarchy is that kind of government which will most probably prevail and continue in england from whence it must follow as hath been hinted before that every considerable part ought to be so composed as the better to induce to the preserving the harmony of the whole constitution the navy is of so great importance that it would be disparaged by calling it less than the life and soul of government therefore to apply the argument to the subject we are upon in case the officers be all tarpaulins it would be in reality too great a tendency to a commonwealth such a part of the constitution being democratically disposed may be suspected to endeavor to bring it into that shape and where the influence must be so strong the supposition will be the more justifiable in short if the maritime force which is the only thing that can defend us should be wholly directed by the lower sort of men with an entire exclusion of the nobility and gentry it would not be easy to answer the argument supported by so great a probability that such a scheme would not only lean toward a democracy but directly lead us into it let us now examine the contrary proposition viz that all officers should be gentlemen here the objection lieth so fair of its introducing an arbitrary government that it is as little to be answered in that respect as the former is in the other gentlemen in a general definition will be suspected to lie more than other men under temptations of being made instruments of unlimited power their relations their way of living their taste of the entertainments of the court inspire an ambition that generally draweth their inclinations toward it besides the gratifying of their interests men of quality are often taken with the ornaments of government the splendor dazzled them so as that their judgments are surprised by it and there will be always some that have so little remorse for invading other men's liberties that it maketh them less solicitous to preserve their own these things throw them naturally into such a dependence as might give a dangerous bias if they alone were in command at sea it would make that great wheel turn by an irregular motion and instead of being the chief means of preserving the whole frame might come to be the chief instruments to discompose and dissolve it the two former exclusive propositions being necessarily to be excluded in this question there remaineth no other expedient neither can any other conclusion be drawn from the argument as it hath been stated than that there must be a mixture in the navy of gentlemen and tarpaulins as there is in the constitution of the government of power and liberty this mixture is not to be so rigorously defined as to set down the exact proportion there is to be of each the greater or lesser number must be directed by circumstances of which the government is to judge and which make it improper to set such bounds as that upon no occasion it shall on either side be lessened or enlarged it is possible the men of wapping may think they are injured by giving them any partners in the dominion of the sea they may take it unkindly to be jostled in their own element by men of such a different education that they may be said to be of another species they will be apt to think it an usurpation upon them and notwithstanding the instances that are against them 
and which give a kind of prescription on the other side they will not easily acquiesce in what they conceive to be a hardship to them but i shall in a good measure reconcile myself to them by what follows viz the gentlemen shall not be capable of bearing office at sea except they be tarpaulins too that is to say except they are so trained up by a continued habit of living at sea that they may have a right to be admitted free denizens of wapping upon this dependeth the whole matter and indeed here lieth the difficulty because the gentlemen brought up under the connivance of a looser discipline and of an easier admittance will take it heavily to be reduced within the fetters of such a new model and i conclude they will be so extremely averse to that which they call an unreasonable yoke upon them that their original consent is never to be expected but if it appeareth to be convenient and which is more that it is necessary for the preservation of the whole that it should be so the government must be called in aid to suppress these first boilings of discontent the rules must be imposed with such authority and the execution of them must be so well supported that by degrees their impatience will be subdued and they will concur in an establishment to which they will every day be more reconciled they will find it will take away the objections which are now thrown upon them of setting up for masters without having ever been apprentices or at least without having served out their time mankind naturally swelleth against favor and partiality their belief of their own merit maketh men object them to a prosperous competitor even when there is no pretense for it but when there is the least handle offered to be sure it will be taken so in this case when a gentleman is preferred at sea the tarpaulin is very apt to impute it to friend or favor but if that gentleman hath before his preferment passed through all the steps which lead to it so that he smelleth as much of pitch and tar as those that were swaddled in sailcloth his having an escutcheon will be so far from doing him harm that it will set him upon the advantage ground it will draw a real respect to his quality when so supported and give him an influence and authority infinitely superior to that which the mere seaman can ever pretend to when a gentleman hath learned how to obey he will grow very much fitter to command his own memory will advise him not to inflict too rigorous punishments he will better resist the temptations of authority which are great when he reflecteth how much he hath at other times wished it might be gently exercised when he was liable to the rigor of it when the undistinguished discipline of a ship hath tamed the young mastership which is apt to arise from a gentleman's birth and education he then groweth proud in the right place and valueth himself first upon knowing his duty and then upon doing it in plain english men of quality in their several degrees must either restore themselves to a better opinion both for morality and diligence or else quality itself will be in danger of being extinguished the original gentleman is almost lost in strictness when posterity doth not still further adorn by their virtue the escutcheon their ancestors first got for them by their merit they deserve the penalty of being deprived of it to expect that quality alone should waft men up into places and employments is as unreasonable as to think that a ship because it is carved and gilded should be fit to go to sea without sails or tackling but when a gentleman maketh no other use of his quality than to incite him the more to his duty it will give such a true and settled superiority as must destroy all competition from those that are below him it is time now to go to the probationary qualifications of an officer at sea and i have some to offer which i have digested in my thoughts i hope impartially that they may not be speculative notions but things easy and practicable if the directing powers will give due countenance and encouragement to the execution of them but whilst i am going about to set them down though this little essay was made to no other end than to introduce them i am upon better recollection 
induced to put a restraint upon myself and rather retract the promise i made at the beginning than by advising the particular methods by which i conceive the good end that is aimed at may be obtained to incur the imputation of the thing of the world of which i would least be guilty which is of anticipating by my private opinion the judgment of the parliament or seeming out of slender stock of reason to dictate to the supreme wisdom of the nation they will no doubt consider the present establishments for discipline at sea which are many of them very good and if well executed might go a great way in present question but i will not say they are so perfect but that others may be added to make them more effectual and that some more supplemental expedients may be necessary to complete what is yet defective and whenever the parliament shall think fit to take this matter into their consideration i am sure they will not want for their direction the auxiliary reasons of any man without doors much less of one whose thoughts are so entirely and unaffectedly resigned to whatever they shall determine in this or anything else relating to the public end of a rough draft of a new model at sea sixteen ninety four read by john greenman this is section twenty of the complete works of george savile first marquis of halifax this librivox recording is in the public domain maxims of state one that a prince who falleth out with laws breaketh with his best friends two that the exalting his own authority above his laws is like letting in his enemy to surprise his gods the laws are the only gods he can be sure will never run away from him three a prince that will say he can do no good except he may do everything teaches the people to say they are slaves if they must not do whatever they have a mind to four that power and liberty are like heat and moisture where they are well mixed everything prospers where they are single they are destructive five that arbitrary power is like most other things that are very hard they are also very apt to break six that the profit of places should be measured as they are more or less conducing to the public service and if business is more necessary than splendor the instrument of it ought in proportion to be better paid that the contrary method is as impertinent as it would be to let the carving of a ship cost more than all the rest of it seven that where the least useful part of the people have the most credit with the prince men will conclude that the way to get everything is to be good for nothing eight that an extravagant gift to one man raiseth the market to everybody else so that in consequence the unlimited bounty of an unthinking prince maketh him a beggar let him have never so much money nine that if ordinary beggars are whipped the daily beggars in fine clothes out of proportionable respect to their quality ought to be hanged ten that pride is as loud a beggar as want and a great deal more saucy eleven that a prince who will give more to importunity than merit had as good set out a proclamation to all his loving subjects forbidding them to do well upon the penalty of being undone by it twelve that a wise prince will not oblige his courtiers who are birds of prey so as to disoblige his people who are beasts of burden thirteen that it is safer for a prince to judge of men by what they do to one another than what they do to him fourteen that it is a gross mistake to think that a knave between man and man can be honest to a king whom of all others men generally make the least scruple to deceive fifteen 
that a prince who can ever trust the man that hath once deceived him loseth the right of being faithfully dealt with by any other person sixteen that it is not possible for a prince to find out such an honest knave as will let nobody else cheat him seventeen that if a prince doth not show an aversion to knaves there will be an inference that will be very natural let it be never so unmannerly eighteen that a prince who followeth his own opinion too soon is in danger of repenting it too late nineteen that it is less dangerous for a prince to mind too much what the people say than too little twenty that a prince is to take care that the greater part of the people may not be angry at the same time for though the first beginning of their ill humour should be against one another yet if not stopped it will naturally end in anger against him twenty one that if princes would reflect how much they are in power of their ministers they would be more circumspect in the choice of them twenty two that a wise prince will support good servants against men's anger and not support ill ones against their complaint twenty three that parties in a state generally like freebooters hang out false colors the pretense is the public good the real business is to catch prizes like the tartars wherever they succeed instead of improving their victory they presently fall upon the baggage twenty four that a prince may play so long between two parties that they may in time join together and be in earnest with him twenty five that there is more dignity in open violence than in unskilful cunning of a prince who goeth about to impose upon the people twenty six that the people will ever suspect the remedies for the diseases of the state where they are wholly excluded from seeing how they are prepared twenty seven that changing hands without changing measures is as if a drunkard in a dropsy should change his doctors and not his diet twenty eight that a prince is to watch that his reason may not be so subdued by his nature as not to be so much a man of peace as to be a jest in an army nor so much a man of war as to be out of his element in his council twenty nine that a man who cannot mind his own business is not to be trusted with the king's thirty that quality alone should only serve to make a show in the embroidered part of the government but that ignorance though never so well born should never be admitted to spoil the public business thirty one that he who thinks his place below him will certainly be below his place thirty two that when a prince's example ceaseth to have the force of a law it is a sure sign that his power is wasting and that there is but little distance between men's neglecting to imitate and their refusing to obey thirty three that a people may let a king fall yet still remain a people but if a king let his people slip from him he is no longer a king End of Maxims of State This is section 21 of The Complete Works of George Saville, First Marquis of Halifax. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Advertisement and A Letter Sent by His Lordship to Charles Cotton, Esquire, Upon His New Translation and Dedication of Montaigne's Essays. Advertisement since the death of the ingenious translator of these essays an imperfect transcript of the following letter was intended for the press but having the good fortune to meet with a more correct copy i thought myself under a necessity of publishing it with this third edition not only to do justice to his memory but to the great person he chose for his patron m g a letter sent by his lordship to charles cotton esq upon his new translation and dedication of montaigne's essays sir i have too long delayed my thanks to you for giving me such an obliging evidence of your remembrance 
that alone would have been a welcome present but when joined with the book in the world i am the best entertained with it raiseth a strong desire in me to be better known where i am sure to be so much pleased i have till now thought wit could not be translated and do still retain so much of that opinion that i believe it impossible except by one whose genius cometh up to that of the author you have so kept the original strength of his thought that it almost tempts a man to believe the transmigration of souls and that his being used to hills is come into the moorlands to reward us here in england for doing him more right than his country will afford him he hath by your means mended his first edition to transplant and make him ours is not only a valuable acquisition to us but a just censure of the critical impertinence of those french scribblers who have taken pains to make little cavils and exceptions to lessen the reputation of this great man whom nature hath made too big to confine himself to the exactness of a studied style he let his mind have its full flight and showeth by a generous kind of negligence that he did not write for praise but to give to the world a true picture of himself and of mankind he scorned affected periods or to please the mistaken reader with an empty chime of words he hath no affectation to set himself out and dependeth wholly upon the natural force of what is his own and the excellent application of what he borroweth you see sir i have kindness enough for m de montaigne to be your rival but nobody can pretend to be in equal competition with you i do willingly yield which is no small matter for a man to do to a more prosperous lover and if you will repay this piece of justice with another pray believe that he who can translate such an author without doing him wrong must not only make me glad but proud of being his very humble servant halifax end of advertisement and a letter sent by his lordship to charles cotton esq upon his new translation and dedication of montaigne's essays this is section twenty two of the complete works of george savile first marquis of halifax this librivox recording is in the public domain a character of king charles the second read by john greenman one of his religion a character differeth from a picture only in this every part of it must be like but it is not necessary that every feature should be comprehended in it as in a picture only some of the most remarkable this prince at his first entrance into the world had adversity for his introducer which is generally thought to be no ill one but in his case it proved so and laid the foundation of most of those misfortunes or errors that were the causes of the great objections made to him the first effect it had was in relation to his religion the ill-bred familiarity of the scotch divines had given him a distaste of that part of the protestant religion he was left then to the little remnant of the church of england in the faubourg st germain which made such a kind of figure as might easily be turned in such a manner as to make him lose his veneration for it in a refined country where religion appeared in pomp and splendor the outward appearance of such unfashionable men was made an argument against their religion and a young prince not averse to raillery was the more susceptible of a contempt for it the company he kept the men in his pleasures and the arguments of state that he should not appear too much a protestant whilst he expected assistance from a popish prince all these together with a habit encouraged by an application to his pleasures did so loosen and untie him from his first impressions that i take it for granted after the first year or two he was no more a protestant if you ask me what he was my answer must be that he was of the religion of a young prince in his warm blood 
whose enquiries were more applied to find arguments against believing than to lay any settled foundations for acknowledging providence mysteries etc a general creed and no very long one may be presumed to be the utmost religion of one whose age and inclination could not well spare any thoughts that did not tend to his pleasures in this kind of indifference or unthinkingness which is too natural in the beginnings of life to be heavily censured i will suppose he might pass some considerable part of his youth i must presume too that no occasions were lost during that time to insinuate everything to bend him towards popery great art without intermission against youth and easiness which are seldom upon their guard must have its effect a man is to be admired if he resisteth and therefore cannot reasonably be blamed if he yieldeth to them when the critical minute was i'll not undertake to determine but certainly the inward conviction doth generally precede the outward declarations at what distances dependeth upon men's several complexions and circumstances no stated period can be fixed it will be said that he had not religion enough to have conviction that is a vulgar error conviction indeed is not a proper word but where a man is convinced by reason but in the common acceptation it is applied to those who cannot tell why they are so if men can be at least as positive in a mistake as when they are in the right they may be as clearly convinced when they do not know why as when they do i must presume that no man of the king's age and his methods of life could possibly give a good reason for changing the religion in which he was born let it be what it will but our passions are much oftener convinced than our reason he had but little reading and that tending to his pleasures more than to his instruction in the library of a young prince the solemn follies are not much rumpled books of a lighter digestion have the dog's ears some pretend to be very precise in the time of his reconciling the cardinal de retz etc i will not enter into it minutely but whenever it was it is observable that the government of france did not think it advisable to discover it openly upon which such obvious reflections may be made that i will not mention them such a secret can never be put into a place which is so closely stopped that there shall be no chinks whispers went about particular men had intimations cromwell had his advertisements in other things and this was as well worth his paying for there was enough said of it to startle a great many though not universally diffused so much that if the government here had not crumpled of itself his right alone with that and other clogs upon it would hardly have thrown it down i conclude that when he came into england he was as certainly a roman catholic as that he was a man of pleasure both very consistent by visible experience it is impertinent to give reasons for men's changing their religion none can give them but themselves as every man has quite a different way of arguing a thing which may very well be accounted for they are differing kinds of wit to be quick to find a fault and to be capable to find out a truth there must be industry in the last the first requires only a lively heat that catcheth hold of the weak side of any thing but to choose the strong one is another talent the reason why men of wit are often the laziest in their inquiries is that their heat carrieth their thoughts so fast that they are apt to be tired and they faint in the drudgery of a continued application have not men of great wit in all times permitted their understandings to give way to their first impressions it taketh off from the diminution when a man doth not mind a thing and the king had then other business the inferior part of the man was then in possession and the faculties of the brain as to serious and painful inquiries were laid asleep at least 
though not extinguished careless men are most subject to superstition those who do not study reason enough to make it their guide have more unevenness as they have neglects so they have starts and frights dreams will serve the turn omens and sicknesses have violent and sudden effects upon them nor is the strength of an argument so effectual from its intrinsic force as by its being well suited to the temper of the party the genteel part of the catholic religion might tempt a prince that had more of the fine gentleman than his governing capacity required and the exercise of indulgence to sinners being more frequent in it than of inflicting penance might be some recommendation mistresses of that faith are stronger specifics in this case than any that are in physic the roman catholics complained of his breach of promise to them very early footnote one upon the words of his declaration there were broad peepings out glimpses so often repeated that to discerning eyes it was flaring in the very first year there were such suspicions as produced melancholy shakings of the head which were very significant his unwillingness to marry a protestant was remarkable though both the catholic and the christian crown would have adopted her very early in his youth when any german princess was proposed he put off the discourse with raillery a thousand little circumstances were a kind of accumulative evidence which in these cases may be admitted men that were earnest protestants were under the sharpness of his displeasure expressed by raillery as well as by other ways men near him have made discoveries from sudden breakings out in discourse etc which showed there was a root it was not the least skilful part of his concealing himself to make the world think he leaned towards an indifference in religion he had sicknesses before his death in which he did not trouble any protestant divines those who saw him upon his deathbed saw a great deal as to his writing those papers footnote two two papers in defence of the roman catholic religion found in this king's strong box in his own hand and published by king james the second afterwards he might do it though neither his temper nor education made him very fit to be an author yet in this case a known topic so very often repeated he might write it all himself and yet not one word of it his own that church's argument doth so agree with men unwilling to take pains the temptation of putting an end to all the trouble of inquiring is so great that it must be very strong reason that can resist the king had only his mere natural faculties without any acquisitions to improve them so that it is no wonder if an argument which gave such ease and relief to his mind made such an impression that with thinking often of it as men are apt to do of everything they like he might by the effect chiefly of his memory put together a few lines with his own hand without any help at the time in which there was nothing extraordinary but that one so little inclined to write at all should prevail with himself to do it with the solemnity of a casuist two his dissimulation one great objection made to him was the concealing himself and disguising his thoughts in this there ought a latitude to be given it is a defect not to have it at all and a fault to have it too much human nature will not allow the mean like all other things as soon as ever men get to do them well they cannot easily hold from doing them too much tis the case even in the least things as singing etc in france he was to dissemble injuries and neglects from one reason in england he was dissembled too though for other causes a king upon the throne hath as great temptations though of another kind to dissemble as a king in exile 
the king of france might have his times of dissembling as much with him as he could have to do it with the king of france so he was in a school no king can be so little inclined to dissemble but he must needs learn it from his subjects who every day give him such lessons of it dissimulation is like most other qualities it hath two sides it is necessary and yet it is dangerous too to have none at all layeth a man open to contempt to have too much exposeth him to suspicion which is only the less dishonorable inconvenience if a man doth not take very great precautions he is never so much showed as when he endeavoureth to hide himself one man cannot take more pains to hide himself than another will do to see into him especially in the case of kings it is none of the exalted faculties of the mind since there are chambermaids will do it better than any prince in christendom men given to dissembling are like rooks at play they will cheat for shillings they are so used to it the vulgar definition of dissembling is downright lying that kind of it which is less ill-bred cometh pretty near it only princes and persons of honour must have gentler words given to their faults than the nature of them may in themselves deserve princes dissemble with too many not to have it discovered no wonder then that he carried it so far that it was discovered men compared notes and got evidence so that those whose morality would give them leave took it for an excuse for serving him ill those who knew his face fixed their eyes there and thought it of more importance to see than to hear what he said his face was as little a blab as most men's yet though it could not be called a prattling face it would sometimes tell tales to a good observer when he thought fit to be angry he had a very peevish memory there was hardly a blot that escaped him at the same time that this showed the strength of his dissimulation it gave warning too it fitted his present purpose but it made a discovery that put men more upon their guard against him only self-flattery furnisheth perpetual arguments to trust again the comfortable opinion men have of themselves keepeth up human society which would be more than half destroyed without it three his amour mistresses etc it may be said that his inclinations to love were the effects of health and a good constitution with as little mixture of the seraphic part as ever man had and though from that foundation men often raise their passions i am apt to think his stayed as much as any man's ever did in the lower region this made him like easy mistresses they were generally resigned to him while he was abroad with an implied bargain heroic refined lovers place a good deal of their pleasure in the difficulty both for the vanity of conquest and as a better earnest of their kindness after he was restored mistresses were recommended to him which is no small matter in a court and not unworthy the thoughts even of a party a mistress either dexterous in herself or well instructed by those that are so may be very useful to her friends not only in the immediate hours of her ministry but by her influences and insinuations at other times it was resolved generally by others whom he should have in his arms as well as whom he should have in his counsels of a man who was so capable of choosing he chose as seldom as any man that ever lived he had more properly at least in the beginning of his time a good stomach to his mistresses than any great passion for them his taking them from others was never learnt in a romance and indeed fitter for a philosopher than a knight-errant his patience for their frailties showed him no exact lover it is a heresy according to a true lover's creed ever to forgive an infidelity or the appearance of it love of ease will not do it where the heart is much engaged but where mere nature is the motive it is possible for a man to think righter than the common opinion and to argue that a rival taketh away nothing but the heart and leaveth all the rest 
in his latter times he had no love but insensible engagements that made it harder than most might apprehend to untie them the politics might have their part a secret a commission a confidence in critical things though it doth not give a lease for a precise term of years yet there may be difficulties in dismissing them there may be no love all the while perhaps the contrary he was said to be as little constant as they were thought to be though he had no love he must have some appetite or else he could not keep them for mere ease or for the love of sauntering mistresses are frequently apt to be uneasy they are in all respects craving creatures so that though the taste of those joys might be flattened yet a man who loved pleasure so as to be very unwilling to part with it might with the assistance of his fancy which doth not grow old so fast reserve some supplemental entertainments that might make their personal service be still of use to him the definition of pleasure is what pleaseth and if that which grave men may call a corrupted fancy shall administer any remedies for putting off mourning for the loss of youth who shall blame it the young men seldom apply their censure to these matters and the elder have an interest to be gentle towards a mistake that seemeth to make some kind of amends for their decays he had wit enough to suspect and he had wit enough too not to care the ladies got a great deal more than would have been allowed to be an equal bargain in chancery for what they did for it but neither the manner nor the measure of pleasure is to be judged by others little inducements at first grew into strong reasons by degrees men who do not consider circumstances but judge at a distance by a general way of arguing conclude if a mistress in some cases is not immediately turned off it must needs be that the gallant is incurably subjected this will by no means hold in private men much less in princes who are under more entanglements from which they cannot so easily loosen themselves his mistresses were as different in their humors as they were in their looks they gave matter of very different reflections the last note one the duchess of portsmouth especially was quite out of the definition of an ordinary mistress the causes and the manner of her being first introduced were very different a very peculiar distinction was spoken of some extraordinary solemnities that might dignify though not sanctify her function her chamber was the true cabinet council the king did always by his councils as he did sometimes by his meals he sat down out of form with the queen but he supped below stairs to have the secrets of a king who happens to have too many is to have a king in chains he must not only not part with her but he must in his own defence dissemble his dislike the less kindness he hath the more he must show there is great difference between being muffled and being tied he was the first not the last if he had quarrelled at some times besides other advantages this mistress had a powerful second one may suppose a kind of a guarantee this to a man that loved his ease though his age had not helped was sufficient the thing called sauntering is a stronger temptation to princes than it is to others the being galled with importunities pursued from one room to another with asking faces the dismal sound of unreasonable complaints and ill-grounded pretenses the deformity of fraud ill-disguised all these would make any man run away from them and i used to think it was the motive for making him walk so fast so it was more probably taking sanctuary to get into a room where all business was to stay at the door excepting much as he was disposed to admit might be very acceptable to a younger man than he was and less given to his ease he slumbered after dinner had the noise of the company to divert him without their solicitations to importune him in these hours where he was more unguarded no doubt the cunning men of the court took their times to make their observations 
and there is as little doubt but he made his upon them too where men had chinks he would see through them as soon as any man about him there was much more real business done there in his politic than there was in his personal capacity stands pede in uno and there was the french part of the government which was not the least in short without endeavoring to find more arguments he was used to it men do not care to put off a habit nor do often succeed when they go about it his was not an unthinkingness he did not perhaps think so much of his subjects as they might wish but he was far from being wanting to think of himself four his conduct to his ministers he lived with his ministers as he did with his mistresses he used them but he was not in love with them he showed his judgment in this that he cannot properly be said ever to have had a favorite though some might look so at a distance the present use he might have of them made him throw favors upon them which might lead the lookers-on into that mistake but he tied himself no more to them than they did to him which implied a sufficient liberty on either side perhaps he made dear purchases if he seldom gave profusely but where he expected some unreasonable thing great rewards were material evidences against those who received them he was free of access to them which was a very gaining quality he had at least as good a memory for the faults of his ministers as for their services and whenever they fell the whole inventory came out there was not a slip omitted that some of his ministers seemed to have a superiority did not spring from his resignation to them but to his ease he chose rather to be eclipsed than to be troubled his brother was a minister and he had his jealousies of him at the same time that he raised him he was not displeased to have him lessened the cunning observers found this out and at the same time that he reigned in the cabinet he was very familiarly used at the private supper a minister turned off is like a lady's waiting woman that knoweth all her washes and hath a shrewd guess at her stayings so there is danger in turning them off as well as in keeping them he had back stairs to convey informations to him as well as for other uses and though such informations are sometimes dangerous especially to a prince that will not take the pains necessary to digest them yet in the main that humor of hearing every body against anybody kept those about him in more awe than they would have been without it i do not believe that ever he trusted any man or any set of men so entirely as not to have some secrets in which they had no share as this might make him less well served so in some degree it might make him the less imposed upon you may reckon under this article his female ministry for though he had ministers of the council ministers of the cabinet and ministers of the ruelle the ruelle was often the last appeal those who were not well there were used because they were necessary at the time not because they were liked so that their tenure was a little uncertain his ministers were to administer business to him as doctors do physic wrap it up in something to make it less unpleasant some skilful digressions were so far from being impertinent that they could not many times fix him to a fair audience without them his aversion to formality made him dislike a serious discourse if very long except it was mixed with something to entertain him some even of the graver sort too used to carry this very far and rather than fail use the coarsest kind of youthful talk in general he was upon pretty even terms with his ministers and could as easily bear their being hanged as some of them could his being abused five of his wit and conversation his wit consisted chiefly in the quickness of his apprehension his apprehension made him find faults and that led him to short sayings upon them not always equal but often very good by his being abroad he contracted a habit of conversing familiarly which added to his natural genius 
made him very apt to talk perhaps more than a very nice judgment would approve he was apt to make broad allusions upon anything that gave the least occasion than was altogether suitable with the very good breeding he showed in most other things the company he kept whilst abroad had so used him to that sort of dialect that he was so far from thinking it a fault or an indecency that he made it a matter of raillery upon those who could not prevail upon themselves to join in it as a man who hath a good stomach loveth generally to talk of meat so in the vigour of his age he began that style which by degrees grew so natural to him that after he ceased to do it out of pleasure he continued to do it out of custom the hypocrisy of the former times inclined men to think they could not show too great an aversion to it and that helped to encourage this unbounded liberty of talking without the restraints of decency which were before observed in his more familiar conversations with the ladies even they must be passive if they would not enter into it how far sounds as well as objects may have their effects to raise inclination might be an argument to him to use that style or whether using liberty at its full stretch was not the general inducement without any particular motives to it the manner of that time of telling stories had drawn him into it being commended at first for the faculty of telling a tale well he might insensibly be betrayed to exercise it too often stories are dangerous in this that the best expose a man most by being oftenest repeated it might pass for an evidence for the moderns against the ancients that it is now wholly left off by all that have any pretence to be distinguished by their good sense he had the improvements of wine etc which made him pleasant and easy in company where he bore his part and was acceptable even to those who had no other design than to be merry with him the thing called wit a prince may taste but it is dangerous for him to take too much of it it hath allurements which by refining his thoughts take off from their dignity in applying them less to the governing part there is a charm in wit which a prince must resist and that to him was no easy matter it was contesting with nature upon terms of disadvantage his wit was not so ill-natured as to put men out of countenance in the case of a king especially it is more allowable to speak sharply of them than to them his wit was not acquired by reading that which he had above his original stock by nature was from company in which he was very capable to observe he could not so properly be said to have a wit very much raised as a plain gaining well-bred recommending kind of wit but of all men that ever liked those who had wit he could the best endure those who had none this leaneth more towards a satire than a compliment in this respect that he could not only suffer impertinence but at some times seemed to be pleased with it he encouraged some to talk a good deal more with him than one would have expected from a man of so good a taste he should rather have ordered his attorney-general to prosecute them for a misdemeanor in using common sense so scurvily in his presence however if this was a fault it is arrogant for any of his subjects to object to it since it would look like defying such a piece of indulgence he must in some degree loosen the strength of his wit by his condescension to talk with men so very unequal to him wit must be used to some equality which may give it exercise or else it is apt either to languish or to grow a little vulgar by reigning amongst men of a lower size where there is no awe to keep a man upon his guard it fell out rather by accident than choice that his mistresses were such as did not care that wit of the best kind should have the precedence in their apartments sharp and strong wit will not always be so held in by good manners as not to be a little troublesome in a ruelle but wherever impertinence hath wit enough left to be thankful for being well used it will not only be admitted but kindly received 
such charms every thing hath that setteth us off by comparison his affability was a part and perhaps not the least of his wit it is a quality that must not always spring from the heart men's pride as well as their weakness maketh them ready to be deceived by it they are more ready to believe it a homage paid to their merit than a bait thrown out to deceive them princes have a particular advantage there was at first as much of art as nature in his affability but by habit it became natural it is an error of the better hand but the universality taketh away a good deal of the force of it a man that hath had a kind look seconded with engaging words whilst he is chewing the pleasure if another in his sight should be received just as kindly that equality would presently alter the relish the pride of mankind will have distinction till at last it cometh to smile for smile meaning nothing of either side without any kind of effect mere drawing-room compliments the bow alone would be better without them he was under some disadvantages of this kind that grew still in proportion as it came by time to be more known that there was less signification in those things than at first was thought the familiarity of his wit must needs have the effect of lessening the distance fit to be kept to him the freedom used to him whilst abroad was retained by those who used it longer than either they ought to have kept it or he have suffered it and others by their example learned to use the same a king of spain that will say nothing but tiendro cuidado will to the generality preserve more respect an engine that will speak but sometimes at the same time that it will draw the raillery of the few who judge well it will create respect in the ill-judging generality formality is sufficiently revenged upon the word for being so unreasonably laughed at it is destroyed it is true but it hath the spiteful satisfaction of seeing everything destroyed with it his fine gentlemanship did him no good encouraged in it by being too much applauded his wit was better suited to his condition before he was restored than afterwards the wit of a gentleman and that of a crowned head ought to be different things as there is a crown law there is a crown wit too to use it with reserve is very good and very rare there is a dignity in doing things seldom even without any other circumstance where wit will run continually the spring is apt to fail so that it groweth vulgar and the more it is practised the more it is debased he was so good at finding out other men's weak sides that it made him less intent to cure his own that generally happeneth it may be called a treacherous talent for it betrayeth a man to forget to judge himself by being so eager to censure others this doth so misguide men the first part of their lives that the habit of it is not easily recovered when the greater ripeness of their judgment inclineth them to look more into themselves than into other men men love to see themselves in the false looking-glass of other men's failings it maketh a man think well of himself at the time and by sending his thoughts abroad to get food for laughing they are less at leisure to see faults at home men choose rather to make the war in another country than to keep all well at home six his talents temper habits etc he had a mechanical head which appeared in his inclination to shipping and fortification etc this would make one conclude that his thoughts would naturally have been more fixed to business if his pleasures had not drawn them away from it he had a very good memory though he would not always make equal good use of it so that if he had accustomed himself to direct his faculties to his business i see no reason why he might not have been a good deal master of it his chain of memory was longer than his chain of thought the first could bear any burden the other was tired of being carried on too long it was fit to ride a heat but it had not wind enough for a long course 
a very great memory often forgetteth how much time is lost by repeating things of no use it was one reason of his talking so much since a great memory will always have something to say and will be discharging itself whether in or out of season if a good judgment doth not go along with it to make it stop and turn one might say of his memory that it was a beauté journaliere sometimes he would make shrewd applications etc at others he would bring things out of it that never deserved to be laid in it he grew by age into a pretty exact distribution of his hours both for his business pleasures and the exercise for his health of which he took as much care as could possibly consist with some liberties he was resolved to indulge in himself he walked by his watch and when he pulled it out to look upon it skilful men would make haste with what they had to say to him he was often retained in his personal against his politic capacity he would speak upon those occasions most dexterously against himself charles stuart would be bribed against the king and in the distinction he leaned more to his natural self than his character would allow he would not suffer himself to be so much fettered by his character as was convenient he was still starting out of it the power of nature was too strong for the dignity of his calling which generally yielded as often as there was a contest it was not the best use he made of his back stairs to admit men to bribe him against himself to procure a defalcation help a lame accountant to get off or side with the farmers against the improvement of the revenue the king was made the instrument to defraud the crown which is somewhat extraordinary that which might tempt him to do it probably was his finding that those about him so often took money upon those occasions so that he thought he might do well at least to be a partner he did not take the money to hoard it there were those at court who watched those times as the spaniards do for the coming in for the plate fleet the beggars of whose sexes helped to empty his cabinet and to leave room in them for a new lading upon the next occasion these negotiators played double with him too when it was for their purpose so to do he knew it and went on still so he gained his present end at the end he was less solicitous to inquire into the consequences he could not properly be said to be either covetous or liberal his desire to get was not with an intention to be rich and his spending was rather an easiness in letting money go than any premeditated thought for the distribution of it he would do as much to throw off the burden of a present importunity as he would to relieve a want when once the aversion to bear uneasiness taketh place in a man's mind it doth so check all the passions that they are damped into a kind of indifference they grow faint and languishing and come to be subordinate to that fundamental maxim of not purchasing anything at the price of a difficulty this made that he had as little eagerness to oblige as he had to hurt men the motive of his giving bounties was rather to make men less uneasy to him than more easy to themselves and yet no ill nature all this while he would slide from an asking face and could guess very well it was throwing a man off from his shoulders that leaned upon them with his whole weight so that the party was not gladder to receive than he was to give it was a kind of implied bargain though men seldom kept it being so apt to forget the advantage they had received that they would presume the king would as little remember the good he had done them so as to make it an argument against their next request this principle of making the love of ease exercise an entire sovereignty in his thoughts would have been less censured in a private man than it might be in a prince the consequence of it to the public changeth the nature of that quality or else a philosopher in his private capacity might say a great deal to justify it the truth is a king is to be such a distinct creature from a man that their thoughts are to be put in quite a differing shape and it is such a disquieting task to reconcile them that princes might rather expect to be lamented than to be envied for being in a station that exposeth them if they do not 
do more to answer men's expectations than human nature will allow that men have the less ease for their loving it so much is so far from a wonder than it is a natural consequence especially in the case of a prince ease is seldom got without some pains but it is yet seldomer kept without them he thought giving would make men more easy to him whereas he might have known it would certainly make them more troublesome when men receive benefits from princes they attribute less to his generosity than to their own deserts so that in their own opinion their merit cannot be bounded by that mistaken rule it can as little be satisfied they would take it for a diminution to have it circumscribed merit hath a thirst upon it that can never be quenched by golden showers it is not only still ready but greedy to receive more this king charles found in as many instances as any prince that ever reigned because the easiness of access introducing the good success of their first request they were the more encouraged to repeat those importunities which had been more effectually stopped in the beginning by a short and resolute denial but his nature did not dispose him to that method it directed him rather to put off the troublesome minute for the time and that being his inclination he did not care to struggle with it i am of an opinion in which i am every day more confirmed by observation that gratitude is one of those things that cannot be bought it must be born with men or else all the obligations in the world will not create it an outward show may be made to satisfy decency and to prevent reproach but a real sense of a kind thing is a gift of nature and never was nor can be acquired the love of ease is an opiate it is pleasing for the time quieteth the spirits but it hath its effects that seldom fail to be most fatal the immoderate love of ease maketh a man's mind pay a passive obedience to anything that happeneth it reduceth the thoughts from having desire to be content it must be allowed he had a little overbalance on the well-natured side not vigor enough to be earnest to do a kind thing much less to do a harsh one but if a hard thing was done to another man he did not eat his supper the worse for it it was rather a deadness than severity of nature whether it proceeded from a dissipation of spirits or by the habit of living in which he was engaged if a king should be born with more tenderness than might suit with his office he would in time be hardened the faults of his subjects make severity so necessary that by the frequent occasions given to use it it comes to be habitual and by degrees the resistance that nature made at first groweth fainter till at last it is in a manner quite extinguished in short this prince might more properly be said to have gifts than virtues as affability easiness of living inclinations to give and to forgive qualities that flowed from his nature rather than from his virtue he had not more application to anything than the preservation of his health it had an entire preference to anything else in his thoughts and he might be said without aggravation to study that with as little intermission as any man in the world he understood it very well only in this he failed that he thought it was more reconcilable with his pleasures than it really was it is natural to have such a mind to reconcile these that tis the easier for any man that goeth about it to be guilty of that mistake this made him overdo in point of nourishment the better to furnish to those entertainments and then he thought by great exercise to make amends and to prevent the ill effects of his blood being too much raised the success he had in this method whilst he had youth and vigour to support him in it encouraged him to continue it longer than nature allowed age stealeth so insensibly upon us that we do not think of suiting our way of reasoning to the several stages of life so insensibly that not being able to pitch upon any precise time when we cease to be young we either flatter ourselves that we always continue to be so or at least forget how much we are 
mistaken in it. 7. Conclusion After all this, when some rough strokes of the pencil have made several parts of the picture look a little hard, it is a justice that would be due to every man, much more to a prince, to make some amends, and to reconcile men as much as may be to it by the last finishing. He had as good a claim to a kind interpretation as most men, first as a prince, living and dead, generous and well-bred men will be gentle to them, next as an unfortunate prince in the beginning of his time, and a gentle one in the rest. A prince, neither sharpened by his misfortunes whilst abroad, nor by his power when restored, is such a shining character that it is a reproach not to be so dazzled with it as not to be able to see a fault in its full light. It would be a scandal in this case to have an exact memory. And if all who are akin to his vices should mourn for him, never prince would be better attended to his grave. He is under the protection of common frailty that must engage men for their own sakes not to be too severe, where they themselves have so much to answer. What, therefore, an angry philosopher would call lewdness, let frailer men call a warmth and sweetness of the blood that would not be confined in the communicating itself, an overflowing of good nature of which he had such a stream that it would not be restrained within the banks of a crabbed and unsociable virtue if he had sometimes less firmness than might have been wished let the kindest reason be given and if that should be wanting the best excuse i would assign the cause of it to be his loving at any rate to be easy and his deserving the more to be indulged in it by his desiring that everybody else should be so if he sometimes let a servant fall let it be examined whether he did not weigh so much upon his master as to give him a fair excuse. That yieldingness, whatever foundations it might lay to the disadvantage of posterity, was a specific to preserve us in peace for his own time. If he loved too much to lie upon his own down bed of ease, his subjects had the pleasure during his reign of lolling and stretching upon theirs as a sword is sooner broken upon a feather-bed than upon a table, so his pliantness broke the blow of a present mischief much better than a more immediate resistance would perhaps have done. Ruin saw this, and therefore removed him first to make way for further overturnings. If he dissembled, let us remember first that he was a king, and that dissimulation is a jewel of the crown next that it is very hard for a man not to do sometimes too much of that which he concludeth necessary for him to practise men should consider that as there would be no false dice if there were no true ones so if dissembling is grown universal it ceaseth to be foul play having an implied allowance by the general practice he that was so often forced to dissemble in his own defence might the better have the privilege sometimes to be the aggressor and to deal with men at their own weapon. Subjects are apt to be as arbitrary in their censure as the most assuming kings can be in their power. If there might be matter for objections, there is not less reason for excuses. The defects laid to his charge are such as may claim indulgence from mankind. Should nobody throw a stone at his faults but those who are free from them, there would be but a slender shower. What private man will throw stones at him because he loved, or what prince because he dissembled? If he either trusted or forgave his enemies, or in some cases neglected his friends, more than could in strictness be allowed, let not those errors be so arraigned as take away the privilege that seemeth to be due to princely frailties if princes are under the misfortune of being accused to govern ill their subjects have the less right to fall hard upon them since they generally so little deserve to be governed well the truth is the calling of a king with all its glittering hath such an unreasonable weight upon it that they may rather expect to be lamented than to be envied for being set upon a pinnacle 
where they are exposed to censure if they do not do more to answer men's expectations than corrupted nature will allow it is but justice therefore to this prince to give all due softenings to the less shining parts of his life to offer flowers and leaves to hide instead of using aggravations to expose them let his royal ashes then lie soft upon him and cover him from harsh and unkind censures which though they should not be unjust can never clear themselves from being indecent end of section twenty two a character of king charles the second read by john greenman This is section 23 of the complete works of George Saville, first Marquis of Halifax. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Political Thoughts and Reflections, read by John Greenman. Of Fundamentals. Every party, when they find a maxim for their turn, they presently call it a fundamental. They think they nail it with a peg of iron whereas in truth they only tie it with a wisp of straw the word soundeth so well that the impropriety of it hath been the less observed but as weighty as the word appeareth no feather hath been more blown about in the world than this word fundamental it is one of those mistakes that it sometimes may be of use but it is a mistake still fundamental is used as men use their friends commend them when they have need of them and when they fall out find a hundred objections to them fundamental is a pedestal that men set everything upon that they would not have broken it is a nail every body would use to fix that which is good for them for all men would have that principle to be immovable that serves their use at the time everything that is created is mortal ergo all fundamentals of human creation will die a true fundamental must be like the foundation of a house if it is undermined the whole house falleth the fundamentals in divinity have been changed in several ages of the world they have made no difficulty in the several councils to destroy and excommunicate men for asserting things that at other times were called fundamentals philosophy astronomy etc have changed their fundamentals as the men of art no doubt called them at the time motion of the earth etc even in morality one may more properly say there should be fundamentals allowed than that there are any which in strictness can be maintained however this is the least uncertain foundation fundamental is less improperly applied here than anywhere else wise and good men will in all ages stick to some fundamentals look upon them as sacred and preserve an inviolable respect for them but mankind in general make morality a more malleable thing than it ought to be there is then no certain fundamental but in nature and yet there are objections too it is a fundamental in nature that the son should not kill the father and yet the senate of venice gave a reward to a son who brought in his father's head according to a proclamation salus populi is an unwritten law yet that doth not hinder but that it is sometimes very visible and as often as it is so it supersedeth all other laws which are subordinate things compared the great punishments upon self-murder are arguments that it was rather a tempting sin to be discouraged than an unnatural act it is a fundamental that where a man intendeth no hurt he should receive none yet manslaughter etc are cases of mercy that a boy under ten shall not suffer death yet where malicia suplet etatem otherwise that there were witches much shaken of late that the king is not to be deceived in his grant the practical fundamental the contrary that what is given to god cannot be alienated 
yet in practice it is by treaties etc and even by the church itself when they get a better bargain by it i can make no other definition of a true fundamental than this viz that whatever a man hath a desire to do or to hinder if he hath uncontested and irresistible power to effect it that he will certainly do it if he thinketh he hath that power though he hath it not he will certainly go about it some would define a fundamental to be the settling the laws of nature and common equity in such a sort as that they may be well administered even in this case there can be nothing fixed but it must vary for the good of the whole a constitution cannot make itself somebody made it not at once but at several times it is alterable and by that draweth nearer perfection and without suiting itself to differing times and circumstances it could not live its life is prolonged by changing seasonably the several parts of it at several times the reverence that is given to a fundamental in a general unintelligible notion would be much better applied to that supremacy or power which is set up in every nation in differing shapes that altereth the constitution as often as the good of the people requireth it neither king nor people would now like just the original constitution without any varyings if kings are only answerable to god that doth not secure them even in this world since if god upon the appeal thinketh fit not to stay he maketh the people his instruments i am persuaded that wherever any single man had power to do himself right upon a deceitful trustee he would do it that thought well digested would go a great way towards the discouraging invasions upon rights etc i lay down then as a fundamental first that in every constitution there is some power which neither will nor ought to be bounded two that the king's prerogative should be as plain a thing as the people's obedience three that a power which may by parity of reason destroy the whole laws can never be reserved by the laws four that in all limited governments it must give the governor power to hurt but it can never be so interpreted as to give him power to destroy for then in effect it would cease to be a limited government five that severity be rare and great for as tacitus saith of nero quote, frequent punishments made the people call even his justice cruelty unquote. six that it is necessary to make the instruments of power easy for power is hard enough to be digested by those under it at the best seven that the people are never so perfectly backed but that they will kick and fling if not stroked at seasonable times eight that a prince must think if he loseth his people he can never regain them it is both wise and safe to think so nine that kings assuming prerogative teach the people to do so too ten that prerogative is a trust eleven that they are not the king's laws nor the parliament's laws but the laws of england in which after they have passed by the legislative power the people have the property and the king the executive part twelve that no abilities should qualify a noted knave to be employed in business a knave can by none of his dexterities make amends for the scandal he bringeth upon the crown thirteen that those who will not be bound by the laws rely upon crimes a third way was never found in the world to secure any government fourteen that a seaman be a seaman a cabinet councillor a man of business an officer an officer fifteen in corrupted governments the place is given for the sake of the man in good ones the man is chosen for the sake of the place sixteen that crowds at court are made up of such as would deceive the real worshippers are few seventeen that salus populi is the greatest of all fundamentals 
yet not altogether an immovable one it is a fundamental for a ship to ride at anchor when it is in port but if a storm cometh the cable must be cut eighteen property is not a fundamental right in one sense because in the beginning of the world there was none so that property itself was an innovation introduced by laws property is only secured by trusting it in the best hands and those are generally chosen who are least likely to deceive but if they should they have a legal authority to abuse as well as use the power with which they are trusted and there is no fundamental can stand in their way or be allowed as an exception to the authority that was vested in them nineteen magna carta would fain be made to pass for a fundamental and sir edward coke would have it that the grand charter was for the most part declaratory of the principal grounds of the fundamental laws of england if that refers to the common law it must be made out that everything in magna carta is always and at all times necessary in itself to be kept or else the denying a subsequent parliament the right of repealing any law doth by consequence deny the preceding parliament the right of making it but they are fain to say it was only a declarative law which is very hard to be proved yet suppose it you must either make the common law so stated a thing that all men know it beforehand or else universally acquiesce in it whenever it is alleged from the affinity it hath to the law of nature now i would fain know whether the common law is capable of being defined and whether it does not hover in the clouds like the prerogative and bolteth out like lightning to be made use of for some particular occasion if so the government of the world is left to a thing that cannot be defined and if it cannot be defined you know not what it is so that the supreme appeal is we know not what we submit to god almighty though he is incomprehensible and yet he hath set down his methods but for this world there can be no government without a stated rule and a supreme power not to be controlled neither by the dead nor the living the laws under the protection of the king govern in the ordinary administration the extraordinary power is in the acts of parliament from whence there can be no appeal but to the same power at another time to say a power is supreme and not arbitrary is not sense it is acknowledged supreme and therefore etc if the common law is supreme then those are so who judge what is the common law and if none but the parliament can judge so there is an end of the controversy there is no fundamental for the parliament may judge as they please that is they have the authority but they may judge against right their power is good though their act is ill no good man will outwardly resist the one or inwardly approve the other there is then no other fundamental but that every supreme power must be arbitrary fundamental is a word used by the laity as the word sacred is by the clergy to fix everything to themselves they have a mind to keep that nobody else may touch it of princes a prince who will not undergo the difficulty of understanding must undergo the danger of trusting a wise prince may gain such an influence that his countenance would be the last appeal where it is not so in some degree his authority is precarious a prince must keep up the power of his countenance which is not the least of his prerogatives the conscience as well as the prerogative of a king must be restrained or loosened as is best for his people it may without scandal be made of stretching leather but it must be drawn by a steady hand a king that lets intercession prevail will not be long worshipped a prince used to war getteth a military logic that is not very well suited to the civil administration if he maketh war successfully he groweth into a demigod if without success the world throweth him as much below humanity as they had before set him above it a hero must be sometimes allowed to make bold strokes without being fettered by strict reason 
he is to have some generous irregularities in his reasoning or else he will not be a good thing of his kind princes their rewards of servants when a prince giveth any man a very extravagant reward it looketh as if it was rather for an ill thing than a good one both the giver and receiver are out of countenance where they are ill suited and ill applied serving princes will make men proud at first and humble at last resolving to serve well and at the same time resolving to please is generally resolving to do what is not to be done a man that will serve well must often rule the master so hard that it will hurt him it is thought an unsociable quality in a court to do one's duty better than other men nothing is less forgiven than setting patterns men have no mind to follow men are so unwilling to displease a prince that it is as dangerous to inform him right as to serve him wrong where men get by pleasing and lose by serving the choice is so easy that nobody can miss it princes their secrets men are so proud of prince secrets that they will not see the danger of them when a prince trusteth a man with a dangerous secret he would not be sorry to hear the bell tolled for him love of the subjects to a prince the heart of the subjects yieldeth but a lean crop where it is not cultivated by a wise prince the good will of the governed will be starved if it is not fed by the good conduct of the governors suffering for princes those who merit because they suffered are so very angry with those that made them suffer that though their services may deserve employment their temper rendereth them unfit for it of ministers the world dealeth with ministers of state as they do with ill fiddlers ready to kick them downstairs for playing ill though few of the fault-finders understand their music enough to be good judges a minister who undertaketh to make his master very great if he faileth is ruined for his folly if he succeedeth he is feared for his skill a good statesman may sometimes mistake as much by being too humble as by being too proud he must take upon him in order to do his duty and not in order to the setting himself out a minister is not to plead the king's command for such things as he may in justice be supposed to have directed it is dangerous to serve where the master hath the privilege not to be blamed it is hard for a prince to esteem the parts of a minister without either envying or fearing them and less dangerous for a minister to show all the weakness than all the strength of his understanding there are so many things necessary to make up a good minister that no wonder there are so few of them in the world there is hardly a rasher thing than for a man to venture to be a good minister a minister of state must have a spirit of liberal economy not a restrained frugality he must enlarge his family soul and suit it to the bigger compass of a kingdom a prince should be asked why he will do a thing but not why he hath done it if the boys were to choose a schoolmaster it should be one that would not whip them the same thing if the courtiers were to choose a minister they would have a great many play-days no rods and leave to rob orchards the parallel will hold wicked ministers a cunning minister will engage his master to begin with a small wrong step which will insensibly engage him in a great one a man that hath the patience to go by steps may deceive one much wiser than himself state business is a cruel trade good nature is a bungler in it instruments of state ministers men in business are in as much danger from those that work under them as from those that work against them 
when the instruments bend under the weight of their business it is like a weak-legged horse that brings his rider down with him as when they are too weak they let a man fall so when they are too strong they throw him off if men of business did not forget how apt their tools are to break or fail they would shut up shop they must use things called men under them who will spoil the best scheme that can be drawn by human understanding tools that are blunt cannot cut at all and those that are sharp are apt to cut in the wrong place great difference between a good tool and a good workman when the tools will be workmen they cut their own fingers and everybody's else of the people there is more strength in union than in number witness the people that in all ages have been scurvily used because they could so seldom agree to do themselves right the more the weaker may be as good a proverb as the more the merrier a people can no more stand without government than a child can go without leading strings as old and as big as a nation is it can't go by itself and must be led the numbers that make its strength are at the same time the cause of its weakness and incapacity of acting men have so discovered themselves to one another that union is become a mere word in reality impracticable they trust or suspect not upon reason but ill-grounded fame they should be at ease saved protected etc and give nothing for it the lower sort of men must be indulged the consolation of finding fault with those above them without that they would be so melancholy that it would be dangerous considering their numbers they are too many to be told of their mistakes and for that reason they are never to be cured of them the body of the people are generally either so dead that they cannot move or so mad that they cannot be reclaimed to be neither all in a flame nor quite cold requireth more reason than great numbers can ever attain the people can seldom agree to move together against a government but they can to sit still and let it be undone those that will be martyrs for the people must expect to be repaid only by their vanity or their virtue a man that will head the mob is like a bull let loose tied about with squibs and crackers he must be half mad that goeth about it yet at some times shall be too hard for all the wise men in a kingdom for though good sense speaketh against madness yet it is out of countenance whenever it meets it it would be a greater reproach to the people that their favor is short-lived if their malice was not so too the thoughts of the people have no regular motion they come out by starts there is an accumulative cruelty in a number of men though none in particular are ill-natured the angry buzz of a multitude is one of the bloodiest noises in the world of government an exact administration and a good choice of proper instruments doth insensibly make the government in a manner absolute without assuming it the best definition of the best government is that it hath no inconveniences but such as are supportable but inconveniences there must be the interest of the governors and the governed is in reality the same but by mistakes on both sides it is generally very differing he who is a courtier by trade and by the country gentleman who will be popular right or wrong help to keep up this unreasonable distinction there are as many apt to be angry at being well as at being ill governed for most men to be well governed must be scurvily used as mankind is made the keeping it in order is an ill-natured office it is like a great gallery where the officers must be whipping with little intermission if they will do their duty it is a disorderly government as in a river the lightest things swim at the top a nation is best to be judged by the government it is under at the time mankind is moulded to good or ill according as the power over it is well or ill directed a nation is a mass of dough 
it is the government that needeth it into form where learning and trade flourish in a nation they produce so much knowledge and that so much equality among men that the greatness of dependencies is lost but the nation in general will be the better for it for if the government be wise it is the more easily governed if not the bad government is the more easily overturned by men's being more united against it than when they depended upon great men who might sooner be gained over and weakened by being divided there is more reason for allowing luxury in a military government than in another the perpetual exercise of war not only excuseth but recommendeth the entertainments in the winter in another it groweth into a habit of uninterrupted expenses and idle follies and the consequences of them to a nation become irrecoverable clergy if the clergy did not live like temporal men all the power of princes could not bring them under the temporal jurisdiction they who may be said to be of god almighty's household should show by their lives that he hath a well-disciplined family the clergy in this sense of divine institution that god hath made mankind so weak that it must be deceived religion it is a strange thing that the way to save men's souls should be such a cunning trade as to require a skilful master the time spent in praying to god might be better employed in deserving well from him men think praying the easier task of the two and therefore choose it the people would not believe in god at all if they were not permitted to believe wrong in him the several sorts of religion in the world are little more than so many spiritual monopolies if their interests could be reconciled their opinions would be so too men pretend to serve god almighty who doth not need it but make use of him because they need him factions are like pirates that set out false colors when they come near a booty religion is put under deck most men's anger about religion is as if two men should quarrel for a lady they neither of them care for of prerogative power and liberty a prerogative that tendeth to the dissolution of all laws must be void in itself felo de se, for a prerogative is a law the reason of any law is that no man's will should be a law the king is the life of the law and cannot have a prerogative that is mortal to it the law is to have a soul in it or it is a dead thing the king is by his sovereign power to add warmth and vigor to the meaning of the law we are by no means to imagine there is such an antipathy between them that the prerogative like a basilisk is to kill the law whenever it looks upon it the prince hath very rarely use of his prerogative but hath constantly a great advantage by the laws they attribute to the pope indeed that all the laws of the church are in his breast but then he hath the holy ghost for his learned counsel etc the people's obedience must be plain and without evasions the prince's prerogative should be so too king charles i made this answer to the petition of right to the observation whereof he held himself obliged in conscience as well as of his prerogative Quote, that the people's liberties strengthen the king's prerogative and the king's prerogative is to defend the people's liberties Unquote. that princes declarations allow the original of government to come from the people prerogative never yet pretended to repealing the first ground of prerogative was to enable the prince to do good not to do everything if the ground of a king's desire of power be his assurance of himself that he will do no hurt by it is it not an argument for subjects to desire to keep that which they will never abuse it must not be such a prerogative as giveth the government the rickets all the nourishment to go to the upper part and the lower starved as a prince is in danger who calleth a stronger than himself to his assistance 
so when prerogative useth necessity for an argument it calleth in a stronger thing than itself the same reason may overturn it necessity too is so plain a thing that everybody sees it so that the magistrate hath no great privilege in being the judge of it necessity therefore is a dangerous argument for princes since wherever it is real it constitutes every man a magistrate and gives as great a power of dispensing to every private man as a prince can claim it is not so proper to say that prerogative justifieth force as that force supporteth prerogative they have not been such constant friends but that they have had terrible fallings out all powers are of god and between permission and appointment well considered there is no real difference in a limited monarchy prerogative and liberty are as jealous of one another as any two neighboring states can be of their respective encroachments they ought not to part for small bickerings and must bear little jealousies without breaking for them power is so apt to be insolent and liberty to be saucy that they are very seldom upon good terms they are both so quarrelsome that they will not easily enter into a fair treaty for indeed it is hard to bring them together they ever quarrel at a distance power and liberty are respectively managed in the world in a manner not suitable to their value and dignity they are both so abused that it justifieth the satires that are generally made upon them and they are so in possession of being misapplied that instead of censuring their being abused it is more reasonable to wonder whenever they are not so they are perpetually wrestling and have had their turns when they have been thrown to have their bones broken by it if they were not both apt to be out of breath there would be no living if prerogative will urge reason to support it it must bear reason when it resisteth it it is a diminution instead of a glory to be above treating upon equal terms with reason if the people were designed to be the sole property of the supreme magistrate sure god would have made them of a differing and subordinate species as he hath the beasts that by the inferiority of their nature they might the better submit to the dominion of mankind if none were to have liberty but those who understand what it is there would not be many freed men in the world when the people contend for their liberty they seldom get anything by their victory but new masters liberty can neither be got nor kept but by so much care that mankind generally are unwilling to give the price for it and therefore in the contest between ease and liberty the first hath generally prevailed of laws laws are generally not understood by three sorts of persons viz by those that make them by those that execute them and by those that suffer if they break them men seldom understand any laws but those they feel precepts like fomentations must be rubbed into us and with a rough hand too if the laws could speak for themselves they would complain of the lawyers in the first place there is more learning now required to explain a law made than went to the making it the law hath so many contradictions and varyings from itself that the law may not improperly be called a law-breaker it is become too changeable a thing to be defined it is made little less a mystery than the gospel the clergy and the lawyers like the freemasons may be supposed to take an oath not to tell the secret the men of law have a bias to their calling in the interpretations they make of the law of parliaments the parliaments are so altered from their original constitution that between the court and the country the house instead of being united is like troops of a contrary party facing one another and watching their advantage even the well-meaning men who have good sense too have their difficulties in an assembly what they offer honestly for a good end will be skilfully improved for an ill one it is strange that a gross mistake should live a minute in an assembly 
one would expect that it should be immediately stifled by their discerning faculties but practice convinceth that a mistake is nowhere better entertained in parliaments men wrangle in behalf of liberty that do as little care for it as they deserve it where the people in parliament give a good deal of money in exchange for anything from the crown a wise prince can hardly have an ill bargain the present gift begetteth more it is a politic kind of generation and whenever a parliament doth not bring forth it is the unskilfulness of the government that is the cause of the miscarriage parliaments would bind and limit one another and enact that such and such things shall not be made precedents there is not a word of sense in this language which yet is to be understood the sense of the nation and is printed as solemnly as if it was sense of parties the best party is but a kind of a conspiracy against the rest of the nation they put everybody else out of their protection like the jews to the gentiles all others are the offscourings of the world men value themselves upon their principles so as to neglect practice abilities industry etc party cutteth off one half of the world from the other so that the mutual improvement of men's understanding by conversing etc is lost and men are half undone when they lose the advantage of knowing what their enemies think of them it is like faith without works they take it for a dispensation from all other duties which is the worst kind of dispensing power it groweth to be the master thought the eagerness against one another at home being a nearer object extinguisheth that which we ought to have against our foreign enemies and few men's understandings can get above overvaluing the danger that is nearest in comparison of that more remote it turneth all thought into talking instead of doing men get a habit of being unuseful to the public by turning in a circle of wrangling and railing which they cannot get out of and it may be remarked that a speculative coxcomb is not only unuseful but mischievous a practical coxcomb under discipline may be made use of it maketh a man thrust his understanding into a corner and confine it till by degrees he destroys it party is generally an effect of wantonness peace and plenty which beget humor pride etc and that is called zeal and public spirit they forget insensibly that there is anybody in the world but themselves by keeping no other company so they miscalculate cruelly and thus parties mistake their strength by the same reason that private men overvalue themselves for we by finding fault with others build up a partial esteem of ourselves upon the foundation of their mistakes so men in parties find faults with those in the administration not without reason but forget that they would be exposed to the same objections and perhaps greater if it was their adversary's turn to have the fault-finding part there are men who shine in a faction and make a figure by opposition who would stand in a worse light if they had the preferments they struggled for it looketh so like courage but nothing that is like is the same to go to the extreme that men are carried away with it and blown up out of their senses by the wind of popular applause that which looketh bold is of a great object that the people can discern but that which is wise is not so easily seen it is one part of it that it is not seen but at the end of a design those who are disposed to be wise too late are apt to be valiant too early most men enter into a party rashly and retreat from it as shamefully as they encourage one another at first so they betray one another at last and because every qualification is capable of being corrupted by the excess they fall upon the extreme to fix mutual reproaches upon one another party is little less than an inquisition where men are under such a discipline in carrying on the common cause as leaves no liberty of private opinion 
it is hard to produce an instance where a party did ever succeed against a government except they had a good handle given them no original party ever prevailed in a turn it brought up something else but the first projectors were thrown off if there are two parties a man ought to adhere to that which he disliketh least though in the whole he doth not approve it for whilst he doth not list himself in one or the other party he is looked upon as such a straggler that he is fallen upon by both therefore a man under such a misfortune of singularity is neither to provoke the world nor disquiet himself by taking any particular station it becometh him to live in the shade and keep his mistakes from giving offence but if they are his opinions he cannot put them off as he doth his clothes happy those who are convinced so as to be of the general opinions ignorance maketh most men go into party and shame keepeth them from getting out of it more men hurt others they do not know why than for any reason if there was any party entirely composed of honest men it would certainly prevail but both the honest men and the knaves resolve to turn one another off when the business is done they by turns defame all england so nobody can be employed that hath not been branded there are few things so criminal as a place of courts the court may be said to be a company of well-bred fashionable beggars at court if a man hath too much pride to be a creature he hath better stay at home a man who will rise at court must begin by creeping upon all four a place at court like a place in heaven is to be got by being much upon one's knees there are hardly two creatures of a more differing species than the same man when he is pretending to a place and when he is in possession of it men's industry is spent in receiving the rents of a place there is little left for discharging the duty of it some places have such a corrupting influence upon the man that it is a supernatural thing to resist it some places lie so fair to entertain corruption that it looketh like renouncing a due perquisite not to go into it if a getting fool would keep out of business he would grow richer in a court than a man of sense one would wonder that in a court where there is so little kindness there should be so much whispering men must brag of kind letters from court at the same time that they do not believe one word of them men at court think so much of their own cunning that they forget other men's after a revolution you see the same men in the drawing-room and within a week the same flatterers of punishment wherever a government knows when to show the rod it will not often be put to use it but between the want of skill and the want of honesty faults generally either escape punishment or are mended to no purpose men are not hanged for stealing horses but that horses may not be stolen wherever a knave is not punished an honest man is laughed at a cheat to the public is thought infamous and yet to accuse him is not thought an honourable part what a paradox tis an ill method to make the aggravation of the crime a security against the punishment so that the danger is not to rob but not to rob enough treason must not be inlaid work for several pieces it must be an entire piece of itself a cumulative in that case is a murdering word that carrieth injustice and no sense in it an influence though never so rational should go no farther than to justify a suspicion not so far as to inflict a punishment nothing is so apt to break with stretching as an inference and nothing so ridiculous as to see how fools will abuse one end of political thoughts and reflections read by john greenman
This is section 24 of The Complete Works of George Saville, First Marquis of Halifax. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Moral Thoughts and Reflections Read by John Greenman Of the World It is from the shortness of thought that men imagine there is any great variety in the world. Time hath thrown a veil upon the faults of former ages, or else we should see the same deformities we condemn in the present times. When a man looketh upon the rules that are made, he will think there can be no faults in the world, and when he looketh upon the faults, there are so many he will be tempted to think there are no rules. They are not to be reconciled otherwise than by concluding that which is called frailty is the incurable nature of mankind. A man that understandeth the world must be weary of it, and a man who doth not, for that reason, ought not to be pleased with it. The uncertainty of what is to come is such a dark cloud that neither reason nor religion can quite break through it, and the condition of mankind is to be weary of what we do know and afraid of what we do not. The world is beholden to generous mistakes for the greatest part of the good that is done in it. Our vices and virtues couple with one another, and get children that resemble both their parents. If a man can hardly inquire into a thing he undervalueth, how can a man of good sense take pains to understand the world? To understand the world, and to like it, are two things not easily to be reconciled. That which is called an able man is a great overvaluer of the world, and all that belongeth to it. All that can be said of him is that he maketh the best of the general mistake. It is the fools and the knaves that make the wheels of the world turn. They are the world. Those few who have sense or honesty sneak up and down single, but never go in herds. To be too much troubled is a worse way of overvaluing the world than the being too much pleased. A man that steps aside from the world, and hath leisure to observe it without interest or design, thinks all mankind as mad as they think him, for not agreeing with them in their mistakes. Of Ambition the serious folly of wise men in overvaluing the world is as contemptible as anything they think fit to censure. The first mistake belonging to business is the going into it. Men make it such a point of honor to be fit for business, that they forget to examine whether business is fit for a man of sense. There is reason to think the most celebrated philosophers would have been bunglers at business, but the reason is because they despised it. It is not a reproach, but a compliment to learning, to say that great scholars are less fit for business, since the truth is, business is so much a lower thing than learning, that a man used to the last cannot easily bring his stomach down to the first. The government of the world is a great thing, but it is a very coarse one, too, compared with the fineness of speculative knowledge. The dependence of a great man upon a greater is a subjection that lower men cannot easily comprehend. Ambition hath no mean, it is either upon all four or upon tiptoes. Nothing can be humbler than ambition when it is so disposed. Popularity is a crime from the moment it is sought. It is only a virtue where men have it whether they will or no. It is generally an appeal to the people from the sentence given by men of sense against them. It is stepping very low to get very high. Men by habit make irregular stretches of power without discerning the consequence and extent of them. Eagerness is apt to overlook consequences. It is loath to be stopped in its career. For when men are in great haste, they see only in a straight line. Of cunning 
and knavery. Cunning is so apt to grow into knavery that an honest man will avoid the temptation of it. But men in this age are half bribed by the ambition of circumventing without any other encouragements. So proud of the character of being able men that they do not care to have their dexterity confined. In this age, when it is said of a man, he knows how to live, it may be implied he is not very honest. An honest man must lose so many occasions of getting that the world will hardly allow him the character of an able one. There is, however, more wit requisite to be an honest man than there is to be a knave. The most necessary thing in the world, and yet the least usual, is to reflect that those we deal with may know how to be as arrant knaves as ourselves. The eagerness of a knave maketh him often as catchable as ignorance maketh a fool. No man is so much a fool as not to have wit enough sometimes to be a knave, nor any so cunning a knave as not to have the weakness sometimes to play the fool. The mixture of fool and knave maketh up the party-coloured creatures that make all the bustle in the world. There is not so pleasant a quarry as a knave taken in a net of his own making. A knave leaneth sometimes so hard upon his impudence that it breaketh and lets him fall. Knavery is in such perpetual motion that it hath not always leisure to look to its own steps. Tis like sliding upon skates, no motion so smooth or swift, but none gives so terrible a fall. A knave loveth self so heartily that he is apt to overstrain it. By never thinking he can get enough, he gets so much less. His thought is like wine that fretteth with too much fermenting. The knaves in every government are a kind of corporation, and though they fall out with one another, like all beasts of prey, yet upon occasion they unite to support the common cause. It cannot be said to be such a corporation as the Bank of England, but they are a numerous and formidable body, scarce to be resisted. But the point is, they can never rely upon one another. Knaves go chained to one another, like slaves in the galleys, and cannot easily untie themselves from their company. Their promises and honour, indeed, do not hinder them but other entangling circumstances keep em from breaking loose. If knaves had not foolish memories, they would never trust one another so often as they do. Present interest, like present love, maketh all other friendship look cold to it, but it faileth in the holding. When one knave betrayeth another, the one is not to be blamed, nor the other to be pitied when they complain of one another as if they were honest men they ought to be laughed at as if they were fools there are some cunning men who yet can scarce be called rational creatures yet they are often more successful than men of sense because those they have to deal with are upon a looser guard and their simplicity maketh their knavery unsuspected there is no such thing as a venial sin against morality, no such thing as a small knavery. He that carries a small crime easily will carry it on when it grows to be an ox. But the little knaves are the greater of the two, because they have less the excuse of temptation. Knavery is so humble, and merit so proud, that the latter is thrown down because it cannot stoop of folly and fools there are five orders of fools as of building one the blockhead two coxcomb three vain blockhead four grave coxcomb and five the half-witted fellow this last is of the composite order the follies of grave men have the precedence of all others a ridiculous dignity that gives them a right to be laughed at in the first place. As the masculine wit is the strongest, 
so the masculine impertinence is the greatest the consequence of a half-wit is a half-will there is not strength enough in the thought to carry it to the end a fool is naturally recommended to our kindness by setting us off by the comparison men are grateful to fools for giving them the pleasure of contemning them but folly hath a long tail that is not seen at first for every single folly hath a root out of which more are ready to sprout and a fool hath so unlimited a power of mistaking that a man of sense can never comprehend to what degree it may extend there are some fools so low that they are preferred when they are laughed at their being named putteth them in the list of men which is more than belongeth to them one should no more laugh at a contemptible fool than at a dead fly the dissimulation of a fool should come within the statute of stabbing it giveth no warning a fool will be rude from the moment he is allowed to be familiar he can make no other use of freedom than to be unmannerly weak men are apt to be cruel because they stick at nothing that may repair the ill effect of their mistakes folly is often more cruel in the consequence than malice can be in the intent many a man is murdered by the well-meant mistakes of his unthinking friends a weak friend if he will be kind ought to go no farther than wishes if he proffereth either to say or to do it is dangerous a man had as good go to bed to a razor as to be intimate with a foolish friend mistaken kindness is little less dangerous than premeditated malice a man hath not the relief of being angry at the blows of a mistaken friend a busy fool is fitter to be shut up than a downright madman a man that hath only wit enough not to do hurt committeth a sin if he aimeth at doing good his passive understanding must not pretend to be active it is a sin against nature for such a man to be meddling it is hard to find a blockhead so wise as to be upon the defensive he will be sallying and then he is sure to be ill-used if a dull fool can make a vow and keep it never to speak his own sense or do his own business he may pass a great while for a rational creature a blockhead is as ridiculous when he talketh as a goose is when it flieth the grating a gridiron is not a worse noise than the jingling of words is to a man of sense it is ill manners to silence a fool and cruelty to let him go on most men make little other use of their speech than to give evidence against their own understanding a great talker may be a man of sense but he cannot be one who will venture to rely upon him there is so much danger in talking that a man strictly wise can hardly be called a sociable creature the great expense of words is laid out in setting ourselves out or deceiving others to convince them requireth but a few many words are always either suspicious or ridiculous a fool hath no dialogue within himself the first thought carrieth him without the reply of a second a fool will admire or like nothing that he understands a man of sense nothing but what he understands wise men gain and poor men live by the superfluities of fools till follies become ruinous the world is better with than it would be without them a fool is angry that he is the fool of a knave forgetting that it is the end of his creation of hope hope is a kind cheat in the minute of our disappointment we are angry but upon the whole matter there is no pleasure without it it is so much a pleasanter thing than truth to the greatest part of the world that it hath all their kindness the other only hath their respect hope is generally a wrong guide though it is very good company by the way it brusheth through hedge and ditch till it cometh to a great leap and there it is apt to fall and break its bones 
it would be well if hopes carried men only to the top of the hill without throwing them afterwards down the precipice the hopes of a fool are blind guides those of a man of sense doubt often of their way men should do with their hopes as they do with tame fowl cut their wings that they may not fly over the wall a hoping fool hath such terrible falls that his brains are turned though not cured by them the hopes of a fool are bullets he throws into the air that fall down again and break his skull there can be no entire disappointment to a wise man because he maketh it a cause of succeeding another time a fool is so unreasonably raised by his hopes that he is half dead by a disappointment his mistaken fancy draweth him so high that when he falleth he is sure to break his bones of anger anger is a better sign of the heart than of the head it is a breaking out of the disease of honesty just anger may be as dangerous as it could be if there was no provocation to it for a knave is not so nice a casuist but that he will ruin if he can any man that blameth him where ill nature is not predominant anger will be short breathed it cannot hold out a long course hatred can be tired and cloyed as well as love for our spirits like our limbs are tired with being long in one posture there is a dignity in good sense that is offended and defaced by anger anger is never without an argument but seldom with a good one anger raiseth invention but it overheateth the oven anger like drink raiseth a great deal of unmannerly wit true wit must come by drops anger throweth it out in a stream and then it is not likely to be of the best kind ill language punisheth anger by drawing a contempt upon it of apologies it is a dangerous task to answer objections because they are helped by the malice of mankind a bold accusation doth at first draw such a general attention that it gets the world on its side to a man who hath a mind to find a fault an excuse generally giveth farther hold explaining is generally half confessing innocence hath a very short style when a jealousy of any kind is once raised it is as often provoked as cured by any arguments let them be never so reasonable when laziness letteth things alone it is a disease but when skill doth it it is a virtue malice may help a fool to aggravate but there must be skill to know how to extenuate to lessen an object that at the first sight giveth offence requireth a dexterous hand there must be strength as well as skill to take off the weight of the first impression when a man is very unfortunate it looketh like a saucy thing in him to justify himself a man must stoop sometimes to his ill star but he must never lie down to it the vindications men make of themselves to posterity would hardly be supported by good sense if they were not of some advantage to their own families the defending an ill thing is more criminal than the doing it because it wanteth the excuse of its not being premeditated an advocate for injustice is like a bawd that is worse than her client who committeth the sin there is hardly any man so strict as not to vary a little from truth when he is to make an excuse not telling all the truth is hiding it and that is comforting or abetting a lie a long vindication is seldom a skilful one long doth at least imply doubtful in such a case a fool should avoid the making an excuse as much as the committing a fault for a fool's excuse is always a second fault and whenever he will undertake either to hide or mend a thing he proclaimeth and spoileth it of malice and envy 
malice is a greater magnifying glass than kindness malice is of a low stature but it hath very long arms it often reacheth into the next world death itself is not a bar to it malice like lust when it is at the height doth not know shame if it did not sometimes cut itself with its own edge it would destroy the world malice can mistake by being keen as well as by being dull when malice groweth critical it loseth its credit it must go under the disguise of plainness or else it is exposed anger may have some excuse for being blind but malice none for malice hath time to look before it when malice is overgrown it cometh to be the highest degree of impertinence for that reason it must not be fed and pampered which is apt to make it play the fool but where it is wise and steady there is no precaution that can be quite proof against it ill will is seldom cured on a sudden it must go off by degrees by insensible transpiration malice may be sometimes out of breath envy never a man may make peace with hatred but never with envy no passion is better heard by our will than that of envy no passion is admitted to have audience with less exception envy taketh the shape of flattery and that maketh men hug it so close that they cannot part with it the sure way to be commended is to get into a condition of being pitied for envy will not give its leave to commend a man till he is miserable a man is undone when envy will not vouchsafe to look upon him yet after all envy doth virtue as much good as hurt by provoking it to appear nay it forcibly draweth out and inviteth virtue by giving it a mind to be revenged of it of vanity the world is nothing but vanity cut out into several shapes men often mistake themselves but they never forget themselves a man must not so entirely fall out with vanity as not to take its assistance in the doing great things vanity is like some men who are very useful if they are kept under and else not to be endured a little vanity may be allowed in a man's train but it must not sit down at table with him without some share of it men's talents would be buried like ore in a mine unwrought men would be less eager to gain knowledge if they did not hope to set themselves out by it it showeth the narrowness of our nature that a man that intendeth any one thing extremely hath not thought enough left for anything else our pride maketh us overvalue our stock of thought so as to trade much beyond what it is able to make good many aspire to learn what they can never comprehend as others pretend to teach what they themselves do not know the vanity of teaching often tempteth a man to forget he is a blockhead self-conceit driveth away the suspecting how scurvily others think of us vanity cannot be a friend to truth because it is restrained by it and vanity is so impatiently desirous of showing itself that it cannot bear the being crossed there is a degree of vanity that recommendeth if it goeth further it exposeth so much as to stir the blood to do commendable things but not so much as to possess the brain and turn it round there are as many that are blown up by the wind of vanity as are carried away by the stream of interest everybody hath not wit enough to act out of interest but everybody hath little enough to do it out of vanity some men's heads are as easily blown away as their hats if the commending others well did not recommend ourselves there would be few panegyrics men's vanity will often dispose them to be commended into very troublesome employments the desiring to be remembered when we are dead is to so little purpose 
that it is fit men should as they generally are be disappointed in it nevertheless the desire of leaving a good name behind us is so honorable to ourselves and so useful to the world that good sense must not be heard against it heraldry is one of those foolish things that may yet be too much despised the contempt of scutcheons is as much a disease in this age as the overvaluing them was in former times there is a good use to be made of the most contemptible things and an ill one of those that are the most valuable of money if men considered how many things there are that riches cannot buy they would not be so fond of them the things to be bought with money are such as least deserve the giving a price for them wit and money are so apt to be abused that men generally make a shift to be the worse for them money in a fool's hand exposeth him worse than a pied coat money hath too great a preference given to it by states as well as by particular men men are more the sinews of war than money the third part of an army must be destroyed before a good one can be made out of it they who are of opinion that money will do everything may very well be suspected to do everything for money false learning a little learning misleadeth and a great deal often stupefieth the understanding great reading without applying it is like corn heaped that is not stirred it groweth musty a learned coxcomb dieth his mistakes in so much a deeper colour a wrong kind of learning serveth only to embroider his errors a man that hath read without judgment is like a gun charged with goose shot let loose upon the company he is only well furnished with materials to expose himself and to mortify those he liveth with the reading of the greatest scholars if put into a limbeck might be distilled into a small quantity of essence the reading of most men is like a wardrobe of old clothes that are seldom used weak men are the worse for the good sense they read in books because it furnishes them only with more matter to mistake of company men that cannot entertain themselves want somebody though they care for nobody an impertinent fellow is never in the right but in his being weary of himself by that time men are fit for company they see the objections to it the company of a fool is dangerous as well as tedious it is flattering some men to endure them present punishment attendeth the fault a following wit will be welcome in most companies a leading one lieth too heavy for envy to bear outdoing is so near reproaching that it will generally be thought very ill company anything that shineth doth in some measure tarnish everything that standeth next to it keeping much company generally endeth in playing the fool or the knave with them of friendship friendship cometh oftener by chance than by choice which maketh it generally so uncertain it is a mistake to say a friend can be bought a man may buy a good turn but he cannot buy the heart that doth it friendship cannot live with ceremony nor without civility there must be a nice diet observed to keep friendship from falling sick nay there is more skill necessary to keep a friend than there is to reclaim an enemy those friends who are above interest are seldom above jealousy it is a misfortune for a man not to have a friend in the world but for that reason he shall have no enemy in the commerce of the world men struggle little less with their friends than they do with their enemies esteem ought to be the ground of kindness and yet there are no friends that seldomer meet kindness is apt to be as afraid of esteem as that is to be ashamed of kindness our kindness is greatest to those that will do what we would have them in which our esteem cannot always go along 
End of Moral Thoughts and Reflections Read by John Greenman This is section 25 of The Complete Works of George Saville, First Marquis of Halifax. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Miscellaneous Thoughts and Reflections Read by John Greenman The rule of doing as we would be done by is never less observed than it is in telling others their faults but men intend more to show others that they are free from the fault than to dissuade them from committing it they are so pleased with the prudent shape of an adviser that it raiseth the value they have of themselves whilst they are about it certainly to give advice to a friend either asked or unasked is so far from a fault that it is a duty but if a man love to give advice it is a sure sign that he himself wanteth it a man whilst he is advising putteth his understanding upon tiptoes and is unwilling to bring it down again a weak man had rather be thought to know than know and that maketh him so impatient to be told of a mistake he who will not be the better for other men's faults hath no cure left for his own but he that can probe himself to cure his own faults will seldom need either the surgery of his friends or of his enemies in a corrupted age the putting the world in order would breed confusion a rooted disease must be stroked away rather than kicked away as soon as men have understanding enough to find a fault they have enough to see the danger of mending it desiring to have anything mended is venturing to have it spoiled to know when to let things alone is a high pitch of good sense but a fool hath an eagerness like a monkey in a glass shop to break everything in the handling curing and mending are generally mere words of art not to be relied upon they are set out in bills but the mountbacks only get by them great bashfulness is oftener an effect of pride than of modesty modesty is oftener mistaken than any other virtue wise venturing is the most commendable part of human prudence it is the upper story of prudence whereas perpetual caution is a kind of underground wisdom that doth not care to see the light it is best for great men to shoot over and for lesser men to shoot short men who borrow their opinions can never repay their debts they are beggars by nature and can therefore never get a stock to grow rich upon a man who hath not a distinguishing head is safest by not minding what anybody saith he had better trust to his own opinion than spoil another man's for want of apprehending it it is some kind of scandal not to bear with the faults of an honest man it is not loving honesty enough to allow it distinguishing privileges there are some decent faults which may pretend to be in the lower rank of virtues and surely where honor or gratitude are the motives censure must be a good deal silenced men must be saved in this world by their want of faith a man that getteth care into his thoughts cannot properly be said to trade without a stock care and right thought will produce crops all the year without staying for the seasons a man is to go about his own business as if he had not a friend in the world to help him in it he that relieth upon himself will be oppressed by others with offers of their service all are apt to shrink from those that lean upon them if men would think how often their own words are thrown at their heads they would less often let them go out of their mouths men's words are bullets that their enemies take up and make use of against them a man watches himself best when others watch him too it is as necessary for us to suppress our reason when it offendeth as our mistakes when they expose us 
in an unreasonable age a man's reason let loose would undo him a wise man will do with his reason as a miser doth with his money hoard it but be very sparing in the expense of it a man that should call everything by its right name would hardly pass the streets without being knocked down as a common enemy a man cannot be more in the wrong than to own without distinction the being in the right when a man is very kind or very angry there is no sure god but silence upon that subject a man's understanding is easily shoved out of its place by warm thoughts of any kind we are not so much masters of our heat as to have enough to warm our thoughts and not so much as to set them on fire a great enemy is a great object that inviteth precaution which maketh him less dangerous than a mean one an old man concludeth from his knowing mankind that they know him too and that maketh him very wary on the other hand it must be allowed that a man's being deceived by knaves hath often this ill effect that it maketh him too jealous of honest men the mind like the body is subject to be hurt by everything it taketh for a remedy there are some such very great foreseers that they grow into the vanity of pretending to see where nothing is to be seen he that will see at too great a distance will sometimes mistake a bush for a horse the prospect of a wise man will be bounded a man may so overdo it in looking too far before him that he may stumble the more for it and to conclude he that leaveth nothing to chance will do few things ill but he will do very few things suspicion is rather a virtue than a fault as long as it doth like a dog that watcheth and doth not bite a wise man in trusting another must not rely upon his promise against his nature early suspicion is often an injury and late suspicion is always a folly a wise man will keep his suspicions muzzled but he will keep them awake there can no rules be given to suspicion no more than to love suspicion taketh root and beareth fruit from the moment it is planted suspicion seldom wanteth food to keep it up in health and vigour it feedeth upon everything it seeth and is not curious in its diet suspicion doth not grow up to an injury till it breaketh out when our suspicion of another man is once discovered by him there ought to be an end of all further commerce he that is never suspected is either very much esteemed or very much despised a man's interest is not of sufficient ground to suspect him if his nature doth not concur in it a weak man hath less suspicion than a wise one but when he hath it he is less easily cured the remedies as often increase the disease as they do allay it and a fool valueth himself upon suspecting at a venture many men swallow the being cheated but no man could ever endure to chew it few men would be deceived if their conceit of themselves did not help the skill of those that go about it complaining is a contempt upon one's self it is an ill sign both of a man's head and of his heart a man throweth himself down whilst he complaineth and when a man throweth himself down nobody careth to take him up again content layeth pleasure nay virtue in a slumber with few and faint intermissions it is to the mind like moss to a tree it bindeth it up so as to stop its growth the impudence of a bawd is modesty compared with that of a convert a convert hath so much to do to gain credit that a man is to think well before he changeth men generally state their wants by their fancy and not by their reason the poor young children are whipped and beaten by the old ones who are much more inexcusably impertinent 
not having things is a more proper expression for a man of sense than his wanting them where sense is wanting everything is wanting a man of sense can hardly want but for his friends and children that have none most men let their wishes run away with them they have no mind to stop them in their career the motion is so pleasing to desire what belongeth to another man is misprision of robbery men are commanded not to covet because when they do they are very apt to take a difficulty raiseth the spirits of a great man he hath a mind to wrestle with it and give it a fall a man's mind must be very low if the difficulty doth not make a part of his pleasure the pride of compassing may more than compare with the pleasure of enjoying nothing so ridiculous as a false philosopher and nothing so rare as a true one men take more pains to hide than to mend themselves men's pride as well as their weakness disposeth them to rely upon dreams from their thinking themselves of such importance as to have warning of what is to befall them the enquiry into a dream is another dream it is a piece of arrogance to dare to be drunk because a man showeth himself without a veil the best way to suppose what may come is to remember what is past the best qualification of a prophet is to have a good memory experience maketh more profits than revelation the knowledge that is got without pains is kept without pleasure the struggling for knowledge hath a pleasure in it like that of wrestling with a fine woman extremity is always ill that which is good cannot live a moment with it anybody that is fool enough will be safe in the world and anybody that can be knave enough will be rich in it the generality of the world falleth into an insufficient mean that exposeth them more than an extreme on either side though memory and invention are not upon good terms yet when the first is loaded the other is stifled the memory hath claws by which it holdeth fast but it hath no wings like the invention to enable it to fly some men's memory is like a box where a man should mingle his jewels with his old shoes there ought to be a great difference between the memory and the stomach the last is to admit everything the former should have the faculty of rejecting it is a nice mean between letting the thought languish for want of exercise and tiring it by giving it too much a man may dwell so long upon a thought that it may take him prisoner the hardest thing in the world is to give the thoughts due liberty and yet retain them in due discipline they are libertines that are apt to abuse freedom and do not well know how to bear restraint a man that excels in any one thing has a kind of arbitrary power over all that hear him upon that subject and no man's life is too short to know any one thing perfectly the modern wit is rather to set men out than to make them of any use some men have acted courage who had it not but no man can act wit if nature doth not teach him his part true wit is always revenged upon any false pretender that meddleth with it wit is the only thing that men are willing to think they can ever have enough of there is a happy pitch of ignorance that a man of sense might pray for a man that hath true wit will have honor too not only to adorn but to support it the building up a family is a manufacture very little above the building a house of cards time and accidents are sure to furnish a blast to blow it down no house wanteth new tiling so often as a family wants repairing the desire of having children is as much the effect of vanity as of good nature we think our children a part of ourselves though as they grow up 
they might very well undeceive us men love their children not because they are promising plants but because they are theirs they cannot discredit the plant without disparaging the soil out of which it came pride in this as in many other things is often mistaken for love as children make a man poor in one sense so in another they enforce care and that begetteth riches love is presently out of breath when it is to go up hill from the children to the parents tis good to have men in awe but dangerous to have them afraid of us the mean is so nice that the hitting upon it is oftener the effect of chance than of skill a degree of fear sharpeneth the excess of it stupefieth it is as scandalous not to fear at some times as it can be to be afraid at others folly begets want and want flattery so that flattery with all its wit is the grandchild of folly were it not for bunglers in the manner of doing it hardly any man would ever find out he was laughed at and yet generally speaking a trowel is a more effectual instrument than a pencil for flattery men generally do so love the taste of flattery their stomach can never be overcharged with it there is a right reverend flattery that hath the precedence of all other kinds of it this mitred flattery is of all others the most exalted it ever groweth in proportion and keepeth pace with power there is a noble stroke of it in the article sent to princess mary from henry the eighth such is his majesty's gracious and divine nature showing mercy to such as repentantly cry and call for the same unquote. forgetting is oftener an aggravation than an excuse the memory will seldom be unmannerly but where it is unkind there needeth little care to polish the understanding if true means were used to strengthen it it will polish itself good manners is such a part of good sense that they cannot be divided but that which a fool calleth good breeding is the most unmannerly thing in the world right good manners require so much sense that there is hardly any such thing in the world good nature is rather acted than practised in the world good nature to others is an inseparable part of justice good will like grace floweth where it listeth men mean so very well to themselves that they forget to mean well to anybody else good sense will allow of some intermitting fevers but then the fit must be short he that can be quite indifferent when he seeth another man injured hath a lukewarm honesty that a wise man will not depend upon he that is not concerned when he seeth an ill thing done to another will not be very eager to do a good one himself there is so much wit necessary to make a skilful hypocrite that the faculty is fallen amongst bunglers who make it ridiculous an injury may more properly be said to be postponed than to be forgiven the memory of it is never so subdued but that it hath always life in it the memory of an enemy admitteth no decay but age could we know what men are most apt to remember we might know what they are most apt to do it is a general fault that we dislike men only for the injuries they do to us and not for those they do to mankind yet it will be hard to give a good reason why a man who hath done a deliberate injury to one will not do it to another the memory and the conscience never did nor never will agree about forgiving injuries nature is second to the memory and religion to the conscience when the seconds fight the latter is generally disarmed a man in a corrupted age must make a secret of his integrity or else he will be looked upon as a common enemy he must engage his friends not to speak of it for he setteth himself for a mark to be ill-used 
as far as keeping distance is a sign of respect mankind hath a great deal for justice they make up in ceremony what they want in good will to it where the generality are offenders justice cometh to be cruelty to love and to be in love with anything are things as differing as good sense and impertinence when we once go beyond bare liking we are in danger of parting with good sense and it is not easy for good sense to get so far as liking when by habit a man cometh to have a bargaining soul its wings are cut so that it can never soar it bindeth reason an apprentice to gain and instead of a director maketh it a drudge the being kind to a liar is abetting a treason against mankind a man is to inform the first magistrate that he may be clapped up lies are embroidered with promises and excuses a known liar should be outlawed in a well-ordered government a man that renounceth truth runneth away from his trial in the world the use of talking is almost lost in the world by the habit of lying a man that doth not tell all the truth ought to be hanged for a clipper half the truth is often as errant a lie as can be made it is the more dexterous but not the less criminal kind of lying names to men of sense are no more than fig leaves to the generality they are thick coverings that hide the nature of things from them fools turn good sense upon its head they take names for things and things only for names it is a general mistake to think the men we like are good for everything and those we do not good for nothing a man who is master of patience is master of everything else he that can tell how to bear in the right place is master of everybody he dealeth with positive is the perfection of coxcomb he is then come to his full growth it showeth men's nature that when they are pampered in any kind they are very apt to play jadish tricks one of the tricks of any creature that is wanton is to kick what is next them everything that doth us good is so apt to do us hurt too that it is a strong argument for men to be quiet if men would think more they would act less the greatest part of the business of the world is the effect of not thinking most men put their reason out to service to their will the master and the man are perpetually falling out a third man will hazard a beating if he goes about to part them nothing hath an uglier look to us than reason when it is not of our side we quarrel so often with it that it maketh us afraid to come near it a man that doth not use his reason is a tame beast a man that abuses it is a wild one it is a self-flattering contradiction that wise men despise the opinions of fools and yet are proud of having their esteem self-love rightly defined is far from being a fault a man that loveth himself right will do everything else right a man who doth not think he is punished when he is blamed is too much hardened to be ever reformed the court of shame hath of late lost much of its jurisdiction it ought by right both to judge in the first instance and to exclude all appeals from it shame is a disease of the last age this seemeth to be cured of it singularity may be good sense at home but it must not go much abroad it is a commendation to be that which a crowd of mistaken fools call singular there can hardly be a severer thing said to a man in this age than that he is like the rest of the world slander would not stick if it had not always something to lay hold of a man who can allow himself the liberty to slander hath the world too much at his mercy but the man that despiseth slander deserveth it speakers in public should take more pains to hold in their invention than to raise it 
invention is apt to make such sallies that it cannot secure its retreat he that will not make a blot will be pretty sure in his time to give a stroke a patient hearer is a sure speaker men are angry when others do not hear them yet they have more reason to be afraid when they do misspending a man's time is a kind of self-homicide it is making life to be of no use truth is not only stifled by ignorance but concealed out of caution or interest so if it had not a root of immortality it must have been long since extinguished the most useful part of wisdom is for a man to give a good guess what others think of him it is a dangerous thing to guess partially and a melancholy thing to guess right nothing would more contribute to make a man wise than to have always an enemy in his view a wise man may have more enemies than a weak one but he will not so much feel the weight of them indeed the being wise doth either make men our friends or discourage them from being our enemies wisdom is only a comparative quality it will not bear a single definition a man hath too little heat or wit or courage if he hath not sometimes more than he should just enough of a good thing is always too little long life giveth more marks to shoot at and therefore old men are less well thought of than those who have not been so long upon the stage other men's memories retain the ill whilst the good things done by an old man easily slip out of them old men have in some degree their reprisals upon younger by making nicer observations upon them by virtue of their experience finis end of miscellaneous thoughts and reflections and end of the complete works of george saville first marquis of halifax read by john greenman